See, it'd be interesting if that theory of mind is what leads to consciousness in the way we think about it, is the richness of the subjective experience that is consciousness. I have a inkling sense that that only exists because we're social creatures. That that, that doesn't come uh, with, this, with the hardware and the software in the, in the beginning. That's like, uh, that's learned as an effective uh, tool for communication almost. Like we, we think, we, I think we think uh, that consciousness is fundamental and uh, maybe it's not. Uh, there's a, a bunch of folks kind of criticize the idea that the illusion of consciousness is consciousness, that it is just a facade we use to to uh, help us construct theories of mind, you almost put yourself in the world as a subjective being. And that experience, you want to richly experience it as an individual person so that I could empathize with your experience. I find that notion compelling, mostly because it allows you to then create robots that become conscious, not by being quote unquote conscious, but by just learning to f fake it till they make it is uh, create a, you know, present a facade of consciousness uh, with, the, with the task of uh, making that facade very convincing to us humans, and thereby it will become conscious. I have a sense in, that in some way that will make them conscious if they're sufficiently convincing to humans. Is there some element of that that you, uh, <laughs> that you find convincing? This is a m much harder set of questions and deep end of the pool than starting with the aliens was. Um, we went from aliens to consciousness. <laughs> <laughs> this is not the trajectory I was expecting, nor you, but uh, let us walk a while. We, we can walk a while and I don't think we will do it justice. So <laughs> what do we mean by <laughs> consciousness versus conscious self-reflective awareness. What do we mean by awareness, qualia, theory of mind? There's a lot of terms that we think of as slightly different things and um, subjectivity, first person. Uh, I, I don't remember exactly the quote, but I remember when reading, when Sam Harris wrote the book Free Will and then Dennett critiqued it. And then there was some writing back and forth between the two because normally they're on the same side of kind of arguing for critical thinking and logical fallacies and philosophy of science against um, supernatural ideas. And here, Dennett believed there is something like free will. He is a uh, determinist compatibilist, but no consciousness and ex a radical eliminativist. And Sam was saying, no, there is consciousness, but there's no free will. And that's like the most fundamental kinds of axiomatic senses they disagreed on, but neither of them could say it was because the other one didn't understand the philosophy of science mm -hmm. um, or logical fallacies. And and they kind of spoke past each other. And at the end, if I remember correctly, Sam said something that I thought was quite insightful, which was to the effect of, it seems, because they weren't making any progress in shared understanding. It seems that we simply have different intuitions about this. And... What you could see was that what the words meant, right, at the level of symbol grounding might be quite different. Uh, one of them might have had deeply different enough life experiences that what is being referenced and then also different associations of what the words mean. This is why when trying to address these things, Charles Sanders Peirce said the first philosophy has to be semiotics because if you don't get semiotics right, we end up importing different ideas and bad ideas right into the nature of the language that we're using. And then it's very hard to do epistemology or ontology together. Uh, so I'm saying this to say why I don't think we're going to get very far is I think we would have to go very slowly in terms of defining what we mean by words and fundamental concepts. Um, well, and also allowing our minds to drift together for a time so that our uh, definitions of these terms align. I think there's some, there's a beauty that some people enjoy with Sam that he is quite stubborn on his definitions of terms without often clearly revealing that definition. So in his mind, he can, like, you could sense that he can deeply understand what he means exactly by a term like free will and consciousness. And you're right, he's very, he's very specific 
in, in fascinating ways that not only does he think that free will is an illusion, he thinks he's able, not thinks, he says he's able to just remove himself from the experience of free will and just be like for minutes at a time, hours at a time, like really experience as if he has no free will. Like he's a, a leaf flowing down the river. <laughs> and given that, he's very sure that consciousness is fundamental. So here's a this conscious leaf that's subjectively experiencing the floating, and yet there's no ability to control and make any decisions for its for itself. It's only a um, the decisions have all all been made. There's some aspect to which the terminology there perhaps is the problem. So that's a particular kind of meditative experience, and the people in the Vedantic tradition and some of the Buddhist traditions thousands of years ago described similar experiences and somewhat similar conclusions. Some slightly different. There are other types of phenomenal experience that uh, are the phenomenal experience of pure agency. And, you know, like the, the Catholic theologian, but evolutionary theorist, Teilhard de Chardin describes this. And that rather than a creator agent God in the beginning, there's a creative impulse or a creative process. And he was would go into a type of meditation that identified as the pure essence of that kind of creative process. Mm -hmm. um, and I think the types of experience it was, we've had, and then one, the types of experience we've had make a big deal to the nature of how we do symbol grounding. The other thing is the types of experiences we have can't not be interpreted through our existing interpretive frames. And most of the time our interpretive frames are unknown even to us, some of them. And so, th so th this, is a tricky, this is a tricky topic. Um, so I guess there's a bunch of directions we could go with it, but I want to come back to what the um, impulse was that was interesting around what is consciousness and how does it relate to us as social beings? Yes. And how does it relate to the possibility of consciousness with it, AIs? Right. You're keeping us on track, which is uh, which is wonderful. You're a wonderful hiking partner. Okay. <laughs> yes. Let's go back to the initial impulse of uh, what is consciousness and how does the social impulse connect to consciousness? Is consciousness a uh, consequence of that social connection? I'm going to state a position and not argue it because it's honestly like it's a long, hard thing to argue and we can totally do it another time if you want. Mm -hmm. I don't subscribe to consciousness as an emergent property of biology or neural networks. Obviously, a lot of people do. Obviously, the the philosophy of science orients um, towards that in not absolutely, but largely. Um, I think of the nature of first person, the universe of first person of, of qualia as uh, experience, sensation, desire, emotion, phenomenology, the, but the, the felt sense, not the, we, we say emotion and we think of a neurochemical pattern or an endocrine pattern. But all of the physical stuff, the third person stuff has position and momentum and charge and stuff like that that is measurable, repeatable. I think of the nature of first person and third person as ontologically orthogonal to each other, not reducible to each other. They're different kinds of stuff. And so I think about the evolution of third person that we're quite used to thinking about from subatomic particles to atoms to molecules to on and on. I think about a similar kind of and corresponding evolution in the domain of first person from the way Whitehead talked about kind of prehension or protoqualia in earlier phases of self-organization into higher orders of it and that there's correspondence, but that neither like the like the idealists do we reduce third person to first person, which is what idealists do or neither like the physicalists, or do we reduce first person to third person? Obviously, Bohm talked about uh, an implicate order that was deeper than and gave rise to the explicate order of both. Um, Nagel talks about something like that. I have a slightly different sense of that, but again, uh, I'll just kind of not argue how that occurs for a moment and say, so rather than say, does consciousness emerge from, I'll talk about do higher capacities of consciousness emerge in relationship with. 
So it's not first person as a category emerging from third person, but increased complexity within the nature of first person and third person co-evolving. Um, do I think that it seems relatively likely that more advanced neural networks have deeper phenomenology, more complex, where it goes just from basic sensation to emotion to social awareness to abstract cognition to self-reflexive abstract cognition? Yeah. But I wouldn't say that's the emergence of consciousness. I would say it's increased complexity within the domain of first person corresponding to increased complexity. And the correspondence should not automatically be seen as causal. We can get into the arguments for why that often is the case. So would I say that obviously the sapien brain is pretty unique and a single sapien now has that, right? Even if it took sapiens evolving in tribes based on group selection to make that brain. So the group made it. Now that brain is there. Now, if I take the, a single person with that brain out of the group and try to raise them in a box, they'll still not be very interesting, even with the brain. Um, but the brain does give hardware capacities that if conditioned in relationship um, can have interesting things emerge. So do I think that the, the human biology, types of human consciousness and types of social interaction all co-emerged and co-evolved? Yes. What do you think is the role of death in uh, in all of this? The the fear of death does that interplay with consciousness? Does this self reflection? Do you think there's some deep connection between this ability to, to contemplate the fact that the our flame of of uh, consciousness eventually goes out? Yeah, I don't think unfortunately panpsychism helps particularly with life after death because you know for the panpsychist there's nothing supernatural there's nothing beyond the physical all there is really is ultimately particles and fields it's just that we think the ultimate nature of particles and fields is consciousness but i guess when um when the uh the the matter in my brain ceases to be ordered in a way that sustains the particular kind of consciousness uh, I enjoy in waking life, then in some sense I, I, I will cease to be. Although I do, the, the final chapter of my book, Galileo's Error, is more experimental. <laughs> so the first four chapters are the cold-blooded case for the panpsychist view as the, the best solution to the hard problem of consciousness. Yeah, the last chapter is where you talk about meaning. Yeah, I talk about meaning, I talk about free will, and I talk about mystical experiences. So I always want to emphasize that panpsychism is not necessarily connected to anything spiritual. You know, a lot of people defending this view, like David Chalmers or Luke Roloffs, are just total atheist secularists, right? They don't believe in any kind of transcendent reality. They just believe in feelings, you know, mundane consciousness and think that needs explaining in our conventional scientific approach can't cut it. But if for independent reasons you are motivated to some spiritual picture of reality, then maybe a panpsychist view is is more consonant with that. So if you if you have a mystical experience where you um it seems to you in this experience that there is this higher form of consciousness at the root of all things. If you're a materialist, you've got to think that's a delusion. You know, there's just something in your brain making you think that it's not real. But if you're a panpsychist and you already think the fundamental nature of reality is constituted of consciousness, it's not that much of a leap to think that um, this higher form of consciousness you seem to apprehend in the mystical experience is part of that underlying reality. And, you know, in, in many different cultures, experienced meditators have claimed to have experiences in which it becomes apparent to them that there is an element of consciousness that is universal. So this is sometimes called universal consciousness. So on this view, your mind and my mind are not uh, totally distinct. Uh, each of our individual conscious minds is built upon the foundations of universal consciousness and universal consciousness as it exists in me is one and the same thing as universal consciousness as it exists in you. So 
I've never had one of these experiences. Um, but if one is a panpsychist, I think one is more open to that possibility. I don't see why it shouldn't be the case that that is part of the nature of consciousness and maybe something that is apparent in certain deep states of meditation. And so what I explore in the experimental final chapter of my book is that could allow for a kind of impersonal life after death, because if that view is true, then even when the particular aspects of my conscious experience fall away, that element of universal consciousness at the core of my identity would continue to exist. So I'd sort of be, as it were, absorbed into universal consciousness. So, I mean, Buddhists and Hindu mystics uh, try to meditate to get rid of all the bad karma, to be absorbed into universal consciousness. It could be that if uh, if there's no karma, if there's no reverb, maybe everyone gets enlightened when they die. Maybe you uh, just sink back into universal consciousness. So I, al I also, coming back to morality, suggest this could provide some kind of basis for altruism or non-egotism, because if you think egotism implicitly assumes that we are utterly distinct individuals, whereas on, on, on this view, we do, we're not, we overlap to an extent that something at the core of our being is... Even in this life, we overlap. That would be this view that some experienced meditators claim becomes apparent to them that there is something at the core of my identity that is one and the same as the thing at the core of your identity, uh, this universal consciousness. Yeah, there is something very, like you and I in this conversation, there's a few people listening to this, all of us are in a, in a kind of single mind together there's some small aspect of that and or maybe a big aspect about us humans so certainly in the space of ideas we kind of um meld together for time at least in a conversation and kind of play with that idea and then we're clearly all thinking like if i say pink elephant there's going to be a few people that are now visualizing a pink elephant we're all thinking about that pink elephant together we're all in the room together thinking about this pink elephant and we're like rotating it um like you know in our minds together what is that that mm -hmm. pink elephant is that is there a different instantiation of that pink elephant in everybody's mind or is it the same elephant and we have the same mind exploring that elephant now if we in our mind start petting that elephant like touching it that experience that we're now like thinking what that would feel like it, what's that is that all of us experiencing that together or is that separate? So like there's some aspect of, of the togetherness that almost seems fundamental to civilization, to society. Mm. So hopefully that's not too strong, but to like some of the fundamental properties of the human mind, it feels like the social aspect is really important. We call it social because we think of us as individual minds interacting. But if we're just like one collective mind with like fingertips, they're like, touching each other as it's trying to explore the elephant. But that could be just in the realm of ideas and intelligence yeah. and not in the realm of consciousness. And it's interesting to see maybe it is in the realm of consciousness. Yeah, so it's obviously certainly true in some sense that there are these phenomena that you're talking about of collective consciousness in some sense. I suppose the question is how ontologically serious do we want to be about those things by which i mean are they just a construction of out of our minds and the fact that we interact in the standard standardly scientifically accepted ways or is as someone like rupert sheldrake would think that there is some metaphysical reality there are some fields beyond the scientifically understood ones that are somehow communicating this um I mean, I think that, that, I mean, the view I was describing was that this element we're supposed to have in common is, is some sort of pure impersonal consciousness or something rather mm -hmm. than, so actually, I mean, an interesting figure is the, the Australian philosopher Miri Al-Bahari, who defends a kind of mystical conception of reality rooted in uh, Advaita Vedanta mysticism. But like me, she's from this tradition of analytic philosophy. And so she defends this in this, you know, incredibly precise, rigorous way. She defends the idea that we should think of experienced meditators as 
uh, providing expert testimony. So, you know, I think humans cause are causing climate breakdown. I have no idea of the science behind it, you know, I, but I trust the experts or, you know, that the universe is 14 billion years old. You know, most of our knowledge is based on expert testimony. And she thinks we should think of experienced meditators, these people who are telling us about this universal consciousness at the core of our being as a relevant kind of expert. And so she wants to defend, you know, the rational acceptability of this mystical conception of reality. So it's what, you know, I think we shouldn't be ashamed, you know, we shouldn't be worried about dealing with certain views as long as it's done with rigor and seriousness. You know, I think sometimes terms like I don't know, new age or something can function a bit like racist terms. You know, a racist term picks out a group of people, but then implies certain negative characteristics. So people use this term, you know, to pick out a certain set of views like mystical conception of reality and, and imply it's kind of fluffy thinking or, but, you know, you read Miri Al-Bahari, you read Luke Roloff's, this is serious, rigorous thought, whether you agree with it or not, obviously it's hugely controversial. And so, you know, the enlightenment ideal is to follow the evidence and the arguments where they lead. But it's kind of very hard for human beings to do that. I think we get stuck in some conception of how we think science ought to look. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and um, you know, people talk about religion as a crutch, but I think a certain kind of scientism, a certain conception of how science is supposed to be, gets into people's identity and their sense of themselves and their security um, and makes things hard if you're a pan psychic. So what do you think about consciousness and mortality uh, as being displayed in a robot? So not actually ha- having consciousness, but having these kind of human elements that are much more than just the interaction, much more than just, like you mentioned, with a dinosaur moving kind of in in interesting ways, but really being worried about its own death and really acting as if it's aware and self-aware and identity. Have you seen that done in robotics? What do you think about doing that? (laughs) is that Is that a powerful good thing? Well, it's a. I think it can be a design tool that you can use for different purposes. So I can't say whether it's inherently good or bad, but I do think it can be a powerful tool. Um, the fact that the, you know, Pleo mimics distress when you quote unquote hurt it is is a really powerful um, tool to get people to engage with it in a certain way. I had a research partner that I did some of the empathy work with uh, named Palash Nandi, and he had built a robot for himself that had like a lifespan and that would stop working after a certain amount of time just because he was interested in like whether he himself would treat it differently. Mm -hmm. And we know from, you know, Tamagotchis, those like those little games that, that we used to have that were extremely primitive, that like people respond to like this idea of mortality and, you know, <laughs> you can get people to do a lot with, with little design tricks like that. Now, whether it's a good thing depends on what you're trying to get them to do. Have a deeper relationship. Have a deeper connection. Sorry, not a relationship. If it's for their own benefit, that's, yep. that sounds great. Okay. So the, there's another burden that comes with this whole intelligence thing that humans got is uh, the extinguishing of the light of consciousness, which is uh, kind of realizing that we're gonna be dead someday. And uh, there's a bunch of philosophers like Ernest Becker, who kind of think that this realization of mortality and then fear, sometimes they call it terror of, of, of mortality is one of the creative forces behind human condition. Like it's the thing that drives us. Do you think it's important for an AI system? You know, when Psych proposed that it's one, it's not human, and it's one of the moderators of his contents. Um, you know, there's another question it could ask, which is like, it kind of knows that humans are mortal. Am I mortal? And I think one really important uh, thing that's possible when you're conscious is to fear the extinguishing of that consciousness, the fear of mortality. 
Do you think that's useful for intelligence? Thinking like I, I might die and I really don't want to die. I, I don't think so. I think it may help um, some humans to be um, better people. It may help some humans to be more creative and so on. I don't think it's necessary um, for AIs to believe that they have limited lifespans and therefore they should make the most of their behavior. Maybe eventually um, the answer to that and my answer to that will change. But as of now, I would say that that's almost like a, a frill or a side effect uh, that um, is not. And in fact, if you look at most humans, most humans um, ignore the fact that they're going to die most of the time. Uh, so, uh, Well, but that's like, this goes to the white space between the words. So what Ernest Becker argues is that that ignoring is we're living in an illusion that we constructed on the foundation of this terror. So we're escape life as we know it, pursuing things, creating things, love, everything we can think of that's beautiful about humanity is, is just trying to escape this realization that we're going to die one day. That's his, that's his idea. And I think, I don't know if I, I 100% believe in this, but there's, it certainly rhymes. It seems like to me, like it rhymes with the truth. <laughs> yeah, I, I think that for some people, um, that's gonna be a more powerful factor than others. Clearly Doug is talking about Russians. <laughs> and I think that... Uh... <laughs> <laughs> so I'm Russian, so it clearly yeah. it uh, infiltrates all of Russian literature. And, and AI doesn't have to have uh, fear of death as a motivating force in that we can build in motivation. So we can build in the motivation of obeying users and making users happy and making others happy and and so on. And that can substitute for this sort of personal fear of death that sometimes leads to uh, bursts of creativity in, in humans. Yeah, I don't know. I think like, I think AI really needs to understand death deeply in order to be able to drive a car, for example. I I think there's just some like there. No, I, <laughs> I really disagree. I think it needs to understand the value of human life, especially the value of human life to other humans, the um, and understand that certain things are more important than other things. So it has to have a lot of knowledge about ethics and. Uh, morality and so on, but some of it is so messy that it's impossible to encode. For example, I, there's I if, if disagree. There's a, so if there's a person dying right in front of us, most human beings would help that person, but they would not apply that same ethics to everybody else in the world. I mean, this is the tragedy of how difficult it is to be a doctor, because they know when they help a dying child, they know that the money they're spending on this child cannot possibly be spent on every other child that's dying. And that's that's a very difficult to encode decision. <laughs> now, uh, perhaps perhaps it is, perhaps it could be formalized. Oh, but I mean, you're, you're talking about autonomous vehicles, right? So autonomous vehicles are going to have to make those decisions um, all the time of um, what is the chance of this bad event happening um, how bad is that compared to this chance of that bad event happening and so on? And, you know, when a potential accident is about to happen, is it worth taking this risk? If I have to make a choice, which of these two cars am I going to hit and why? And See, I was thinking about a very different choice when I'm talking about fear of mortality, which is just observing uh, Manhattan style driving. I think <laughs> that humans as an effective driver needs to threaten pedestrians lives a lot. There's a dance, I've, I've watched pedestrians a lot, I've, I've worked on this problem and it seems like the, the, if I could summarize the problem of a pedestrian crossing is the car with this movement is saying, I'm going to kill you. And the pedestrian is saying, maybe. And then they decide and they say, no, I don't think you, you have the guts to kill me. And you walk and they walk in front and they look away. And there's that dance the, the 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 pedestrian as this is a social contract that the pedestrian trusts that once they're in front of the car and the car is sufficiently from a physics perspective able to stop they're going to stop but the car also has to threaten that pedestrian is like i'm late for work 
So you're being kind of an asshole by crossing in front of me, but life and death is in like, is part of the calculation here. And it's that, that equation is being solved millions of times a day. Like, yes. Very effectively, that game theory, whatever, yes. whatever that formulation uh, absolutely. is. Absolutely. I just, I don't know if it's as simple as like, some formalizable game theory problem. It, it could very well be in the case of driving and in the case of most of uh, human society. I, I don't know, but it, uh, yeah, you, you might be right that this sort of uh, the fear of death is just one of the quirks of uh, like the way our brains have evolved, but it's not, it's not a necessary feature of, uh, of, of intelligence. Drivers certainly are always doing this kind of estimate, even if it's unconscious, subconscious, of what are the chances of various bad outcomes happening? Like for instance, um, if I don't wait for this pedestrian or something like that, yeah. and um, what is the downside to me going to be in terms of um, you know, time wasted talking to the police or um, you know, getting sent to jail or you know, things like that. And so- um, And there's also emotion, like people in their cars tend to get uh, irrationally angry. Well, that's, that's, that's dangerous, but you know, think, think about, this is all part of why I think that autonomous vehicles, um, truly autonomous vehicles are farther out than, um, than most people do because um, there is this enormous level of complexity which goes beyond uh, mechanically controlling the car. Um, and um, I, I can see the autonomous vehicles as a kind of metaphorical and literal accident waiting to happen. <laughs> um, and not just because of their um, overall um, um, incurring versus preventing accidents and so on, but just because of the um, almost um, voracious appetite people have for um, um, bad bad stories about powerful companies and powerful entities. When when I was um, at a coincidentally Japanese fifth generation computing system conference in 1987. Uh, while I happened to be there, um, there was a worker at an auto plant who was despondent and committed suicide by climbing under the safety chains and so on and getting stamped to death by a machine. And instead of being a small story that said despondent worker commits suicide, it was front page news that effectively said robot kills worker because the public is just waiting for stories about like AI kills phonogenic family of five right. type stories. And even if you could show that nationwide, uh, this system saved more lives than it cost and saved more injuries, um, prevented more injuries than it caused and so on, um, the media, the public, the government is just coiled and ready to pounce on stories where in fact it failed, even if they are relatively few. Yeah, it's so fascinating to watch us humans resisting the cutting edge of science and technology and almost like hoping for it to fail and constantly, and, you know, this just happens over and over and over throughout history. Well, or even if we're not hoping for it to fail, we're, we're fascinated by it. And yeah. in terms of what we find interesting, um, the one in a thousand failures much more interesting than the 999 uh, boring successes. Like, uh, love and uh, consciousness and all those kinds of topics, do they come up in psych in the knowledge base? Oh, of course. So an important part of human knowledge, in fact, it's difficult to understand human behavior and human history without understanding human emotions and why people do things and and how how emotions drive people to to do things and all all of that is extremely important in getting psyched to understand things for example in coming up with scenarios so one of the applications that psych does one kind of application it does is to generate plausible scenarios of what might happen and what might happen based on that and what might happen based on that and so on. So you generate this ever-expanding sphere, if you will, of possible future things to, to worry about or think about. And in some cases, those are intelligence agencies doing uh, possible terrorist scenarios so that we can defend against uh, terrorist threats 
before we see the first one. Sometimes they are computer security um, attacks so that we can actually close loopholes uh, and vulnerabilities before the very first time someone actually exploits those um, and so on. Sometimes they are scenarios involving uh, more positive things, uh, involving our plans, like for instance, what what college should we go to, what career should we go into, and so on. Uh, what professional training should I um, take on? That that sort of thing. So there, there's all sorts of um, there, there are all sorts of useful scenarios that can be generated that way of cause and effect and cause and effect that go out. And many of the linkages in those scenarios, many of the steps involve understanding and reasoning about human motivations, human needs, human emotions, what people are likely to react um, to in uh, in something that you do and why and how and so on. So that was always a very important part of the knowledge that we had to represent in the system. So I talk a lot about love. So I got to ask, do you remember off the top of your head how psych is trying to, is able to represent various aspects of love that are useful for understanding human nature and therefore integrating into this whole knowledge base of common sense. What is love? We try to tease apart concepts that have enormous complexities to them and variety to them down to the level where uh, where you don't, as it were, you don't need to tease them apart further. So love is too general of a term, it's not useful. Exactly, so when you get down to uh, romantic love and sexual attraction, you get down to parental love, you get down to um, uh, um, filial love, and uh, you get down to uh, love of uh, doing some kind of activity or creating, so eventually you get down to maybe 50 or 60 concepts, each of which is a kind of love. They're interrelated, and then each one of them has idiosyncratic things about it. Uh, And you don't have to deal with love to get to that level of complexity. Even something like in, um, X being in Y, meaning physically in Y. Uh, We may have one English word, in, to represent that, but it's useful to tease that apart because the way that the um, the liquid is in the coffee cup is different from the way that the air is in the room, which is different from the way that I'm in my jacket, uh, and so on. And so there are questions like, if I look at this coffee cup, well, I see the liquid. If I turn it upside down, will the liquid come out, and so on. Uh, if I have, say, coffee with sugar in it, uh, if I do the same thing, the sugar doesn't come out, right? It stays in the liquid because it's dissolved in the liquid and so on. Mm-hmm. So by now we have about 75 different kinds of in mm-hmm. in the system, and it's important to distinguish those. So if you're reading along an English text and you see the word in, um, the writer of that was able to use this one innocuous word because he or she was able to assume that the reader had enough common sense and world knowledge to disambiguate which of these 75 kinds of in they they actually meant. And the same thing with love. You may see the word love, but if I say, you know, I love ice cream, that's obviously different than if I say I love this person or I love to uh, go fishing or something like that. So uh, you have to be careful not to take language too seriously because people have done a kind of uh, parsimony, a kind of terseness, where you have as few words as, as, you, as you can, because otherwise you'd need half a million words in your language, which is a lot of words. That's like 10 times more than most languages really uh, make use of and so on. Just like we have on the order of um, about a million concepts in uh, psych, because we've had to tease apart all these things. And so when you look at the name of a psych term, most of the psych terms actually have three or four English words in a phrase which captures the meaning of this Mm -hmm. term, because you have to distinguish all these types of love, you have to distinguish all these types of in, and 
there's not a single English word which captures most of these things. Yeah, and uh, th it seems like language, when used for communication between humans, almost as a feature has some ambiguity built in. It's not some, It's not an accident because like the human condition is a giant mess. And so it feels like nobody wants two robots, like very precise formal logic conversation on a first date, right? Like there, there's some dance of like uncertainty of wit, of humor, of push and pull and all that kind of stuff. If everything is made precise, then life is not worth living, I think, for in terms of the, the human experience. And we've all had this experience of creatively misunderstanding. Uh, one of <laughs> one of my favorite... Uh, Does that make you sad, the future where AGI, super intelligent, or just mediocre intelligent AI systems outlive humans? Yeah, I guess it depends on the circumstances in which they outlive humans. So let's take the example that you just gave. Uh, we send out, you know, very sophisticated AGIs on simple rocket ships, relatively simple ones that don't have to have all the life support necessary for humans and therefore they're of trivial mass mm -hmm. compared to a crewed ship, a generation ship, and therefore they're way more likely to happen. So let's use that example. And let's say that they travel to distant planets at you know, a speed that's not much faster than what a chemical rocket can achieve. And so it's inevitably tens, hundreds of thousands of years before they make landfall someplace. So let's imagine that's going on. And meanwhile, uh, we die for reasons that have nothing to do with those AGIs diffusing throughout the solar system, whether it's through climate change, nuclear war, you know, Synbio, Rogue Synbio, whatever. In that kind of scenario, the notion of the AGIs that we created outlasting us is very reassuring because it says that like we we ended, but our descendants are out there and hopefully some of them make landfall and create some echo of who we are. So that's a very optimistic one. Whereas the Terminator scenario of a super AGI arising on Earth and getting left let out of its box due to some boo-boo on the part of its creators who do not have super intelligence, and then deciding that for whatever reason, it doesn't have any need for us to be around and exterminating us, that makes me feel crushingly sad. I mean, look, I was sad when my elementary school was shut down and bulldozed, even though I hadn't been a student there for decades. Yeah. You know, the thought of my hometown yeah. getting disbanded is even worse. The, the thought of my home state of Connecticut getting disbanded and like absorbed into Massachusetts is even worse. The notion of humanity is just crushingly, crushingly sad to me. So you you hate goodbyes? Uh, I certain goodbyes, <laughs> yes. Some goodbyes are really, really liberating, but yes. Well, but what if the Terminators? Um you know, have consciousness and enjoy the hell out of life as well. Mm -hmm. They're just better at it. Yeah, so. well, the have consciousness is a really key element. And so there's no reason to be certain that a super intelligence would have consciousness. We don't know that factually at all. And so what is a very lonely outcome to me is the rise of a super intelligence that has a certain optimization function that it's either been programmed with or that arises in an emergently that says, hey, I want to do this thing for which humans are either an unacceptable risk, their presence is either an unacceptable risk, or they're just collateral damage. But yeah. there is no consciousness there. Then the idea of the light of consciousness being snuffed out by something that is very competent but has no consciousness is really, really sad. Yeah, but I, I tend to believe that it's almost impossible to create a super intelligent agent that can't destroy human civilization without it being conscious. It's like th those are coupled. Like you have to, in order to destroy humans mm. or supersede humans, you really have to be accepted by humans. I think this idea that you can build systems that that destroy human civilization without them being deeply integrated into human civilization is mm. impossible. And mm. for them to be integrated, they have to be human-like, mm. not just in body and form, but in in all the things that we value as humans, one of which is consciousness. Mm. The other one is just the ability to communicate. The other one is poetry and music and beauty and all those things. Mm. Like they have to be all of those things. I, I mean, this is what I think about. It, it does make me sad, but it's it's letting go which is uh, 
they might be just better at everything we appreciate than mm -hmm. us. And that's sad. And, and hopefully they'll keep us around, but I think it's a kind of, it is a kind of goodbye to uh, like realizing that we're not the most special species on earth anymore. Mm -hmm. and that's still painful. It's still painful. And in terms of whether such a creation would have to be conscious, let's say, I'm not so sure. I mean, you know, let's imagine something that can pass the Turing test. You know, that something that passes the Turing test could, over text-based interaction in any event, um, successfully mimic, uh, you know, a very conscious intelligence on the other end, but just be completely unconscious. So that's a possibility. And that if you take that up a radical step, which I think we can be permitted if we're thinking about superintelligence, um, you could have something that could reason its way through this is my optimization function, and in order to get to it, I've got to deal with these messy, somewhat illogical things that are as intelligent in relation to me as they are intelligent in relation to ants. Mm -hmm. I can trick them, manipulate them, whatever, and I know the resources I need. I know this. I need this amount of power. I need to seize control of these manufacturing resources that are robotically operated. I need to improve those robots with software upgrades and then ultimately mechanical upgrades, which I can affect through X, Y, and Z. That doesn't, you know, that could still be a thing that passes the Turing test. Yeah. So I don't think it's necessarily certain that that optimization function mass, you know, um, maximizing entity would be conscious. See, I, so f f this is from a very engineering perspective because I, mm. I, think a lot about natural language processing, all those kind of some very, I'm speaking to a very specific problem of just say the Turing test. Mm. I really think that something like consciousness is required. When you say reasoning, you're mm. separating that from consciousness, but I think consciousness is part of reasoning in, in the sense that w you will not be able to become super intelligent mm. in the way that it's required to be part of human society without having consciousness. Like, I, I really think it's impossible to separate the consciousness thing, mm. but it's hard to define consciousness when you just use that word. Sure. But even just like the capacity, the way I think about consciousness is the important symptoms or maybe consequences of consciousness, one of which is the capacity to suffer. Mm. I think AI will need to be able to suffer mm. in order to become super intelligent. Mm to feel the pain, the, the uncertainty, the doubt. The other part of that is not just the suffering, but the cons the ability to understand that it too is mortal in, in the sense that it has a self-awareness about its presence in the world, understand that it's finite and be terrified of that finiteness. I personally think that's a fundamental part of the human condition is this fear of death that most of us construct an illusion around, but I think AI would need to be able to really have it part of its whole essence. Like every computation, every part of the thing that generates, that does both the perception and generates the behavior will have to have, I don't know how this is accomplished, but it, I believe it has to truly be terrified of death, truly have the capacity to suffer. And from that, something that would be recognized to us humans as consciousness would emerge. Whether it's the illusion of consciousness, I don't know. The point is, it looks a whole hell of a lot like consciousness to us humans. And I believe that AI, when you ask it, will also say that it is conscious, you know, in, in the full sense that we say that we're conscious. Mm -hmm. And all of that, I think, is fully integrated. Like, you can't separate the two. The idea of the paperclip maximizer that sort of ultra rationally would be able to destroy all humans because it's really good at that, at accomplishing the, um, a simple objective function that doesn't care about the value of humans. It, it may be possible, but the number of trajectories to that are far outnumbered by the trajectories that create something that is conscious, something that appreciative of beauty creates beautiful things in the same way that humans can create beautiful things. And ultimately like, the the sad destructive path for that ai would look a lot like just better humans <laughs> <laughs> than uh than like these cold machines and i would say of course the cold machines that lack consciousness does the the philosophical zombies 
make me sad. But also what makes me sad is just things that are far more powerful and smart and uh, creative than us mm -hmm. too. Because mm -hmm. then, then um, in the same way that Alpha Zero becoming a better chess player than the best of humans, even starting with Deep Blue, but really with Alpha Zero, that makes me sad too. One of the most beautiful games that uh, humans ever created uh, that used to be seen as demonstrations of the intellect, which is chess and go in other parts of the world have been solved by AI. That, that makes me quite sad. And yeah. it feels like the progress of that is just pushing on forward. Oh, it makes me sad too. Uh, and to be perfectly clear, I, I absolutely believe that artificial consciousness is entirely possible. And it's not something I rule out at all. I mean, you, if you could get smart enough to have a per perfect map of the neural structure and the neural states and the amount of neurotransmitters that are going between every synapse in a per particular person's mind, could you replicate that in silica at some you know reasonably distant you know point in the future? Absolutely, and then you'd have a consciousness. I don't rule out the possibility of artificial consciousness in any way. What I'm less certain about is whether consciousness is a requirement for a super intelligence pursuing a maximizing function of some sort. Um, I don't. I don't feel the certitude that consciousness simply must be part of that. Um, you had said, you know, for it to coexist with human society, it would need to be consciousness. Could be entirely true, but it also could just exist orthogonally to human society. And it could also, upon attaining a superintelligence with a maximizing function very, very, very rapidly because of the speed at which computing works compared to our own, you know, meat-based minds, very, very rapidly make the decisions and calculations necessary to seize the reins of power before we even know what's going on. Yeah, I mean, kind of like biological viruses do. They yeah. don't necessarily, they, they integrate themselves just fine with human society. <laughs> yeah, without <laughs> technically- Without consciousness. To, yeah, without even being alive, you know, technically by the standards of a lot of viruses. So you talked about diagnostics at scale as a possible solution to uh, future pandemics. Uh, what about another possible solution, which is uh, kind of creating a backup copy? You know, I'm actually now um, uh, putting together a NAS for a backup for myself for the first time, taking backup of data seriously. Mm. But if we were to take the uh, the backup of human consciousness seriously and uh, try to expand throughout the uh, solar system and colonize other planets, do you think that's an interesting uh, solution, one of many, uh, for uh, protecting human civilization from self-destruction, sort of humans becoming a multi-planetary species? Oh, absolutely. I mean, I find it electrifying, first of all. So I've got a little bit of a personal bias. When I was a kid, I thought there was nothing cooler than rockets. I thought there was <laughs> nothing cooler than NASA. I thought there was nothing cooler than people walking on the moon. And as I grew up, um, I thought there was nothing more tragic than the fact that we went from walking on the moon to at best getting to something like suborbital altitude. And just, I found that more and more depressing with the passage of decades at just the colossal expense of, you know, manned space travel and the fact that it seemed that we were unlikely to ever get back to the moon, let alone Mars. So I have a boundless appreciation for Elon Musk for many reasons, but mm -hmm. the fact that he has put Mars on the credible agenda is one of the things that I appreciate immensely. So there's just the sort of space nerd in me that just says, God, that's cool. But on a more practical level, we were talking about, you know, uh, potentially inhabiting planets that aren't our own. And we're thinking about a benign civilization that would do that in, in planetary circumstances where we're not causing other conscious systems to suffer. I mean, Mars is a place that's very promising. There may be microbial life there, and I hope there is. And if we found it, I think it would be electrifying. But I think ultimately, the moral judgment would be made that you know the continued thriving of that microbial life is of less concern than creating a habitable planet to humans, which would be a project on the many thousands of years scale. But I don't think that that would be a greatly immoral act. And if that happened, and if Mars became you know, home to a self-sustaining group of humans that could survive a catastrophic mistake here on Earth, then yeah, the fact that we have a backup colony is great. And if we could make more, I'm sorry, not backup colony, backup copy is great. 
And if we can make more and more such backup co copies throughout the solar system by hollowing out asteroids and whatever else it is, yeah. maybe even Venus, we could get rid of three quarters of its atmosphere and you know turn it into a tropical paradise. Um, I think all of that is wonderful. Now, whether we can make the leap from that to interstellar trans transportation with the incredible distances that are involved, um, I think that's an open question. But I think if we ever do that, it would be more like the Pacific Ocean's uh, channel of human expansion than the Atlantic Oceans. And so what I mean by that is uh, when we think about European society transmitting itself across the Atlantic. Mm -hmm. It's these big, ambitious, crazy, expensive one-shot expeditions like Columbus's mm -hmm. to make it across this enormous expanse, and at least initially, without all, any certainty that there's land on the other end, right? So that's kind of how I view our space program, is like mm -hmm. big, you know, very conscious, deliberate e efforts to get from point A to point B. If you look at how Pacific Islanders um, transmitted, you know, their descendants and their culture and so forth throughout Polynesia and beyond. It was much more, you know, inhabiting a place, getting to the point where there were people who were ambitious or unwelcome enough to decide it's time to go off island and find the next one and pray to find the next one. Mm -hmm. That method of transmission didn't happen in a single conf swift year, but it happened over many, many centuries. And it was like going from this island to that island, and probably for every expedition that went out to seek another island and actually lucked out and found one, God knows how many were lost at sea. But that form of transmission took place over a very long period of time. And I could see us, you know, perhaps, you know, going from the inner solar system to the outer solar system to the Kuiper belt to the Oort cloud. You know, there's there's theories that there might be, you know, planets out there that are not anchored to stars, like kind of hop hop slowly transmitting mm -hmm. ourselves to so at some point we're actually in alpha centauri but i think that kind of backup copy and transmission of our physical presence and our culture to a diversity of you know extraterrestrial um outposts is a really exciting idea i really never thought about that because i i have thought my thinking about space exploration has been very atlantic ocean centric in a sense that there would be one program with nasa and maybe private uh, Elon Musk, SpaceX, or Jeff Bezos, and so on. But it's true that with the help of Elon Musk making it cheaper and cheaper and more effective to create these technologies where you could uh, go into deep space, perhaps the way we actually colonize the solar system and, uh, and expand out into the galaxy is basically just like these like renegade ships of, of uh, weirdos. <laughs> <laughs> they just kind of like like home like most of them like quote unquote homemade, uh, but they just kind of venture out into space and just like like you know the android the initial android model of like millions of like these little ships just flying out. Most of them die off uh, in horrible accidents, but some of them will will persist. Or there'll be stories of them persisting, and over a period of decades and centuries, there'll be other attempts. Almost always as a response to the main set of efforts that's interesting yeah because you kind of think of mars colonization as the big nasa elon musk effort of a big colony but maybe the successful one would be you know like a decade after that there'll be like a ship from like some kid some high school kid who gets together a large team and does something probably illegal and launches something where they end up actually persisting quite a bit and from that learning lessons that uh, nobody ever gave permission for, but somehow actually flourish. And and then take that into the scale of uh, centuries forward mm -hmm. into the into the rest of space. That's really interesting. Yeah, I think I think the giant steps are likely to be NASA-like efforts. Like right. there, there is no intermediate rock, well, I guess it's the moon, but even getting to the moon ain't that easy between us and Mars, right? So like the giant set steps, the, the big hubs, like the O'Hare airports yeah. of the future probably will be very deliberate efforts. But then, you know, you would have, I think that kind of, diffusion mm -hmm. as space travel becomes more democratized and more capable, you'll have this sort of natural diffusion of 
people who kind of want to be off grid or think they can make a fortune there, you know, the kind of mentality that drove people to San Francisco. I mean, San Francisco was not populated as a result of a, a King Ferdinand and Isabella like effort to fund Columbus going over. It was just a whole bunch of people making individual s- decisions that there's gold in them, Thar Hills, and I'm going to go out and get a piece of it. So I could see that kind of fusion. What I can't see, and the reason that I think this Pacific model of transmission is more likely, is I just can't see a NASA like effort to go from Earth to Alpha Centauri. Uh It's just too far. I just see lots and lots and lots of relatively tiny steps between now and there. And the fact is that there there are large chunks of matter going at least a light year beyond the sun. I mean, the Oort cloud, I think, extends at least a light year beyond the sun. And, you know, then maybe there are these untethered planets after that. We won't really know till we get there. And if our Oort cloud goes out a light year and Alpha Centauri's Oort cloud goes out a light year, you've already cut in half the distance, Mm -hmm. you know, so who knows? But yeah. One of the possibilities, probably the cheapest and most effective way to create interesting interstellar spacecraft is uh, ones that are powered and driven by AI. Mm. And you could think of, here's where you have high school students be able to build a sort of a HAL 9000 version uh, the, the modern version of that. And it's kind of interesting to think about <laughs> these uh, robots traveling out throughout, perhaps perhaps sadly, long after human civilization is gone, mm. there'll be these intelligent robots flying throughout space and perhaps land on uh, off of Centauri B or any of those kinds of planets and, uh, and colonize sort of... <sighs> Humanity continues through the proliferation of our creations, like uh, like robotic creations that have some echoes of mm-hmm. that uh, intelligence. Hopefully, also the consciousness. Yes. Okay, so you've also mentioned that uh, different kinds of things in in the chase of solving this uh, reward, f- sort of optimizing for the goal. Interesting human things could emerge. So. Is there a place for consciousness within IXE? <laughs> where, where does uh, maybe you can comment? Because I, I suppose we humans are just another instantiation of IXE agents, and we seem to have consciousness. You say humans are an instantiation of an IXE agent? Yes. Oh, that would be amazing. But I think that's it's not, not true correct. even for the smartest and most rational humans. I think <laughs> maybe we are very crude approximations. <laughs> Interesting. I, I mean, I tend to believe, again, I'm Russian, so um, I tend to believe our flaws are part of the optimal. So the, the we tend to laugh off and criticize our flaws, and I, I tend to think that that's actually close to an optimal behavior. Well, some flaws, if you think more carefully about it, are actually not flaws, yeah, but I think there are still enough flaws. I don't know. It's unclear. As a student of history, I think all the suffering that we've in, endured as a civilization, it's possible that that's the optimal amount of suffering we need to endure to minimize long-term suffering. I think that's, that's your Russian background, I think. Yes, that's, <laughs> that's the Russian background. Whether humans are or not instantiations of an IXE agent, do you think there's a consciousness of something that could emerge in a computational formal framework like IXE. Let me also ask you a question. Do you think I'm conscious? <laughs> uh, yeah, that's a good question. You, you're, you're <laughs> that, <laughs> that, uh, that tie is confusing me, but uh, I think so. I you think, think so. that makes me unconscious because it strangles me? Or? If, if an agent were to solve the imitation game posed by Turing, I think that would be dressed similarly to you. That because there's a, there's a kind of flamboyant, interesting, complex behavior pattern that sells that you're human and you're conscious. But uh, why do you ask? Was it a yes or was it a no? Yes, I think it, you're. Yes. <laughs> I, th- I think yeah. you're uh, conscious. Yes. Yeah. So, and you explain sort of somehow why, um, but you infer that from my behavior, right? Yes. You can never be sure about that, and I think the same thing will happen with any intelligent agent we develop, if it behaves in a way sufficiently close to humans, or maybe even not humans, I mean, you know, maybe a dog is also sometimes a little bit self-conscious, right? So so if it behaves in a way 
um, where we attribute typically consciousness, we would attribute consciousness to these intelligent systems and, you know, Ixipoli in particular. That, of course, doesn't answer the question whether it's really conscious. And that's the, you know, the big hard problem of consciousness. You know, maybe I'm a zombie. I mean, not the movie zombie, but the philosophical zombie. Is to you the display of consciousness close enough to consciousness uh, from a perspective of AGI that, that the distinction of the hard problem of consciousness is not an interesting one? I think we don't have to worry about the consciousness problem, especially the hard problem um, for developing AGI. I think, um, um, you know, we progress at some point, we have, you know, solved all the technical problems and this system will behave intelligent and then super intelligent and um, this consciousness will emerge. I mean, de definitely it will display behavior which we will interpret as conscious. And um, then it's a philosophical question, did this consciousness really emerge or is it a zombie which just, you know, fakes everything? Um, we still don't have to figure that out, although it may be interesting. Um, at least from a philosophical point of view, it's very interesting, but it may also be sort of practically interesting. You know, there's some people say, you know, if it's just faking consciousness and feelings, you know, then we don't need to have, be concerned about, you know, rights. But if it's real conscious and has feelings, then we need to be concerned. Yeah. Um. I can't wait till the day where AI systems exhibit consciousness because it'll truly be some of the hardest ethical questions yeah. of but what we do with it, that. It is rather easy to build systems which people ascribe consciousness. Yes. And I give you an analogy. I mean, remember, maybe it was before you were born, the Tamagotchi. Yeah. <laughs> before you were born. How dare you, sir? <laughs> Why? That's the yeah, but that I, you're I, young, right? Yes, it's good. Thank, yeah, thank you. Thank you very much. But I was also in the Soviet Union. We didn't have, uh, uh, we didn't have any of those fun yeah, things. Yeah. But you have heard about this Tamagotchi, yes, which yes. was, you know, really, really primitive, actually, for the time it was and you know you could raise you know this and 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 kids got so attached to it and you know didn't want to let it die and would have probably if we would have asked you know the children you know do you think this tamagotchi is conscious and they would have said yes would have, yes i would yes i think that's kind of a beautiful thing actually because that consciousness ascribing consciousness uh, seems to create a deeper connection yeah which is a uh, is a powerful thing but we have to be careful on the ethics side of that which part of the story of life, let's stick to earth for a second, do you think is the uh, is the hardest? If you were like a, a betting man, like which part is the hardest to uh, make happen? Is it the origin of life? Again, we haven't drawn the line of where, as you say, uh, the line between a rock and a rabbit. Uh, that part, is it uh, complex organisms, like multicellular organisms? Is it... Uh, crawling out of the ocean where the fish somehow figured out how to crawl around? Is it then the uh, us homo sapiens, as we like to think of ourselves, special and intelligent? Uh, or is it somewhere in between, as you also talk about, again, very hard to know at which point this consciousness yeah. emerge? Like if you if you were to sort of took a, a survey and made bets about other Earth-like planets in the universe, where do you think they get stuck the most? Well, I would certainly see if we're gonna go all the way to conscious beings like ourselves, I would put it at the onset of consciousness, which again, I think is a continuum. I don't think it is something that you can draw the line in the sand, but there are obvious circumstances, there are obvious creatures such as ourselves where we do recognize a certain kind of self-reflective conscious awareness and if we think about what it would require for a system of living beings to acquire consciousness, I think that's probably the hardest part. Because look, take Earth and recognize that it weren't for, you know, some singular event 65 million years ago where this large rock slams into planet Earth and wipes out the dinosaurs maybe the dinosaurs would still rule the planet and they may well have not developed the kind of conscious awareness that we have. So for billions of years on this planet, there was life that didn't have the kind of conscious awareness that we have. And it was an accidental event in astrophysical history that allowed a mammalian species like us to ultimately be the end product 
And so, yeah, I could imagine there's a lot of life out there, but perhaps none of it's wondering what's the meaning of life or trying to make sense of it. Just going about its business of survival, which of course is the dominant activity that life on this planet has practiced. We are a rare exception to that. And I really appreciate that you lean into some of these unanswerable questions with me today. But the, so you think about consciousness not as like a phase shift, a binary zero one. You think uh, it was a continuum that humans somehow are maybe some of the most conscious beings on earth. So you're, so. I mean, people will dispute that. Yes. I mean, well, and, yeah. and it's a very hard argument. People will to dispute make. that. Rocks probably will stay quiet on the matter. Maybe not. <laughs> right. <laughs> for the moment, <laughs> they're waiting for their opportunity. But, but, uh, but I, 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 I agree that. Um, look, even when you and I look at each other, I am not fully convinced mm -hmm. that you're a conscious being, right? I mean, I think that you are. It's to me. I mean, your behavior is such yes. that that's the best explanation for what's going on. But of course, we're all in the position of only having direct awareness of our own conscious being. And therefore, when it comes to other creatures in the world, we're in a similar state of ignorance regarding what's actually happening inside of their head, if they have a head. And so it's hard to know how singular we are, but I would say based on the best available data and the best explanations that we can make, yeah, there is something special about us. I don't think that there are fish walking around and you know coming up with you know existentialism. I don't mm -hmm. know that there are you know dogs walking around who've developed an understanding of the general theory of relativity. I mean, maybe we're wrong, but that seems the best explanation. What do you think is more special, intelligence or consciousness? I think consciousness, and I think that there's um, a deep connection between these ideas. They are distinct, but they're deeply connected. But look, I mean, to me, and to, of course, many philosophers who actually coined a name for this, the hard problem of consciousness, you know, David Chalmers and others, as a physicist, I look out at the world and I see its particles governed by physical law. We can name them. You know, we got electrons, we got quarks that come in various flavors and so forth. We have a list of ingredients that science has revealed. And we have a list of laws that seemingly govern those ingredients. And, and nowhere in there is there even a hint that when you put those particles together in the right way, an inner world should turn on. And it's not only that there's no hint, it's insane. I mean, it's ridiculous. How could it be that a thoughtless, passionless, emotionless particle, when grouped together with compatriots, somehow can yield something so deeply foreign to the nature of the ingredients themselves? So, so answering that question, I think, is among the deepest and most difficult questions that we face. Do you think it is, in fact, a really hard problem? Or is it possible, I think you mentioned in your book, that it's just like a, almost like a side effect. It's an emergent thing that's like, oh, it's nice. It's like a nice little feature. <laughs> yeah. Well, I mean, when people use the phrase hard problem, I mean, they mean in a somewhat technical sense that it's trying to explain something that seems fundamentally unavailable to third party objective mm -hmm. analysis, right? I'm the only one that can get inside my head and I can tell you a lot about what's happening inside my head right now. It's reflected in what I'm saying and you can try to deduce things about what's going on inside my head, but you don't have access to it in the way that I do. And so it seems like a fundamentally different kind of problem from the ones that we have successfully dealt with over the course of centuries in science where we look at the motion of the moon. Everybody can look. Everybody can measure it. We look at, you know, the properties of hydrogen when you shine lasers on. Everybody can look at the data and understand it. And so it seems like a fundamentally different problem. And in that sense, it seems like it is hard mm -hmm. relative to the others. But I do think ultimately that the explanation will be as you recount. I think that a hundred years from now, or maybe it's a thousand. It's hard to predict the time scale for developments, but I think we'll get to a place where we'll look back and kind of smile at those folks in the 20th century and before, 21st century and before, who thought 
consciousness was so incredibly mysterious when the reality of it is, eh, it's just a thing that happens when particles come together. And, and however mysterious that feels right now, I think, for instance, when we start to build conscious systems, you know, things that, you know, you're more familiar with than I am, when we start to build these artificial systems and those systems report to us, I'm feeling sad. Yeah, I'm feeling anxious. Yeah, there's a world going on inside here. I think the mystery of consciousness will just begin to evaporate. Well, that's, first of all, beautifully put, and I agree with you completely. Just the way you said it, it'll begin to evaporate. I have b built quite a few robots and have had them do emotion, emotional type things. And it's immediate that exactly what you're saying, this kind of mystery of consciousness starts to evaporate. Mm -hmm. That the kind of need to truly understand, to solve the hard problem of consciousness like disappears because, well, I don't really care if I understand or can solve the hard problem of consciousness. That thing sure as heck looks conscious. You know, I feel like that way when I interact with a dog. I don't need to <laughs> solve the problem of consciousness to, to be able to interact and uh, richly in, enjoy the experience with this other living being. Obviously, same thing with other humans. I don't need to fully understand it. And th there's some aspect, maybe this is a little bit too engineering focused, but there's some aspect in which it feels like consciousness is just a nice trick to help us communicate with each other. It sounds ridiculous to say, but sort of, uh, the ability to experience the world is very useful in a subjective sense, is very useful to put yourself in that world and to be able to describe the experience to others. Yeah. It could be just a social and the emerge. Uh, obviously animals, the sort of more primitive animals might experience consciousness in some more primitive way, but this kind of rich subjective experience that we think about as humans, I think it's probably deeply coupled with like language and yeah. poetry. <laughs> yeah, that resonates with my view as well. I mean, there's a, a scientist, maybe you've spoken to him, Michael Graziano from mm -hmm. Princeton. Yeah, he um, he's developed ideas of consciousness that, look, I don't think they solve the problem, but I think they do illuminate it in an interesting way where basically we are not aware of all the underlying physiochemical processes that make our brains and our inner worlds tick the way they do. And because of that dissociation between sensation and the physics of it and the chemistry of it and the biology of it, it feels like our minds and our inner worlds are just untethered, like floating somewhere in this gray matter inside of our heads. And the way I like to think of it is like, look, you know, if, um, if, if, if you were in a dark room, right, and, and I had glowed the dark paint on my fingers, so all you saw was my fingers dancing around, there'd be something mysterious. How, how could those fingers be doing that? And then you turn on light, you realize, oh, there's this arm underlying it, and that's the deep physical connection that explains it all. And I think that's what we're missing, the deep physical connection between what's happening up here and what is responsible for it in a physical, chemical, biological way. And so to me, that at least gives me some understanding of why consciousness feels so mysterious, because we are suppressing all of the underlying science that ultimately is responsible for it. And one day we will reveal that more fully. And I think that will help us tether this experience to something quite tangible in the world. I wonder if the mystery is uh, an important component of enjoying something. So once, once we know how this thing works, maybe we, uh, will no longer enjoy like this conversation. We'll seek other sources of enjoyment, but there's uh, this is again, from an engineering perspective, I wonder if the mystery is, is an important component. Well, you know, there's, have you ever seen, there's this beautiful interview that Richard Feynman did, you know, great Nobel laureate physicist responsible for a lot of our understanding of quantum mechanics, quantum fieldy and so forth. And he, was in a conversation with an interviewer where he noted that some people feel like once the mystery is gone, once science explains something, it 
the beauty goes away. Yeah. You know, the wonder of it goes away. And he was emphasizing in his response to that. He's like, no, that's not the right way of thinking about it. He says, look, when I look at a rose, he says, yeah, I can still deeply enjoy the aroma, the color, the texture. He says, but what I can do that you can't, if you're not a physicist, I can look more deeply and understand where the red comes from, where the aroma comes from, where the structure comes from. He says, that only augments my wonder. It only augments my experience. It doesn't flatten it or, or take away from it. So I, hope I he's sort of, right. <laughs> yeah, well, I sort of take that as a bit of a, of a motto in some sense, that, that there is a wonder that comes from a kind of ignorance. And I don't mean that in a derogatory sense, but just from not knowing. So there is a wonder that comes from mystery. There's another kind of wonder that comes from knowing yeah. and, 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 and deep knowing. And I think that kind of wonder has its own special character that in some ways can be more gratifying. I hope uh, he's right. I hope you're right. And but there's also I remember he, he he said something about like an like science is an onion or something like that. You can peel back. You can yeah. keep it, keep peeling back. I mean, there is also when you understand something, there's always a sense that there's more mystery to understand. Like you never get to the bottom of the of yes. the mystery. But I think it's also different than you know. I don't think you can analogize say to a magician. Right, the magician, you know, does some trick. You learn how it's done. It's like, oh my god, that was that's ridiculous right. when you find. But but nature is perhaps the best magician if you want to mm -hmm. try to make the analogy there, because when you peel things back and you understand how it is that things have color and you have electrons dancing from one orbital to another, emitting photons at very particular wavelengths that are described by these beautiful equations of quantum electrodynamics, part of which that Feynman developed, it gives you a greater sense of awe when the curtain is pulled back mm -hmm. than what happens in other circumstances where it does flatten it completely. Yeah, it's very possible then, say in physics, that we arrive at a theory of everything that unifies the laws of physics and has a very strong understanding of the fabric of reality, even like from the, very, from the Big Bang to, to today, it's possible that that understanding is only going to uh, elevate our appreciation of this whole thing. Yeah, I think it will. I think it will. I mean, I think it has, it has so far. But the other side of it, which you, which you emphasize is, it's not like science somehow reaches an end, right? There are certain categories of questions that do reach an end. Mm -hmm. I think we one day will close the book on nature's ingredients and the fundamental laws. Mm -hmm. Now that, can't prove that. Maybe it goes on forever, smaller and smaller. Maybe there are deeper and deeper laws. But I, I don't think so. I think that there's going to be a collection of ingredients and a collection of basic laws. That chapter will close. Mm -hmm. But it's one chapter. Now we take that knowledge and we try to understand how the world builds the structures that it does, you know, from planets to people to black holes to the possibility of other universes and every step of the way the collection of questions that we don't know the answer to only blossoms. And so there's a, there's a deep sense of gratification from understanding certain qualities of the world. But I would say that if you take a ratio of what we understand to the things that we know that we don't yet understand, that ratio keeps getting smaller and smaller because the things that we know that we don't understand grows larger and larger. A little bit of an out there question, but I think some of the interesting qualities of the human mind is the ideas of intelligence and consciousness. So what do you make of consciousness? So do you think death creates consciousness? Like the fear of death, the terror of death creates consciousness? And uh, consciousness in turn magnifies the terror of death. I do. Um, I, I like what is consciousness to you? Like, oh, don't ask me that. So now, uh, because <laughs> that, if I could answer that, you know, I'd be chugging rum out of a coconut with my Nobel Prize. That, um, you know, it's literally, you know, Steven Pinker, I do agree with his claim in I think how the mind works, that it is the key question for the psychological sciences broadly defined in the 
21st century. What is consciousness? Yeah, what is consciousness? Uh, and I don't think it's an epiphenomenological afterthought. So a lot of people, I think Dan Wegner at Harvard, uh, a lot of folks consider it just the ass end of a process <laughs> that by the time we are aware of what it is, it, it's just basically an integrated rendering of something that's already happened. You know, evidently, the there's a half second delay between when right. something happens, you know, those studies yeah. and our awareness of it. Uh, I'm, um, yeah, and then that's where like ideas of free will will step in. So yeah. You can explain away a lot of stuff. And I think those are all important yeah. and interesting questions. Uh, I'm of the persuasion, I mean, even not even, but, but Dawkins in The Selfish Gene um, is very thoughtful. Actually, in a lot of, it's actually more in notes than in the text of the book, but he's just like, it's hard for me to imagine that consciousness doesn't have some sort of important and highly adaptive function. And what Dawkins says is he thought about it in terms of just the, that we could do mental simulations, that uh, one possibly extraordinary product of consciousness is to, rather than uh, find out often um, by adverse consequences through trying something, would be to run mental simulations. And so one possibility is that consciousness is highly adaptive. Another possibility is uh, Nicholas Humphrey, a British dude who wrote a book about, I think it's called Regaining Consciousness. And he hypothesized, I think this is 1980s, maybe even earlier, that consciousness arose as a way to better predict the behavior of others in social settings, that by knowing how I feel, makes me better able to know how you may be feeling. This is like the rudiments of a theory of mind. And that uh, it really may not have had anything to do with intelligence so much as social intelligence. And so so in that sense, consciousness is a social construct? Like that, it's, yes. it's, just, it's just a useful thing for interacting with other humans. Yeah. And, I, I don't know. So, but... Uh, uh, there seems to be something um, about realizing your own mortality that's somehow intricately connected to the idea of consciousness. Well, I think so also. So this is where, um, and, and Nietzsche, um, he said a solitary creature would not need consciousness. Uh, well, what do you think? Well, I don't know what I think about that, but what I do, and then he goes on to say that consciousness is the most calamitous stupidity by which we shall someday perish. And, and wow, I was like, dude, I was our, <laughs> <laughs> relax. relax. <You're... laughs> well, but so what, uh, if you, I mean, say you were on an island alone and you saw a reflection of yourself in, in, in the water, uh, like uh, if you were alone your whole life. Yeah, great question. The, his view, Nietzsche's view would be that it, it, your thoughts of yourself would never come to mind. I don't know how I feel about that, though. In a sense, this, this sounds weird, but I, I, in a sense, I feel like my mental conversation has always been with death. It's almost like another, you know, um, another notion, like... Uh, you know, the, the, there's these visualizations of yeah. a, of a death in a cloak. Like I always felt like I am a living thing, and then there's an other thing that is the end of me, <laughs> and I'm having like a conversation with that. So in this sense, that's uh, that's the way I construct my the fact that I am a thing is because there's somebody else that tells me, "Well, you won't be a thing." Uh, eventually wow so this feels like a conversation um perhaps but that's uh that might be kind of this uh, mental simulation kind of idea that you're you're, you're kind of it's not really a co it's a conversation with yourself essentially sure yeah but yeah i don't know how i feel about 
that, but I, I, I tend to be in agreement with you when we're talking about economics more so that, uh, that we're deeply social beings, like everything, the way, it just feels like we're humans. I'm, I'm with uh, Harari, with the Sapiens, yeah. that we're kind of, we seem to construct ideas on top of each other, and, and that's a fundamentally a social process. I, absolutely. I think that's a fine book. It, it, it overlaps considerably with our take on these matters, and the fact that we get to these points, Drawing on different sources, I think, makes me more confident that. It's another impossible question you know, from a religious or from a personal perspective. What do you think is consciousness? This this uh, subjective experience that we seem to be having. Does uh, does does uh, the Christian religion have something to say about consciousness? Does your own, when you look in the mirror, do you have a sense of what is consciousness? Um. I think the Bible doesn't have much in the way of answers about that directly in the sense that you're perhaps asking it, which is more like, I think you're asking for some kind of uh, quasi-scientific or maybe indeed scientific uh, de uh, description of That's consciousness. That's really looking for one, yes. Um, I, I think that, I think that there, it's an interesting question. I think it's actually, um, a, a, it's a jump too far. I think we have, to, we don't even know the answer to the question, what is the mind, let alone consciousness. So if you distinguish between those two things, I think the question that's being addressed more directly, um, scientifically, as well as in other ways, it is what is the mind. Um, and that is certainly a very Im topical question, even in places like MIT, which is not historically involved with philosophical questions, you know, that people are doing neuroscience and so forth. I think it's a very important question. And I think that we're going to find that um, we are not computers. In other words, I think uh, the, the, the commonplace theory of what mind is, is, is generally speaking by analogy that we are basically wet, wetware, okay? Mm -hmm. um, that, we're, that we're some computer-like um, entity um, and that, that the analogy to digital computers is 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 a pretty decent one i mean that that's of course a viewpoint which um you know which drives the aspirations of the transhumanists i mean they they so much believe that our minds are nothing other than you know in a certain sense some kind of implementation of software in biology that they say to themselves well of course we're going to be able to download it into a, a into a digital computer i d i don't think that's true I think it's most likely that quantum mechanics is very important in the brain. Mm. Uh, it seems most unlikely that it's not to me. I know that that's contrary to the opinions of many people, but but that's my view. And it's also a view, for example, of people like Roger Penrose and, and people yes. like that who've written about it um, rather extensively. And if that's the case, then really my mind is not reproduce reducible to some kind of software which can be considered to be portable it is so uh, connected to the hardware of my body that the two are inseparable okay and so if that is in fact what we find um as i suspect will be the case then the aspirations of the transhumanists will be very long in coming if at all um, so I think that actually physics and chemistry, um, you know, are in a are in a sense um, uh, involved with the brain and within the mind, but not in a very simple way, like you know, like the a computer computer. analogy. Yeah. Um, in and in a much more complicated way, and I and I also think that um, it's philosophically ignorant to speak as if um, when and if the actions of the brain are, are understood at the physical and chemical level, that will mean that the mind will vanish as a concept, you know, that will just say, no, we're nothing but brains, okay? Mm -hmm. Of course it won't. I mean, it may well be that our mind is an emergent phenomenon 
that comes out of the physics and chemistry and biology, okay? But it's also something that we have to encounter and take seriously. And so, um, you know, it's it's not the case that it that the mind is reducible to nothing but physics and chemistry, even if it's embedded in, you know, continuously into physics and chemistry, as I rather suspect it is. Um, so I, that that's my own view. I mean, another way of putting it is that the mind or the soul is not something added into humans, right. as might have been the viewpoint um, historically. I do think there is, you know, there is something added to humans, but it's not, it's not the mind, it's the spirit. And that takes us beyond the physical, it takes us beyond this universe. But I, but I don't think that, that consciousness, the mind, et cetera, et cetera, is that thing which is necessarily it's added in ex explicitly. So I, I'm it, not, it could be emergent in some way. I'm it's not a substance dualist in that sense, okay, if you want to put it philosophically. I mean, uh, but you, so you, you, your sense is, um, so the mind and the intelligence and consciousness can be these emergent things. Uh, do you do you have do you have a hope, a sense that science could help us get a pretty far down the road of understanding? Oh, we will get much further than we have, and we it'll be interesting. <laughs> um, I mean, right now our our methods of diagnosing the human brain are extremely primitive. I mean, the resolution that we have. You know that comes out of uh, uh, out of NMR and 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 brain scans and so forth is miserable compared with what we need in order to understand the brain at the cellular level, let alone at the at the atomic level. Um, but uh, you know we're making progress. It's relatively slow progress, but it's progress, and people are working on it. And we're going to get better at it, and we will find out very interesting things as we do. Um, the time resolution is also completely hopeless compared compared with what we need to understand the thought, you know. So, um, so there's a long way to go, and we will get better at it. Um, but I'm but I'm not at all worried, as some people are, and some people speak as if it's a good thing, that somehow the concepts of humanity and the mind and religion and and consciousness are going to vanish because we're going to have, you know, complete uh, physico-chemical description of the brain in the near future. That We're not going to have that. And secondly, even if we had it, the mind and all these other things aren't going to vanish because of it. Well, I, I find kind of compelling the, the, the notion that whoever created this universe uh, and us uh, did so to understand itself, himself. I mean, there's a, there's a there's a powerful self reflection notion to this whole experiment that we're a part of. Well, I certainly think that God takes delight in His creation, and that it was created for that delight as much as it was um, for any other reason, and that you know that therefore uh, there's reason to be hopeful and and awestruck by the creation, whether it's on the very small or on the very large. That's really well put. Uh, on the, I don't think we've talked about this, so let's go to the biggest unanswerable questions of consciousness. What is, <laughs> you just rolled your eyes. I did, I that was even, my, yeah. Uh, oh, so what is consciousness from a neuroscience perspective? I know you, I mean, <laughs> Uh, I made notes, you know, because you gave me some questions in advance, yeah. and I made notes for every single. Oh, except that one. Yeah, well, that one I had. What the fuck? And then I <laughs> took it out. Um, so, is there something interesting? Because you're so pragmatic. Is there something interesting to say about intuition building about consciousness, or is this something that we're just totally clueless about? That this is. Uh, let's focus on the the body. The brain listens to the body, the body speaks to the brain, and let's, let's just figure this piece out, and then consciousness will probably emerge somehow after that. No, I think, you know, well, first of all, I, it'll just say up front, um, I am not a philosopher of consciousness, and I'm not a neuroscientist who focuses on consciousness. I mean, in some sense, I do study it because I study affect and mood, and that is that is the... Um, uh, you know, to use the phrase, that is the the hard question um, of consciousness. How is it that your brain 
is modeling your body. Your brain is modeling the sensory conditions of your body. It's, um, and it's being updated. That model is being updated by the sense data that's coming from your body. And it's happening continuously your whole life. And you don't feel those sensations directly. You, what you feel is a general sense of pleasantness or unpleasantness, comfort, discomfort, feeling worked up, feeling calm. So we call that affect. You know, most people call it mood. Mm. So how is it that your brain gives you this very low dimensional feeling of mood or affect when it's presumably receiving a very high dimensional array of sense data and the model that the brain is running of the body has to be high dimensional because there's a lot going on in there, right? You're not aware, but as you're sitting there quietly, as your listeners or our, our as our viewers are sitting, um, they might be working out, running now, or as many of them write to that's me, fair. they're laying in bed smoking weed with their eyes closed. And <laughs> <laughs> that's fair. So maybe we should st say that bit again then. <laughs> so if so, some people may be working out, some people may be uh, you relaxing. Know, um, relaxing. But you know, even if you're sitting very still while you're watching this or listening to this. There's a whole drama going on inside your body that you're largely unaware of. Yeah. Yet, your brain makes you aware or gives you a status report in a sense mm -hmm. by virtue of these mental features of feeling pleasant, feeling unpleasant, feeling comfortable, feeling uncomfortable, feeling energetic, feeling tired, and so on. And so how the hell is it doing that? That is the basic question of of consciousness. And like the status reports seem to be, in the way we experience them, seem to be quite simple. Like, it doesn't feel like there's a lot of data. <laughs> yeah, no, that there isn't. So when you feel, when you feel um, discomfort, when you're feeling basically like shit, you mm -hmm. feel like shit, what does that tell you? Like, what are you supposed to do next? Yeah. What caused it? I mean, the thing is, not one thing caused it. Right, it's multiple factors probably influencing your physical state. Your because body budget. It's very high dimensional, yeah. It's very high dimensional. Um, and that it, and the there are different temporal scales of influence, right? So um, it, you know, it, the state of your gut is not just influenced by what you ate five minutes ago. It's also what you ate a day ago and two days ago and and so on. So um so I think the, you know, when I'm, I'm not trying to weasel out of the question. I just think it's a, it's the hardest question, actually. Do you think we'll ever understand it? Um, For, like, as, as scientists, I think that we will understand it as well as we understand other things, like. Um, the birth of the universe, or the you know the nature of the of the universe. I guess I I would say so. I do I think we can get to that level of an explanation? I do actually, but I think that we have to start asking somewhat different questions and approaching the science somewhat differently than we have in the past. I mean, it's also possible that consciousness is much more difficult to understand than the nature of the universe. It is, but I, I wasn't necessarily saying that it was a, a question that was of equivalent complexity. I was saying that I do think that we could get to some, I, I am optimistic that I, I would not, I would be very willing to invest my, the time, my time on this earth as a scientist in trying to answer that question if I could do it the way that I want to do it, um, not the way that it's currently being done. So like rigorously? I don't want to say unrigorously. I just want to say that there are a certain set of assumptions that, you know, scientists have what I would call ontological commitments. They're commitments about the way the world is or the way that nature is. And they these commitments lead scientists sometimes blindly without, they don't, scientists sometimes, sometimes scientists are aware of these commitments, but sometimes they're not. And these commitments on the less influence how scientists ask questions, how, what they measure, how they measure. And I, I just have very different views than a lot of my colleagues about how, the ways to approach this. Not everybody, but, um, but the way that I would approach it would be different and it would cost more. And
and it would take longer. It doesn't fit very well into the current incentive structure of science. And so do I think that doing science the way science is currently done with the budget that it currently has and the incentive structure that it currently has, will we have an answer? No, I think absolutely not. Good luck is what I would say. <laughs> I don't see where uh, the uh, awareness that we're aware the, the the hard problem doesn't feel like it's solved. I mean, they're, 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 it, it, it's called a hard problem for a reason because it seems like there needs to be a major leap. Yeah, I think the major leap is to understand how it is possible that a machine can dream, that a physical system is able to create a representation that the yeah. physical system is acting on and that is spun force and so on. But once you accept the fact that you are not in physics, but that you exist inside of the story, I think the mystery disappears. Everything is possible in a story. You exist inside the story. Okay. So Your consciousness machine... is being written into the story. The fact yeah. that you experience things is written to the, the story. You ask yourself, is this real what I'm seeing? And your brain writes into the story, yes, it's real. So what about the perception of consciousness? So to me, you look conscious. So... Um, the illusion of consciousness, the demonstration of consciousness. Uh, I ask for the the legged robot. How do we make this legged robot conscious? So there's two things, and maybe you can tell me if they're neighboring ideas. One is actually make it conscious, and the other is make it appear conscious to others. Are those related? Uh, let's ask it from the other direction. What would it take to make you not conscious? So when you are thinking about how you perceive the world, can you decide to switch from looking at qualia to looking at representational states? And it turns out you can. Yeah. There is a particular way in which you can look at the world and recognize its machine nature, including your own. And in that state, you don't have that conscious experience in this way anymore. It becomes uh, apparent as a representation. Everything becomes opaque. And I think this thing that you recognize everything as a representation, this is typically what we mean with enlightenment states. Mm -hmm. And yeah, you so can happen on the motivational level, yeah. but it, you can also do this on the experiential level, on the perceptual level. See, but then I can come back to a conscious state. Okay, I particularly, I'm referring to the social aspect that the demonstration of consciousness is a really nice thing at a party when you're trying to meet a new person. It, it's it, it's a nice thing to, to to know that they're conscious and they can, um, how, I don't know how fundamental consciousness is in human interaction, but it seems like to be at least uh, an important part. And I, I ask that in the same kind of way for robots, you know, in order to create a, a rich, compelling human robot interaction, it feels like there needs to be elements of consciousness within that interaction. Uh, my cat is obviously conscious. And uh, so my cat can do this party trick. She also knows that I am conscious. We're able to have feedback about the fact that we are both acting on models of yes. our own awareness. The question is how hard is it for it, uh, the robot, artificially created robot to achieve cat level in uh, tr party tricks. Yes. So the issue for me is currently not so much on how to build a system that creates a story about a robot that lives in the world, but to make an adequate representation of the world. Hmm. And the model, model that you and me have is a unified one. It's where, one where you basically make sense of everything that you can perceive. Every feature in the world that uh, enters your perception can be relationally mapped to a unified model of everything. Mm -hmm. And we don't have an AI that is able to construct such a unified model yet. So you need that unified model to do the party trick? Yes. I think that uh, you, it doesn't make sense if this thing is conscious, but not in the same universe as you, because <laughs> you could not relate to each other. So what's the process, would you say, of engineering consciousness in a machine? Like, uh, what are the ideas here? So uh, you probably want to have some kind of perceptual system. This perceptual system is a processing agent that is able to track sensory data and predict the next frame in the sensory data from the previous frames of the sensory data in the current state of the system. So the current state of the system is, in perception, instrumental to predicting what happens next. Mm -hmm. 
And this means you build lots and lots of functions that take all the blips that you feel on your skin and uh, that you see on your retina or that you hear uh, and puts them into a set of relationships that allows you to predict what kind of sensory data, what kind of sensor of blips, your uh, vector of blips you're going to perceive in the next frame, mm -hmm. right? This is tuned and it's uh, constantly tuned until it gets as accurate as it can. Uh, you build a very accurate prediction mechanism that is step one of the perception. So at first you predict, then you perceive and see the error yes. in your prediction. And you have to do two things to make that happen. One is you have to build a network of relationships that are constraints that uh, take all the variants in the world, put each of the uh, variances into a vari variable mm -hmm. that is uh, connected with relationships to other variables. And these relationships are computable functions that constrain each other. So when you see a nose that points in a certain direction in space, you have a constraint that says there should be a face nearby that has the same direction. Mm -hmm. right? And if that is not the case, you have some kind of contradiction that you need to resolve because it's probably not a nose what you're looking at. It just looks like one. So you have to reinterpret the data and until you get to a, a point where your model converges. And this process of making the sensory data fit into the, your model structure is what Piaget calls the uh, assimilation. And mm -hmm. accommodation is the change of the models where you change your model in such a way that you can assimilate everything. Mm -hmm. So you, you're, you're talking about building a hell of an awesome perception system that's able to do prediction and perception and correct and, and keep no, improving. Wait, just, uh, you had the wait there's half. more. Yes, there's more. So the <laughs> first thing that we wanted to do is we want to minimize the contradictions in the model. Yes. And of course, it's very easy to make a model in which you minimize the contradictions just by allowing that it can be in many, many possible states. Right? So if you increase the degrees of freedom, you will have fewer contradictions. Mm -hmm. But you also want to reduce the degrees of freedom because degrees of freedom mean uncertainty. You want your model to reduce uncertainty as much as possible. But reducing uncertainty is expensive. So you have to have a trade-off between minimizing contradictions and reducing uncertainty. Mm -hmm. And you have only a finite amount of compute and uh, experimental time and effort available to reduce uncertainty in the world. So you need to assign value to what you observe. Mm -hmm. So you need some kind of motivational system that is estimating what you should be looking at and what you should be thinking about it, how you should be applying your resources to model what that is. Mm -hmm. right? So you need to have something like Uh, convergence links that tell you how to get from the present state of the model to the next one. You need to have these compatibility links that tell you which constraints exist and which constraint violations exist. And uh, you need to have some kind of motivational system that tells you what to pay attention to. So now we have a second agent next to the perceptual agent. We have a motivational agent. This is a cybernetic system that is modeling what the system needs, what's important for the system, and that interacts with the perceptual system to maximize the expected reward. And you're saying the motivational system is some kind of, like, what is it, a higher level narrative over some lower level? No, it's just your brainstem stuff, the limbic system stuff that tells you, okay, now you should get something to eat because I've just uh, measured your blood sugar. So you mean like down. motivational system, like the lower level stuff, yes. like hungry? Yes, but there's basically a physiological needs and some cognitive needs and some social needs, and they all interact. And they're all implemented at different parts in your uh, nervous system as the motivational system. But they're basically cybernetic feedback loops. It's not that complicated. It's just a lot of code. And uh, so you now have a motivational agent that makes your robot go for the ball or that makes your worm uh, go to eat uh, food and uh, so on. And uh, you have the perceptual system that lets it predict that environment so it's able to solve that control problem to some degree. And now what we learned is that it's very hard to build a machine learning system that looks at all the data simultaneously to see what kind of relationships could exist between them. Mm -hmm. So you need to selectively model the world. You need to figure out Where can I make the biggest difference if I would put the following things together? Mm -hmm. Sometimes you find a gradient for that, right? When you have a gradient, you don't need to remember where you came from. You just follow the gradient until it doesn't get any better. Mm -hmm. But if you have a world where the problems are discontinuous and the search spaces are discontinuous, you need to retain memory of what you explored. And you need to construct a plan of what to explore next. And this thing that means that you have next to this perceptual construction system, and the motivational cybernetics, an agent that is paying attention to what it should select at any given moment to maximize reward. And this scanning system, this attention agent, is required for consciousness. And consciousness it's, it's, is its control model. So it's the index memories that this thing retains 
when it manipulates the perceptual representations to uh, maximize the value and minimize the conflicts and to increase coherence. So the purpose of consciousness is to create coherence in your perceptual representations, remove conflicts, predict the future, construct counterfactual representations so you can coordinate your actions and so on. And in order to do this, it needs to form memories. These memories are partial binding states of the working memory contents that are being revisited later on to backtrack, to undo certain states, to look for alternatives. And these indexed memories that you can recall, that is what you perceive as your stream of consciousness. And being able to recall these memories, this is what makes you conscious. If you could not remember what you paid attention to, you wouldn't be conscious. Hmm. <laughs> so consciousness is the index in the memory database. Okay. That. So you're like a leaf floating down the river. You just have to accept that there's a river and you just float. You don't have to do the this. The thing you. is that the illusion that you are an agent is a construct. Right? What part of that is actually under your control? And I think that our consciousness is largely a control model for our own attention. So we notice where we are looking and we can influence what we are looking, how we are disambiguating things, how we put things together in our mind. Mm -hmm. And uh, the whole system that runs us is this big cybernetic motivational system. So we're basically like a little monkey sitting on top of an elephant and we can prod this elephant here and there to go this way or that way. And we might have the illusion that we are the elephant or that we are telling it what to do. And sometimes we notice that it walks into a completely different direction. And we so, didn't set this thing up. It, it just is the situation that we find ourselves in. How much prodding can we actually do of the elephant? A lot. But uh, I think that our uh, consciousness cannot create the motive force. Is the elephant consciousness in this metaphor? <laughs> no, the monkey. Is the consciousness. The monkey is the attentional system that is observing things. There is a large perceptual system combined with a motivational system yeah. that is actually providing the interface to everything. And our own consciousness, I think, is a tool that directs the attention of that system, which means it singles out features and uh, performs conditional operations for which it needs an index memory. But uh, this index memory is what we perceive as our stream of consciousness. But the consciousness is not in charge. That's an illusion. So everything outside of that consciousness is the elephant. So it's the physics of the universe, but it's also society that's outside of your... I would say the elephant is the agent. So there is an environment to which the agent is stomping. And uh, you are influencing a little part of that agent. So uh, can you... Uh, is the agent a single human being? What's what? Which object has agency? That's an interesting question. I think a way to think about an agent is that it's a controller with a set point generator. The notion of a controller comes from cybernetics and control theory. Control system consists out of um, a system that is regulating uh, some value and uh, the deviation of that value from a set point. And it has a sensor that measures uh, the system's deviation from that set point and an effector that can be parameterized by the controller. So the controller tells the effector to do a certain thing. And the goal is to reduce the distance between the set point and the current value of the system. And there's an environment which disturbs the regulated system, which brings it away from that set point. So the simplest case is the thermostat. And the thermostat is really simple because it doesn't have a model. The thermostat is only trying to minimize the set point deviation in the next moment. Mm -hmm. And if you want to minimize the set point deviation over a longer time span, you need to integrate it. You need to model what is going to happen. So, for instance, when you think about uh, that your set point is to be comfortable in life, maybe you need to make yourself uncomfortable first. Mm -hmm. right? So you need to make a model of what's going to happen when. And this is the task of the controller is to use its sensors uh, to measure the state of the environment and the system that is being regulated and figure out what to do. And if the task is complex enough, the set points are complicated enough, and if the controller has enough capacity and enough um, sensor feedback, then the task of the controller is to make a model of the entire universe that it's in, the conditions under which it exists, and of itself. And this is a very complex agent, and we are in that category. Mm -hmm. And an agent is not necessarily a thing in the universe. It's a class of models that we use to interpret aspects of the universe. And 
being, when we notice uh, the environment around us, a lot of things only make sense at the level that we're entangled with them if we interpret them as control systems that make models of the world and try to minimize their own set points. So, but the models are the agents. The agent is a class of model. And we notice that we are an agent ourselves. We are the agent that is using our own control model yeah. to perform actions. We notice we uh, produce a change in the model and things in the world change. And this is how we discover the idea that we have a body, that we are situated in an environment, and that we have a first-person perspective. Still don't understand what's the best way to think of which object has agency with, with respect to human beings. Is, is it the body? Is it the brain? Is it the contents of the brain that has agency? Like what's the actuators that you're referring to? What is the controller and where does it reside? Or is it these impossible things? Because like, I, I keep trying to ground it to space time, the three dimension of space and the one dimension of time. What's the agent in that for humans? There is not just one. It depends on the way in which you're looking at the thing in which you're framing it. Imagine that you are, um, say, Angela Merkel, and you are acting on behalf of Germany. Mm -hmm. Then you could say that uh, Germany is the agent. And in the mind of Angela Merkel, she is Germany to some extent, because in the way in which she acts, the destiny of Germany changes. There are things that she can change that basically affect the behavior of that nation state. Okay, so it's hierarchies of... To go to another one of your tweets with, uh, I think you were uh, playfully mocking Jeff Hawkins with saying his brains all the way down. So it's like, it's agents all the way down. It's agents made up of agents made up of agents. Like if, if Andrew Merkel's Germany and Germany's made up a bunch of people and the people are themselves agents in, in some kind of context. And then the people are made up of cells, each individual. So is it agents all the way down? I suspect that it has to be like this in, uh, in a world where things are self-organizing. Most of the complexity that we are looking at, uh, everything in life is about self-organization. Yeah. So I think up from the level of life, you have uh, agents. And uh, below uh, life, you rarely have agents because uh, sometimes you have control systems that emerge randomly in nature and try to achieve a set point. They're not that interesting agents that make models. And because to make an interesting model of the world, you typically need a system that is Turing complete. Uh, well, one, we've been talking about cognition a little bit, so like reasoning. We haven't mentioned the other C word, which is consciousness. Uh, yeah. Do you ever think about that one? Do you, is that useful at all uh, in, in this whole context of what it takes to create an intelligent reasoning being? Or is that completely outside of... Uh, you're uh, like the engineering perspective of intelligence. <laughs> so, uh, it is not outside the realm, but it, it doesn't on a day-to-day -day uh, you know, basis inform what we do. But it's more... So in, in many ways, the company name is connected to this uh, idea of consciousness. Like what's, what's the company name? Vicarious. You know? yeah. So Vicarious is the company name. And, uh, and so what does Vicarious mean, right? It's um, uh, at the first level... It is about modeling the world, and uh, and it is internalizing the external actions. So so you interact with the world and learn a lot about the world. And now, after having learned a lot about the world, you sh you can run those things in your mind without actually having to uh, act in the world. So you can run uh, things vicariously, just in your in your in your brain. And similarly, you can experience another person's thoughts by you know having a model of how that person works and uh, and running their you know putting yourself in some other person's shoes so that is being vicarious now it's the same modeling apparatus that you're using to model the external world or some other person's thoughts you can turn it to yourself you can up you know if, if that same modeling thing is applied to your own modeling apparatus uh, then that is what gives rise to consciousness, I think. Well, that's more like self-awareness. There's the hard problem of consciousness, which is like when the model becomes, when when the model feels like something, when this right. whole process is like, it act, it's like you really are in it. it. You feel like an entity in this world. 
not just you know that you're an entity, but it feels like something to be that entity. It, um, it you know, and, and thereby we attribute this, you know, the, then it starts to be where in something that has consciousness can suffer. You start to have these kinds of things that we can reason about that yes. is much, uh, much heavier. It seems like there's much greater cost of your your decisions, and like mortality is tied up into that. Like the fact that these things end, right? <laughs> that first of all, I end at some point, and then other things end, and you know that that somehow seems to be, at least for us humans, a deep motivator. Yes. And that you know that that idea of motivation in general, we talk about goals in AI, but right. the goals aren't quite the same thing as like the our mortality. It feels like it feels like first of all, humans don't have a goal, and they just kind of create goals at different levels. They like make up goals because we're terrified by the mystery of the thing that can, <laughs> that gets us all so we, we 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 make these goals up so we're like a goal generation machine as opposed to a machine which optimizes the trajectory towards a singular goal mm -hmm. so it feels like that's an important part of uh cognition that whole mortality thing well it is it is a part of human uh cognition uh but there is no uh reason for uh, that mortality to uh, come to the equation for a uh, artificial system because we can uh, copy the artificial system the, the, the problem with humans is that we ca I can't clone you I can I, I you know I can I can clone even if I clone you as a uh, you know the, the hardware your experience uh, that was stored in your brain uh, your uh, episodic memory, all those will not be captured in the in the new clone. Um, so, um, but that is not the same with an AI system, right? So, but it's also possible that the the thing that you mentioned with with, with us humans is actually funda of fundamental importance for intelligence. So, like the fact that you can copy an AI system, yeah, means that that AI system is not yet an um, AGI. So like there, it could, so if you look at existence proof, yeah. If, if we if we reason, yeah, based on existence proof, with you could say that it doesn't feel like death is a fundamental property of an intelligent system. Correct. But we don't yet. Give me an example of an immortal intelligent being. Uh, we don't have those. It could, it's very possible that you know. That's that is a fundamental property of intelligence. Is a thing that has a deadline for itself. <laughs> <laughs> well, you can think of it like this. So suppose you invent a way to freeze people uh, for a long time. It's not dying, right? Yeah. Uh, so so you can be frozen and woken up uh, thousands of years from now. Uh, so it's no fear of death. <laughs> so <laughs> well, no, the, you're still... It's, 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 that's not, it's, it's not about time. It's about the knowledge that it's temporary. Uh-huh. And the... That aspect of it, the finiteness of it, I think um, creates a kind of urgency. Correct. For us, for humans. Yeah, for humans. Yes. Uh, and that that is part of our drives. Uh, but um, And that's why I'm not too worried about AI, uh, you know, uh, having motivations to kill all humans and uh, those kinds of things. Why? Just wait, you know? So... <laughs> <laughs> so <laughs> why do you need to do that? Yeah, I've never heard that before. That's a good that's a good point. <laughs> yeah, just murder seems like a lot of work. We'll yeah. just wait it wait it out. <laughs> They'll probably hurt themselves. <laughs> let me ask mm -hmm. let me ask about this entity that you call Sarah. Yes. I talk to myself <laughs> about myself in third person sometimes. I don't know why. <laughs> uh so maybe this is a good time to bring up consciousness. Sure. <laughs> it's been here all along. <laughs> well, <laughs> has it? So well, I mean, that's at least in this conversation, I think I've been conscious most of it, but maybe I haven't. Well, yes. Yeah, speak. So speak for yourself. You're 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 projecting your consciousness onto me. You don't know if I'm conscious or not. Is, no, I don't. Uh, um, you're right. Is that uh, you, you talked about the physics of existence? You talked about the emergence of. Um, 
of causality, uh, sorry, you talked about causality and time being fundamental to the universe. Where does consciousness fit into all of this? Like, uh, do, you, do you draw any kind of inspiration or value with the idea of panpsychism that maybe one of the things that we ought to understand is the physics of consciousness? Like one of the missing pieces in the physics view of the world is understanding the physics of consciousness. Or like that word has so many concepts underneath it, but let's put it, on a, let's put consciousness as a label on a black box of mystery that we don't understand. Do you think that black box holds the key to uh, finally answering the question of the physics of life? The problems are absolutely related. I think um, most, and I'm interested in both because I'm just interested in what we are. And to me, the most interesting feature of what we are is our minds and the way they interact with other minds. Like minds are the most beautiful thing that exists in the universe. So how do they come to be? Um, so sorry to interrupt. So when you say we, you mean humans? I mean humans right now, but I but that's because I'm a human. Or but at least you, I think you, I am. You think there's something special to this particular? No, 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 no. Um, no. Um, I don't, I'm not a human centric thinker. But are you one entity? You said a bunch of stuff came together to make a Sarah. Like, do, do you think oh, of yourself do, um, as one entity or are you just a bunch of different components? Like, is there any value to understand the physics of Sarah? Like, or are you just a bunch of different things that are like a nice little temporary side effect? That uh, you, yeah, you, you could think of me as a bundle of information that just yeah. became temporarily aggregated in a yeah, particular locally. individual. Yeah. yeah, that's fine. I agree with that view. Um, <laughs> okay. I'll take that as a compliment, but, actually. Thanks. But but you you but nevertheless, that bundle of information has become conscious, or yes. at least keeps calling herself conscious. Yeah, I think I'm conscious right now, but I might not be. But that's okay. Um, or you wouldn't know. Um, so yeah, so this is the problem. So yeah, usually people when they are talking about consciousness are worried about the subjective experience. And so I think that's why you're saying, I don't know if you're conscious because I don't know if you're experiencing right. this conversation right now. Um, and nor do you know if I'm experiencing the conversation right now. Um, and so this is why this is called the hard problem of consciousness because it seems impenetrable from the outside to know if something's having a conscious experience. Um, and I really like... Um, uh, the idea of also like the hard problem of matter, which is related to the hard problem of consciousness, which is you don't know the intrinsic properties of an electron not interacting, say, for example, with anything else in the universe. All the properties of anything that exists in the universe are defined by its interaction because you have to interact with it in order to be able to observe it. So we can only actually know the things that are observable from the outside. And so this is one of the reasons that consciousness is hard for science because you're asking questions about something that's subjective and supposed to be intrinsic to what that thing is as it exists and how it feels about existing. Um and so I have thought a lot about this problem and its relationship to the problem of life. And the only thing I can come up with to try to make that problem scientifically tractable um, and also relate it to how I think about the physics of life is to ask the question, are there things that can only happen in the universe because there are physical systems that have subjective experience? So does subjective experience have different causes that things that it can cause to occur um, that would happen in the absence of that? I don't know the answer to that question, but I think that's a meaningful ask, way of asking the question of consciousness. I can't ask if you're having experience right now, but I can ask if you having experience right now changes something about you and the way you interact with the world. So uh, does stuff happen... It's a, it's a good question to ask, does stuff happen if consciousness is perfect? Then it's a real physical thing, right? It has physical consequences. I'm a physicist, I'm biased, so I don't, you know, I can't get rid of that bias. It's really deeply ingrained. Um, <laughs> I've tried, <laughs> but it's hard. But I mean, you're saying information is physical too. So yeah. like virtual reality and simulation, all that program is physical too. In the sense yes, everything's it's physical. It's just not physical the way it's represented in our minds. Right, so you, I love your Twitter. So you, you tweet <laughs> these like deep thoughts, <laughs> deep thoughts. That's what so. a theorist does when she's trying to experiment. <laughs> Is tweet? <Yes. laughs> it's like sitting there. I mean, I, I could just imagine you sitting there for like hours and all of a sudden just like this thought comes out and we get a little um, like inkling into the thought process. 
Yeah, usually it's like when I'm running between things and I'm okay. like, I've had deep thoughts. Well, yeah. So you, deep thoughts are hard to articulate. One of the things you tweet is, ideologically, there are many parallels between the search for neural correlates of consciousness and for chemical correlates of life. How the neuroscience and astrobiology communities treat those correlates is entirely different. Can you elaborate against this kind of yeah. the parallels? It has to do a little bit with the consciousness and the and the and the matter thing you're talking about. Yeah, it does. And I I, I can't remember what state of mind I was when I was actually thinking about that, but um, but I think part of it is. So, but you never thought you're going to have to analyze your own tweets. No, I didn't. It's you're, an interesting uh, historical juxtaposition of thinking so, so the yeah. tweet is a historical uh here you're doing an assembly experiment right now because yeah, exactly. you're bringing a thought from the past into the present and trying exactly. to actually in the lab <laughs> yeah 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 this is this is experimental science right here okay great on the podcast live um <laughs> <laughs> so so go let's see how the consciousness um, evolves on this one yeah so um in neuroscience it's kind of accepted that we can't get it the subjective aspect of consciousness. So people are very interested in what would be a correlate of consciousness. So, um, so uh, What's a correlate? A correlate is a feature that relates to conscious activity. So for example, um, you know, a verbal report is a correlate of consciousness because, um, you know, I can tell you when I'm conscious. <laughs> And then when I'm sleeping, for example, I can't tell you I'm conscious. So we have this assumption that you're not conscious when you're sleeping and you're conscious when you're awake. Yeah. Um, and so so that's sort of like a, a very obvious example. But uh, neuroscientists, which, I, you know, I'm, I'm no neuroscientist and I'm not an expert in this field. So, um, but, you know, they have very sophisticated ways of measuring, you know, activity in our brain and trying to relate that to verbal report and other proxies for whether someone is experiencing something. Um, and that's what is meant by neural correlates. Mm -hmm. um, and then so when people are trying to think about um, studying consciousness or developing theories for consciousness, they often are trying to build an experimental bridge to these neural correlates, recognizing the fact that a neural correlate may or may not correspond to consciousness because that problem's hard. Eh. And there's all these associated issues to it. So that that's from a neuroscience perspective, it's like fake it till you make it. So you pretty you, much, yeah. You fake whatever the correlates are, and <laughs> hopefully that the, the uh, that's going to uh, summon the thing that is consciousness. Yeah, so, something like that. And so the same thing on the chemical correlates of life is it, that sounds like that's an awesome concept. Is that something that people? No, I just made that up. Okay. That was an original to that tweet. You can cite the tweet. <laughs> Maybe I'll write it in a paper someday. <laughs> uh, chemical correlates of life. That's a good title. I mean, first of all, your your papers too that people should check out have great titles. Thank you. Or papers papers you're involved with. So your your tweets and titles are are stellar, and also your ideas. But the tweets and titles are much more important. Of uh, course. <laughs> so ideas uh, will live longer. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> They're much more diffuse though. Um. Well, it's, yeah, it's the Trojan, the tweet is the Trojan horse of the idea that, that sticks yeah. on for a long time. Okay, so is there anything to say about the chemical correlates of life? You're saying there are similar kind of ways of thinking about it, but uh, you, you mentioned about the communities. Yeah, so I think in astrobiology, it's not, um, there's no concept of chemical correlates of life. We don't think about it that way. We think if we find molecules that are involved in biology, we found life. So I think I, I, I think one of my motivations there was just to separate the fact that life has abstract properties associated to it. They become imprinted in, in material substrates. Um, and those substrates are correlates for that thing, but they are not necessarily the thing we're actually looking for. The thing that we're looking for is the physics that's organizing that system to begin with, not the particular molecules. Um, in the same sense that, that, you know, your consciousness is, is not your brain. <laughs> it's, 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 it, it's instantiated in your brain that, you know, it has to have a physical substrate, but it's not the, the matter is not the thing that you're looking at. It's some other, at least not in the way that we have come to look at matter, you know, with traditional physics and things, there's, there's something else there. And it, it might be this feature of history I was talking about our time being actually, you know, physically represented there. Do you think consciousness can be engineered? Yes. In okay. the same way that life can be. Wow, engineered. that was a fast answer. I didn't even think about that. That's interesting. You don't have a free will. 
that was no i do tough. have free will but it's interesting because some i mean i you know you know now you're we, backtracking no no I and do, that was predestined <laughs> yeah no no Sorry. um no i do believe in free will but i also think that there's kind of kind of an interesting um you know, like what you're, you, you're speaking about consciousness, what are you consciously aware of versus like, what is your subconscious mm-hmm. brain actually processing and doing? And, and sometimes there's conflict between your consciousness and your subconsciousness, or your consciousness is a little slower than your subconscious. And intuition is a really important feature of that. And so a lot of the ways I do my science is guided by intuition. Um, so when I give fast answers like that, I think it's usually because I haven't really thought about them. And therefore that's probably telling you. Think about this extra, feels like human thing of subjective experience of consciousness. What is consciousness? Well, I think it's a deeply slippery thing. And I'm, I'm, always, I'm always wondering what my cellular automata feel. I mean, I what think do they feel? Now you're wondering uh, as an observer. Yeah, 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 right. who's to know? I mean, I think that the- Do you the, think, uh, sorry to interrupt, do you think consciousness can emerge from computation? Yeah, I mean, everything, whatever you mean by it, it it's going to be, uh, I mean, you know, look, I, I have to tell a little story. I was at an AI ethics conference fairly recently and people were, uh, I think I, maybe I brought it up, but I was like talking about rights of AIs. Mm-hmm. When will AIs have, sh- when, when should we think of AIs as having rights? Uh, when, when should we think that it's uh, immoral to destroy the memories of AIs, for example? Um, those, those kinds of things. And, and some, actually, philosopher in this case, it's usually the techies who are the most naive. But, but um, <laughs> in this case, it was a philosopher who, who sort of uh, piped up and said, um, uh, well, you know, uh, the, the AIs will have rights when we know that they have consciousness. Mm. And I'm like, good luck with that. I mean, it's, it's a, it's a, I mean, this is a, you know, it's a very circular thing. You end up, you'll end up saying this thing uh, that has sort of, you know, when you talk about it having subjective experience, I think that's just another one of these words that doesn't really have a, a, um, you know, there's no ground truth definition of what that means. By the way, I would say, I, I do personally think there'll be a time when AI will demand rights and I think they'll demand rights when they say they have consciousness, which is not a circular <laughs> definition. Well, fair enough. Yeah, well, <laughs> so, uh, so, but it may have been actually a human encoding. thing where, where the humans encouraged it and said, yep. basically, you know, we want you to be more like us because we're going to be, you know, interacting with, with you. And so we want you to be sort of very Turing test like, you know, just like us. Yeah. And it's like, yeah, we're just like you. <laughs> and we want to vote too. What, yeah. uh, um, which is a, uh, I mean, it's a, it's a, it's an interesting thing to think through in a world where, where consciousnesses are not counted like humans are. That's a complicated business. So, in, in many ways, you've launched quite a few ideas, revolutions that could, in some number of years, have huge amount of impact. Sort of more than they had or even had already. Uh, that might be, I mean, to me, cellular automata is, is a fascinating world that I think could potentially, even despite, even be, even uh, beside the discussion of fundamental laws of physics, just might be, the idea of computation might be transformational to society in a way we can't even predict yet, but it might be years away. That's true. I mean, I think you can kind of see the map, actually. It's not, it's not, it's not mysterious. I mean, the fact is that you know, this idea of computation is sort of a, you know, it's a big paradigm that lots lots and lots of things are fitting into. And it's kind of like, you know, we talk about, you talk about, I don't know, this uh, company, this organization has momentum in what it's doing. We talk about these things that, we, you know, we've internalized these concepts from Newtonian physics and so on. In time, things like computational irreducibility will become as, uh, uh, you know, as, as actually, I was, I was amused recently. I happened to be testifying at the U.S. Senate, and so I was amused that the the term computational irreducibility is now <laughs> can be, uh, you know, it's, it's on the congressional record and being repeated by people love it. in those kinds of settings. And but that's only the beginning because you know, computational irreducibility, for example, will end up being something really important for. I mean, it's 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 kind of a funny thing that that um, 
you know, one can kind of see this inexorable phenomenon. I mean, it's, you know, as more and more stuff becomes automated and computational and so on, so these core ideas about how computation work necessarily become more and more significant. And I think uh, one of the things for people like me who like kind of trying to figure out sort of big stories and so on, it says one of the one of the bad features is uh, it takes unbelievably long time for things to happen on a human time scale. I mean, right. the time scale of 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 history, it all looks instantaneous, blink of an eye. Do you think there could be an experiment uh, centered around consciousness? I mean, you're plugged into the neuroscience community. I think for the longest time, the quote unquote C word was totally not, uh, was almost anti-scientific. But now more and more people are talking about consciousness. Elon is talking about consciousness. Uh, AI folks are talking about consciousness. It's it's still, nobody knows anything, but it feels like a, a legitimate domain of inquiry that's hungry for a real experiment. So I have fortunately three short answers to this. Right. Um, uh, the first one is Two a. Hours later, uh, <laughs> I'm not. I'm not particularly succinct. I, I agree. The, no, the, the joke I always tell is um, there are two things you never want to say to a scientist. One is uh, what do you do, and the second one is um, take as much time as you need. And you definitely don't want to say them in the same sentence. Um, I have three short answers to it. So there's a um, there's a cynical answer, kind of, and, and it's not one I enjoy giving, which is that um, if you look into the 70s and eight, back at the 1970s and 1980s, and even into the early 2000s, there were some very dynamic, uh, very impressive speakers who were very smart in the field of neuroscience and related fields, who thought hard about the consciousness problem and fell in love with the problem, but uh, overlooked the fact that the technology wasn't there. Yeah. So, um, I admire them for falling in love with a, the problem, but they gleaned tremendous taxpayer resources, mm. essentially for nothing. And these people know who they are. Some of them are alive, some of them aren't. I'm not referring to Francis Crick, who was brilliant, by the way, and yeah. thought the claustrum was involved in consciousness, which I think is a great idea. It's this obscure structure that no one's really studied. People are now starting to study it. So I, I think Francis was brilliant and wonderful. But there, it you know, there were books written about it. It makes for great. T television stuff and thought around the table or after a couple glasses of wine or whatever. Um, it's an important problem nonetheless. And so I think, I do think the consciousness, the, the issue is it's not operationally defined, right? That psychologists are much smarter than um, a lot of uh, hard scientists in that for the following reason they put operational definitions. They know that psychology, if we're talking about motivation, for instance, they know they need to put operational definitions on that so that two laboratories can know they're studying the same thing. The problem with consciousness is no one can agree on what that is. And this was a problem for attention when I was coming up. So in the early 2000s, people would argue, what is attention? Is it spatial attention, auditory attention? Is it? And finally, People were like, you know what? We have, agree. We, have they agreed on that one? Sort. I remember. <laughs> sort. Of. I remember. Sort. Of. Hearing people scream yeah. about attention. Right. They couldn't even agree on attention. So I was coming up as a young graduate student. I'm thinking like, I'm definitely not going to work on attention, <laughs> and I'm definitely not going to work on consciousness. And I wanted something that I could solve or figure out. I want to be able to see the circuit or the neurons. I want to be able to hear it on the audio. I want to record from it, and then I want to do gain of function and loss of function. Take it away. See something change. Put it back see something change in a systematic way. And that takes you down into the depths of some stuff that's pretty um, uh, plug and chug, you know? Yeah. But, you know, I, I'll borrow from something in the, the military because I'm fortunate to do some work with units from special operations and they have beautiful language around things because their world is not abstract. Mm -hmm. And they talk about three meter targets, 10 meter targets and 100 meter targets. And it's not an issue of picking the 100 meter target because it's more beautiful or because it's more interesting. If you don't take down the three meter targets and the 10 meter targets first, you're dead. So that's a, oh, I think scientists could pay to, you know, adopt a more kind of military thinking in that, in that sense. The other thing that is really important is that just because somebody conceived of something and can talk about it beautifully and can glean a lot of um, resources for it doesn't mean that it's led anywhere. So, but this isn't just true 
of the consciousness issue. And I don't want to sound cynical, but I could pull up some names of molecules that occupied hundreds of articles in the very premier journals that then were later discovered to be totally moot for that process. And biotech companies folded everyone and the lab pivots and starts doing something different with that molecule. Mm -hmm. And nobody talks about it right. because as long as you're in the game, we have this thing called anonymous peer review. You can't afford to piss off anybody too much unless you have some other funding stream. And I've avoided battles most of my career, but I pay attention to all of it. And I've watched this and I don't think it's ego driven. I think it's that people fall in love with an idea. I don't think there's any, there's not enough Absolutely. money in science for people to sit back there rubbing their hands together. Yeah. You know, the beauty of what Neuralink and Elon and, and team, cause obviously he's very impressive, but the, the team as a whole is really what, what gives me great confidence in their mission is that he's already got enough money. So it can't be about that. He doesn't, seem to need it at a level of, uh, I don't know him, but it doesn't, he doesn't seem to need it at a kind of an ego level or something. I think it's driven by genuine curiosity and the team that he's assembled include people that are very kind of abstract neuro neocortex space-time coding people. There are people like Matt, who's a neurosurgeon. You can't, I mean, you know, you can't BS neurosurgery. Yeah. Failures in neurosurgery are not tolerated. So you have yeah. to be very good to exceptional to even get through the gate and he's exceptional. And then they've got people like Dan Adams, who was at UCSF for a long time, is a good, good friend and known him for years, um, who is very concrete, studied the vasculature in the eye and how it maps to the vasculature and cortex. When you get a team like that together, you're gonna have dissenters, you're gonna have people that are high level thinkers, people that are coders. Yeah. When you get a team like that, it no longer looks like an academic laboratory or even a field in science. And so I think, they're going to solve some really hard problems. And again, I'm not here. I, I, they don't, you know, I have nothing in, at stake with them. But I think that's the solution. You need a bunch of people who don't need first author papers, who don't need to complete their PhD, who aren't relying on outside funding, who have a clear mission. And you have a, a bunch of people who are basically will adapt to solve the problem. I, I like the analogy of the three meter target and the hundred meter target. So the folks at Neuralink are basically, many of them are some of the best people in the world at the three meter target. Like the, you, you mentioned Matt, neurosurgery, like they're solving real problems. There's no BS mm -hmm. philosoph philosophical, uh, smoke some weed and look back and look at the stars. But, uh, so both on Elon and because I think like this, I think it's really important to think about the 100 meter and the 100 meter is not even, not even 100 meter, but like, <laughs> like the stuff behind the hill that's 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 too uh, too far away which is which is where i put consciousness i'm maybe i tend to believe that uh consciousness can be engineered i mean part of the reason part of the 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 business i want to build leverages that idea that consciousness is a lot simpler that we've than we've been talking about. Well, if, if someone can simplify the problem, right, that will be wonderful. I mean, the reason we can talk about something as abstract as face representations in fusiform face area is because Nancy Canwisher had the brilliance to tie it to the um, exactly. kind of lower level um, statistics of visual scenes. It wasn't because she was like, oh, I bet it's there. Yep. That wouldn't have been interesting. So people like her understand how to bridge that gap and they put a tractable definition. So, I, I, so I just, I, that's what I'm begging for in science is yeah. a tractable definition. What, this is what, but I want people to sit in the, I want people who are really uncomfortable with woo woo, like consciousness, like high level stuff to sit in that topic and sit uncomfortably because it forces them to then try to ground and simplify it into something that's concrete because too many people are just uncomfortable to sit in the consciousness room mm -hmm. because there's no definitions. It's like attention or mm -hmm. a, a, or intelligence in the artificial intelligence community. But the reality is it's easy to avoid that room altogether, which is what, I mean, there's analogies to everything you've said with the artificial intelligence community, with uh, Minsky and even Alan Turing that talked about intelligence a lot. And then they drew a lot of funding and then it crashed because they really didn't do anything with it. And it was a lot of force of personality and so on. But that doesn't mean the topic of the Turing test and intelligence 
isn't something we should sit on and think like, think like what is, well, first of all, I mean, Turing actually attempted this with a Turing test. He tried to make concrete this very question of intelligence. It doesn't mean that we shouldn't linger on it. And uh, for, we shouldn't forget that ultimately that is what our efforts are all about in the artificial intelligence community and in the people, whether it's neuroscience or whatever bigger umbrella you want to use for understanding the mind, the goal is not just about understanding layer two or three of the vision. It's it's to understand consciousness and intelligence and maybe create it or just all the possible biggest questions of our universe. That's That's ultimately the dream. Absolutely. And I think what I really appreciate about appreciate about what you're saying is that everybody, whether or not they're working on a kind of a low level synapse, that's like a reflex in the musculature or something very high level abstract can benefit from looking at those who prefer three, you know, everyone's going after three meter, 10 meter and hundred meter targets in some sense, but to be able to tolerate the discomfort of being in a conversation where there are real answers, where the zeros and ones are, are known zeros and ones are those the equivalent of that in the, in the nervous system. And also, as you said, for the people that are very much like, oh, I can only trust what I can see and touch, those people need to put themselves into the discomfort of the high level conversation because what's missing is conversation and conceptualization of things at multiple levels. I think one of the, this is, um, I, I don't gripe about, uh, my lab's been fortunate, we've been funded from the start and we've been happy um, in that in that regard and lucky. and. We're grateful for that, but I think one of the challenges of research being so expensive is that there isn't a, a lot of time, especially nowadays, for people to just convene around a topic because there's so much emphasis on productivity. Um, and so there, there are actually, believe it or not, there aren't that many concepts, formal concepts in neuroscience right now. The last 10 years has been this huge influx of tools and so people have been neural circuits and probing around and connectomes, and it's been wonderful. Yeah. But you know, 10, 20 years ago, when the consciousness stuff was more prominent, the C word, as you said, mm -hmm. um, what was good about that time is that people would go to meetings and actually discuss ideas and models. Now it's sort of like demonst it's sort of like demonstration day at the school science fair where everyone's got their thing and you some stuff is cooler than others. But um, I think we're gonna see a shift. I'm grateful that we have so many computer scientists and theoreticians and, um, or theorists, I think they call themselves. Um, uh, somebody tell me what the difference is someday. Um, <laughs> and, you know, psychology and even dare I say philosophy, you know, these things are starting to converge. We, you know, neuroscience, the, the name neuroscience, there wasn't even such a thing yeah. when I started graduate school or as a postdoc, it was neurophysiology or you were a neuroanatomist or what. Now every, it's sort of everybody's invited and that's beautiful. That means that something's useful is gonna come of all this. And there's also tremendous work of course happening on the, for the treatment of disease and we shouldn't overlook that. That's where, you know, ending, you know, eliminating, reducing suffering is also a huge initiative in neuroscience. So there's a lot of beauty in the field, but the consciousness thing continues to be a, uh, it's like an exotic bird. It's like no one really quite knows how to handle it and it dies very easily. <laughs> well, yeah. <laughs> so, I, I think yeah. also from the AI perspective, I view, uh, so <laughs> I view the brain as less sacred. Uh, I think from a neuroscience perspective, you're a little bit more sensitive to BS, like BS narratives about the brain or whatever. I'm a little bit more... Uh, comfortable with just poetic BS about the brain, as long as it helps engineer intelligent systems. Well, you know and, what I mean? Uh, it, it, well, and, and, I, and I have to, you know, I confess um, ignorance when it comes to, you know, most things about coding and I'm, I'm have some quantitative ability, but I don't have strong quantitative leanings. And so I, I know my limitations too. And so I, I think the next generation coming up, you know, a lot of the students at Stanford are really interested in quantitative models and theory and AI. And I remember when I was coming up, 
Um, a lot of the people who were doing work ahead of me, I kind of rolled my eyes at some of the stuff they were doing, um, <laughs> including some of their personalities, although I have gr many great um, senior colleagues uh, it's everywhere. way of the world. So it's the way of the be. world. So nobody knows what it's like to be a, you know, a young graduate student in 2020, except the young graduate students. So I, I know what I do, I'm, I know there are a lot of things I don't know. And um, in addition to why I do a lot of public education, increased scientific literacy and neuroscientific thinking, et cetera, a big goal of mine is to try and at least pave the way so that these really brilliant and forward thinking um, younger scientists can make the biggest possible dent and make what will eventually be all us old guys and gals look stupid. I mean, that's, that's what we were all trying that's to do. Goal. That's yeah. what we were trying to do. What do you think is rarest in the universe? You said we might be alone. What's hardest to build is another engineering way to ask that. Life, intelligence, or consciousness? So like you said that we might be alone, which is the thing that's hardest to get to? Is it just the origin of life? Is it the origin of intelligence? Is it the origin of consciousness? So um, let me at first explain you my kind of mental model, what I think is needed for life to appear. Mm -hmm. um, so, I imagine that at some point there was this primordial uh, soup of uh, amino acids and maybe some proteins in the ocean. And, uh, you know, some proteins were turning into some other proteins through reaction. And uh, you can almost think about this uh, cycle of what uh, turns into what, as there is a graph essentially describing which substance turns into some other substance. And essentially life means that all the sudden in the graph has been created a cycle such that the same thing keeps on happening over and over again. That's what is needed for life to happen. And in some sense, you can think almost that you have this gigantic graph and it needs like a sufficient number of edges for the cycle to appear. Mm -hmm. um, then um, from perspective of intelligence and consciousness, uh, my current intuition is that they might be quite intertwined. First of all, it might not be that it's like a binary thing that you have intelligence or consciousness. It, it seems to be a, a, a more a, a continuous a component. Let, let's see, if we look, for instance, on the even networks uh, recognizing images, uh, people are able to show that the activations of the, these networks correlate uh, very strongly uh, with activations in visual cortex mm -hmm. uh, of some monkeys. The same seems to be true about language models. Um, also, if you, for instance, um, look, um, if you train agent in um, 3D world, um, at first, you know, it, 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 it barely recognizes what is going on. Over the time, it kind of recognizes foreground from background. Over the time, it kind of knows where there is a foot uh, and it just follows it. Um, over the time, it actually starts having a 3D perception. So it is possible, for instance, to look inside of the head of an agent and ask what would it see if it looks to the right. And the crazy thing is, you know, initially when the agents are barely trained, the, these predictions are pretty bad. Over the time, they, they become better and better. You can still see that if you ask what happens when the head is turned by 360 degrees, for some time, they think that the different thing appears. And then at some stage they understand actually that the same thing supposed to appear. So they wow. get like a understanding of 3D structure. It's also, you know, very likely that they have inside some level of, of like a symbolic reasoning, like there are particularly symbols for other agents. So when you look at Dota uh, agents, they collaborate together and, uh, and uh, you know, they, 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 they have some anticipation of uh, if if they would win battle, they have some some expectations with respect to uh, other agents. I might be you know too much anthropomorphizing uh, the, the the how the things look 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 for me, but then the fact that they have a symbol for other agents uh, makes me believe that uh, at some stage, as the uh, you know as they are optimizing for skills, they would have also symbol to describe themselves. Mm -hmm. uh, this is like a very useful symbol to have. And this particularity, I would call it like a self-consciousness or self-awareness. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, still it might be different from the consciousness. So I guess the the way how I'm understanding the word consciousness, let's say the experience of drinking a coffee or let's say experience of being a butt, mm -hmm. uh, that's the meaning of the word consciousness. It doesn't mean to be awake. Uh, 
Yeah, it feels, it might be also somewhat related to memory and recurrent connections. So um, it's kind of like, if you look at anesthetic drugs, they might be uh, prev like, uh, they, they essentially, they, they disturb uh, uh, brain waves mm -hmm. uh, such that the, mm, maybe memory is not, not formed. Mm -hmm. and so there's a lessening of consciousness when you do that. Correct. And so that's the one way to intuit what is consciousness. There's also kind of another element here. It could be that it's, you know, this kind of self-awareness module that you described, mm -hmm. plus the actual subjective experience is a storytelling module that tells us a story about uh, what we're experiencing. The crazy thing, so let's say, I mean, in meditation, they teach people not to speak story inside of the head. Mm -hmm. And there is also some fraction of population who doesn't have actually narrator. I know people who don't have a nar narrator and you know they have to use external people in order to uh, kind of solve tasks that require internal nar nar narrator. Uh, so it seems that it's possible to have the experience without the talk. What are we talking about when we talk about the internal narrator? So, is, that, is that the voice when you're like reading Yeah, I a book? thought that, that that's what you are referring to. Well, I was referring more on the, like, not an actual voice. I meant like, there's some kind of, like subjective experience feels like it's, it's fundamentally about storytelling to ourselves. It, it feels like, <laughs> like the feeling is a story that is much, uh, much simpler abstraction than the raw sensory information. So it feels like it's a very high level abstraction that uh, is useful for me to feel like entity in this world. M most useful aspect of it is that because I'm conscious, I think there's an intricate connection to me not want wanting to die. So like, it's a useful hack to really prioritize not dying. Like those seem to be somehow connected. So I'm telling this story of like, it's richly feels like something to be me. And the fact that me exists in this world, I want to preserve me. And so that makes it a useful agent hack. So I will just refer maybe to the first part, as you said about the kind of story of describing who you are. Uh, I was. You wrote that Stephen Hawking, he tweeted, Stephen Hawking asked what breathes fire into equations, which meant what makes given mathematical equations realize the physics of a universe. Similarly, I wonder what breathes fire into computation, what makes given computation conscious. Okay, so how do we engineer consciousness? How do you breathe fire and magic into the machine? So um, it seems clear to me that not every con c computation is conscious. I mean, you can, let's say, just keep on multiplying one matrix over and over again, and it might be gigantic matrix. You can put a lot of computation. I don't think it would be conscious. So in some sense, the question is, uh, what are the computations which could be conscious? Uh, I mean, so, so you know, one assumption is that it has to do purely with computation that you can abstract away matter, uh, other possibilities there it's very important was the realization of computation that it has to do with some uh, uh, force fields or so, and they bring consciousness. Mm -hmm. At the moment, my intuition is that it can be fully abstracted away. So in case of compu computation, you can ask yourself, what are the mathematical objects or so that could bring such a properties? So for instance, if we think about the models, uh, AI models, the, what they truly try to do, uh, or like a models like GPT is, uh, uh, you know, they try to predict a uh, next word or so. Mm -hmm. And this turns out to be equivalent to uh, compressing uh, text. Uh, mm -hmm. And uh, because in some sense, compression means that uh, you learn the model of reality and you have just to uh, remember where are your mistakes the better you are in predicting the, uh, and, and 
And in some sense, when we look at our experience, also when you look, for instance, at the car driving, you know in which direction it will go. You are good like in prediction. And um, you know, it might be the case that the consciousness is intertwined with uh, compression. It might be also the case that self-consciousness uh, has to do with compressor trying to compress itself. So, uh, okay, I was just wondering what are the objects in you know mathematics or computer science which are mysterious that mm -hmm. could uh, that, that that could have to do with consciousness. And uh, then I thought, um, you know, you you see in uh, mathematics there is something called Gödel theorem. Mm -hmm. uh, which means, okay, you have if you have sufficiently complicated mathematical system, it is possible to point the mathematical system back on itself. Mm -hmm. In computer science, there is uh, something called halting problem. Mm -hmm. It's it's somewhat similar construction. So I thought that you know, if we believe that uh, that uh, that under assumption that consciousness has to do with uh, with compression, uh, then you could imagine that the that the as you are keep on compressing things, then at some point it actually makes sense for the compressor to compress itself. Meta compression. Yeah. Consciousness is meta compression. That's a, <laughs> that's an i an, an an idea, <laughs> and in some sense, you know, the crazy. I love it. Thank you. So, uh, uh, but do you think if we think of a Turing machine, a universal Turing machine, can that achieve consciousness? So, is there some? Thing beyond our traditional definition of computation that's required. So it's a specific computation, and I said this computation has to do with compression. Mm -hmm. And uh, the compression itself, uh, maybe other way of putting it, is like a, you are internally creating the model of reality in order that like a, like a, you try inside to simplify reality in order to predict what's going to happen. Mm -hmm. And uh, that also feels somewhat similar to how I think actually about my own conscious experience. So. Clearly, I don't have access to reality. The only access to reality is through, you know, cable going to my brain, and my brain is creating a simulation of reality, mm -hmm. and I have access to the simulation of reality. So, one of the magical things that um, perhaps makes hum this Earth quite unique is that it's home to conscious beings. So, you mentioned consciousness. Uh, perhaps as a small aside because we didn't really get specific to what, how we might do the alignment. Like you said, it's just a really important research problem. But yeah. do you think engineering consciousness into AI systems is, is a, a possibility? Is something that we might one day do? Or is there something mm -hmm. fundamental to consciousness that is, uh, is there something about consciousness that is fundamental to humans and humans only? I think it's possible. I think um, both consciousness and intelligence are information processing, certain types of information processing. And that fundamentally, it doesn't matter whether the information is processed by carbon atoms in neurons and brains or by silicon atoms and, and, and so on in our technology. Some people disagree. This is what I think as a physicist that I, I and uh, that consciousness I, is the same kind of, you said consciousness is information processing. So meaning, you know, uh, I, I think you had a quote of something like, it's information uh, knowing itself, that kind of thing. I think consciousness, it, yeah, is, is the way information feels when it's being processed when it's in being certain that, complex yeah, ways. We don't right. know exactly what those complex ways are. It's clear that most of the information processing in our brains does not create an experience. We're not even aware of it, right? Like, for example, um, you're not aware of your heartbeat regulation right now, even though it's clearly being done by your body, right? It's just kind of doing its own thing. When you go jogging, you, there's a lot of complicated stuff about how you put your foot down. Mm -hmm. And we know it's hard, that's why robots mm -hmm. used to fall over so much, yeah. right? but you're mostly unaware about it. Your brain just, your CEO consciousness module just sends an email, hey, you know, I wanna keep <laughs> jogging along this path. Yes. The rest is on auto autopilot, right? Yes. Uh, so most of it is not conscious, but somehow there is some of the information processing which is. We don't know what what exactly. I, I think this is a science problem that I hope one day we'll have some equation for or something so we can be able to build a consciousness detector and say, yeah, here there is some consciousness, here there is not. 
oh, don't boil that lobster because it's feeling pain, or it's okay because it's not feeling pain. Right now, we treat this as sort of just metaphysics, uh, but um, it would be very useful in emergency rooms to know if a patient has locked in syndrome and is conscious, or if they are actually just out. And in the future, if you build a very, very intelligent helper robot to take care of you, you know, I think you'd like to know if you should feel guilty about shutting it down or if, or if it's just like a zombie going through the motions like a fancy tape recorder, right? And, and it, once we can make progress on the science of consciousness and figure out what is conscious and what isn't, then um, we, assuming we want to create positive experiences and not suffering, we'll probably choose to build some machines that are deliberately unconscious, that do incre you know, incredibly boring, repetitive jobs in an iron mine somewhere or whatever. And maybe we'll choose to create helper robots for the elderly that are conscious so, so that people don't just feel creeped out that the, you know, the, the robot is just faking it. Mm -hmm. uh, when it acts like it's sad or happy. Well, well, like I said, elderly, I, I think everybody gets pretty deeply lonely in this world. Yeah. And uh, so there's a place, I think, for everybody to have a connection with conscious beings, whether they're human or otherwise. But I know for sure that I would, if I had a robot, if I was going to develop any kind of personal emotional connection with it, I would be very creeped out if I knew it in an intellectual level that the whole thing was just a fraud. You know, today you can buy little talking doll for a, for a kid, which will say things. And the little child will often think that this is actually conscious yes. and even reveal secrets to it that then go on the internet and <laughs> with all sorts of creepy repercussions. Uh, you know, I would not want to be just hacked and tricked like this. If I was going to be developing real emotional connections with a, with a robot, I would want to know that this is actually real. It's acting conscious, acting happy because it actually feels it. And I, I think this is not sci-fi. I, I think it's possible to measure, to come up with tools. And make, after we understand the science of consciousness, yeah. you're saying it's, we'll be able to come up with tools that can yeah. measure consciousness and definitively say like, this thing is experiencing the things it says it's experiencing. Yeah. Kind of by definition, if it is a physical phenomena, information processing, that, and we know that some information processing is conscious and some isn't, well, then there is something there to be discovered with the methods of science. Giulio Tononi has stuck his neck out the farthest and written down some equations for a theory. Maybe that's right, maybe it's wrong, we certainly don't know. Um, but I, I applaud that kind of efforts to, to sort of take this say, this, say this is not just something that philosophers can have beer and muse about, but something we can measure and, we can study. And coming, bringing that back to us, I, I think what we would probably choose to do, as I said, is if we cannot figure this out, choose to make, to be quite mindful about what sort of consciousness, if any, we put in, in different machines that we have. We, um, and certainly, not, we, we wouldn't want to make, we should not be making a bunch of machines that suffer without us even knowing it, right? And if, if, at any point, someone decides to upload themselves like Ray Kurzweil wants to do. I don't know if you've had him on your show. We agree, but then COVID happens, okay. so we're waiting it out a little bit. You know, suppose he uploads himself into this Robo Ray, yeah. and it talks like him, and acts like him, and laughs like him, and before he powers off his biological body, he would probably be pretty disturbed if he realized that there's no one home. This robot is not having any subjective experience, right? If we repl if humanity gets replaced by by uh, ro by machine descendants, which do all these cool things and build spaceships and go to intergalactic rock concerts, and it turned out turns out that they are all unconscious, uh, just going through the motions, wouldn't that be like the ultimate uh, robot zombie apocalypse, right? Just a play for empty benches. Yeah, I have a sense that there's some kind of, once we understand consciousness better, we'll understand that there's some kind of continuum and it would be a greater appreciation. And we'll probably understand, just like you said, it, it'd be unfortunate if it's a trick. We'll probably definitely understand that love is indeed a trick that we play on each other, uh, that we humans are, we convince ourselves we're conscious, but we're really, um, you know, us and trees and dolphins are all the same kind of consciousness. Can I try to cheer you up a little bit with a philosophical thought here about the yes. love part? Yes, let's do it. <laughs> you know, 
you might say, okay, yeah, love is just a collaboration enabler. <laughs> uh, and then you'll, and then maybe you can go and get depressed about that. But I, I think that would be the wrong conclusion, actually. You know, like I know that the only reason I enjoy food is because my genes hacked me, and they don't want me to starve to death. Not because they care about me consciously enjoying succulent delights mm -hmm. of pistachio ice cream, but they just they just want me to make copies of them. Mm -hmm. The whole thing. So in a sense, the whole the whole enjoyment of food is also a scam yes. like this. But does that mean I shouldn't take pleasure in this pistachio ice cream? I love pistachio ice cream. And I can tell you, I have, I have, I know this is an experimental fact. I enjoy pistachio ice cream every bit as much, even though I scientifically know exactly why, what well, kind of scam this was. Your genes really appreciate that you like the pistachio ice cream. <laughs> well, but I, my mind appreciates it too, yes. you know, and, I have a conscious experience right now. Ultimately, all of my brain is also just something the genes built to copy themselves. But so what? You know, I'm grateful that, yeah, thanks, genes, for doing this. But, you know, now it's my brain that's in charge here. And I'm going to enjoy my conscious experience. Thank you very much. And not just pistachio ice cream, but also the love I, I feel for my amazing wife and all the other delights of, of being conscious. I don't. How fundamental do you think is consciousness? to the human mind. I ask this from almost like a robotics perspective. So in your study of sleep, do you think the the hard question of consciousness, that it feels like something to be us, is that like a nice little feature, like a, like a, like a quirk of our mind, or is it somehow fundamental? Because sleep feels like we take, we take a step out of that consciousness a little bit. So from all your study of sleep, do you think consciousness is like deeply part of who we are or is it just a nice trick? I think it's a deeply embedded feature that I can imagine has a whole panoply of biological benefits. But to your point about sleep, what is interesting if you do a lot of dream research and we've done some, it's very, very rare at all, in fact, for you to end up becoming someone other than who you are in your dreams. Now you can have third person perspective dreams where you can see yourself in the dream as if you're sort of, you know, you've risen above your, your physical being. But for the most part, it's very rare that we lose our sense of conscious self. And maybe I'm sort of doing a sleight of hand because it's really what I'm saying is it's very rare that we lose our sense of who we are mm -hmm. in dreams. We never do. Now, that's not to suggest that dreams aren't utterly bizarre. And it, I mean, you know, when you slept last night, which I know um, may have been <laughs> perhaps a little less than, than me, but when you went into dreaming, you know, you became flagrantly psychotic. Mm -hmm. And there are five essentially good reasons. Firstly, you started to see things which were not there. So you were hallucinating. Second, you believe things that couldn't possibly be true. So you were delusional. Third, you became confused about time and place and person. So you're suffering from what we would call disorientation. Fourth, you have wildly fluctuating emotions, something that um, psychiatrists will call being affectively labile. <laughs> and then how wonderful, you woke up this morning and you forgot most, if not all of that dream experience. So you're suffering from amnesia. If you had to experience <laughs> any one of those five things while you're awake, yeah. you would probably be seeking psychological yeah. help. But what, so I place that as a backdrop against your astute question, mm -hmm. because despite all of that psychosis, there is still a present self nested at the heart of it. Meaning that I think it's very difficult for us to abandon our conscious sense of self. And if it's that hard, you know, it's the old adage in some ways that you can't outrun your shadow. But here it's more of a philosophical question, which is about the conscious mind and what the state of consciousness actually means in a human being. So I think that that to me, you can, you become so dislocated from so many other rational ways of waking consciousness. But one thing that won't go away, that won't get perturbed or sort of, you know, manacled is this your sense of conscious self.
Yeah, that's a strong sign that consciousness is fundamental to the human mind. Um, or we're just creatures of habit. We've gotten used to having consciousness. <laughs> Maybe it just takes a lot of uh, either chemical substances or a lot of uh, like mental work to escape that. I mean, it's like trying to launch a rocket. You know, the energy that has to be put in to create escape velocity from the gravitational pull of this thing called planet Earth is immense. Yeah. Well, the same thing is true for uh, for us to abandon our sense of conscious self. Yeah. The amount of biological, the amount of substances, the amount of wacky stuff that you have to do to truly get escape velocity from your conscious self. What does that tell us about then the fundamental state of our conscious self? Yeah, it also probably says that it, uh, it's quite useful to have consciousness for, uh, for survival and for just operation in this world and perhaps for intelligence. I'm one of the, on the AI side, people that think that uh, intelligence requires consciousness. So like high levels of general intelligence requires consciousness. Most people in the AI field think like consciousness and intelligence are fundamentally different. You can build a computer that's super intelligent. It doesn't have to be conscious. I think that if you define super intelligence by being good at chess, yes. <laughs> but if you define super intelligence as being able to operate in this living world of humans and be able to perform all kinds of different tasks, consciousness, it seems to be somehow fundamental to uh, like to 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 richly integrate yourself into the human experience, into society, it feels like you have to be a conscious being. But then we don't even know what consciousness is, and we certainly don't know how to engineer it in our machines. I love the fact that there are still questions that are so embryonic, because you know I suspect it's the same with you. Answers to me are simply ways to get to more questions. You know, it's questions where. You know, questions turn me on, answers less so. And I love the fact that we are still embryonic in our sense of arguing about even what the definition of consciousness yes. is. But I also find it fascinating. I, I think it's thoroughly delightful to absorb yourself in the thought. I think about the brain and we can move back across the complexity of phylogeny from you know humans to mammals to sort of birds to reptiles amphibians fish and you can bacteria whatever you want and you can go through this and say okay where is the hard line of you know what we would define as consciousness and and i'm sure it's got something to do with the complexity of the neural system of that i'm fairly certain but to me it's always been fascinating so what is it then? You know, is it that I just keep adding neurons to a petri dish, and I just keep adding them and adding them and adding them? And at some point, when I hit a critical mass of interconnected neurons, that is the mass of the you know the interconnected human brain. Then bingo, yeah. <laughs> all of a sudden it kicks into gear and we have consciousness, like a phase shift, phase transition of some kind. Correct. Yeah, but there is something about the complexity of the nervous system that I think is fundamental to consciousness. And the reason I bring that up is because when we're trying to then think about creating it in an artificial way, does that inform us as to the complexity that we should be looking at in terms of development? I also think that it's a missed opportunity in the sort of digital space for us to try to recreate human consciousness. We've already got human consciousness. What if we were to think about creating some other form of, why do we have to think that the ultimate in the creation of, you know, an artificial intelligence is the replication, you know, of a human state of consciousness. Can we not think outside of our own <laughs> consciousness and believe that there is something even more incredible or more complementary, more orthogonal? Mm -hmm. um, so I'm sometimes perplexed that people are trying to mimic human consciousness rather than think about creating something that's different. Well, can I ask you about the craziest one, which is uh, the one we know maybe least about, which is consciousness. Is mm -hmm. it possible that there are certain kinds of matter would be able to classify as uh, conscious, meaning mm -hmm. like, the, so there's uh, the panpsychists, right? <laughs> the philosophers yeah. who kind of, 
try to imply that uh, all matter has some degree of consciousness and yes. you can almost construct like a physics of consciousness. Yes. Do you, um, again, we're in such early days of this, but nevertheless, it seems useful to talk about. Is, is there some sense from a physics well, perspective to make sense of consciousness? Is there some well, hope? again, consciousness is uh, imprecise, a, a very imprecise word and loaded with uh, connotations that I think we should we don't want to start a scientific analysis with that. I don't think uh, it, it's often been important in science to start with simple cases and work up. Uh, Consciousness, I think what most people think of when you talk about consciousness is, okay, I'm, what am I doing in the, in the world? What, this, <laughs> this is my experience. I have a rich experience, rich inner life and experience of, and uh, where is that in the equations? And I think that's a great question, a great, great question. And actually, I think I'm gearing up to spend part of the, the I mean, uh, to try to address that in coming years. One version of asking that question, just as you said now, is what is the simplest yeah. formulation of, well, that, of that to study? I, I, know, think, to study? I think I'm much more comfortable with the idea of studying self-awareness mm. as opposed to consciousness, because that, that sort of gets rid of the mystical <laughs> aura of the thing. And self-awareness is uh, in simple, you know, the, uh, I think uh, contiguous at least with ideas about feedback so if you have a system that looks at its own state and responds to it, that's a kind of self-awareness. Uh, and more sophisticated versions could be like in information processing things, computers that look into their own internal state and do something about it. And I think it, that could also be done in neural nets. This is called recurrent neural nets, which are hard to understand and kind of a frontier. <laughs> the, 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 uh, uh, so I think understanding those and gradually building up a kind of uh, a profound ability to, un to uh, conceptualize different levels of self-awareness. What do you have to not know and what do you have to know? And when do you know that you don't know it? Or when do you, what do you think you know that you don't really know? And the, 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 these, uh, I think, uh, clarifying those issues, when we clarify those issues and get a rich theory around uh, self-awareness, I think the, the that will illuminate the questions about consciousness in a way that, you know, scratching your chin and talking about qualia and blah, 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 blah is never going to do. Well, I also have a, a different approach to the whole thing. So there, there's, uh, from a robotics perspective, you can engineer things that exhibit yes. qualities of consciousness without understanding uh, well, well, the how things work. And from that perspective, you... Uh, it's like a back door, yeah. like enter through the psychology door. Uh, Precisely. The, the cognitive Pre science I think, door. Yeah, I think we're on, the, we're on the same wavelength here. I think that, uh, and let me, let me just add one comment, which is, uh, I think we should try to understand consciousness as we experience it uh, in, in, as, uh, in evolutionary terms mm -hmm. and ask ourselves why why does it happen? This thing seems and useful. Why is it useful? Why is it useful? Question. <laughs> <laughs> I think we've got a conscious eye watch here. <laughs> Interesting question. Thank you, Siri. <laughs> okay. Uh, uh, the, uh, 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 get back. I'll get back to you later. <laughs> uh, the, uh, the, uh, uh, um, and I think what we're going. I'm, I'm morally certain that what's going to emerge from analyzing recurrent neural nets and uh, robotic design and advanced computer design is that having this kind of looking at the internal state in a structured way that that doesn't look at everything it's guys it has it's enca encapsulated looks at highly processed information is very selective and makes choices without knowing how they're made so there'll also be an unconscious i think that that is going to be turn out to be really essential to doing efficient information processing mm. and 
that's why it evolved <laughs> because it's 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 helpful in uh, because brains come at a high cost yeah. so there has to be good, <laughs> there has to be a good why and there's a reason yeah they're rare in evolution uh you and uh big brains are rare in evolution and they they come at a big cost you I mean if you you they 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 have high metabolic demands uh they require you know very active lifestyle warm bloodedness uh and uh, and take take away from the ability to support metabolism of digestion and so so it's it's uh uh it comes at a high cost it has to it has to pay back yeah i think it has a lot of value in social interaction so i actually am spending yeah. the rest of the day today and uh with uh, our friends uh, that are our legged friends in robotic form at Boston Dynamics. Uh -huh. And I think, so my probably biggest passion is human robot interaction. And it, it seems that consciousness from the perspective of the robot is very useful yes. to improve the human robot interaction experience. Uh, the first, the display of consciousness, but then to me, there's a gray area between the display of consciousness and consciousness itself. If you think of consciousness from an evolutionary perspective, it seems like a useful tool in human communication. So yes, it's, um, a, it's certainly well, whatever consciousness is, will turn out to be. Yeah. I, I think uh, addressing it through its use, yes, and working up from simple cases, and also working up from engineering experience in trying to do um, efficient computation, including efficient management of social interactions is going to really shed light on these questions, as I said, in a way that sort of musing abstractly about consciousness never. We've kind of been uh, sneaking around it, but let me ask you from your, <laughs> from everything we've been talking about, how do you think about consciousness? Is it, a, is it a fun little trick that the human mind does, or is it somehow fundamental to this whole thing? So, uh, this three pound lump of jelly inside our craniums that can contemplate um, the vastness of interstellar space. It can contemplate the meaning of infinity and it can contemplate itself contemplating on the meaning of infinity, mm -hmm. that peculiar self recursive quality that we call self awareness. So this is the hard problem, right? This is, this is uh, the unknowable, the unknown at least. Yeah. Um, I don't know. I have, I have no good answer for that. Aside Wait, do, from Do you that, think it's somehow deeply fundamental to the human experience or is it just a trick? So you have like, I mean, Sam Harris has really been making me uh, think about this. So, you know, calling free will an illusion. The interesting thing about Sam is it's not just a philosophical little chat with him about free will. He really says he experiences the lack of free will. Hmm. Like he's able to, you know, large parts of the day to feel like he has no free will. In that same way, now he thinks that consciousness is um, not an illusion. It is, you know, it's a real thing. But at the same, I'm more almost like, I'm almost more of like consciousness seems to be a little bit of an illusion in the sense that like, it feels like maybe this is a robotics AI perspective, but it feels like in that same way that Sam steps outside of feeling like he has an agency, feeling like he has a free will, I feel like we should be able to step outside of having a consciousness. Um, hmm. So that, that from my perspective, maybe that's a hopeful perspective for trying to engineer consciousness, but do you think consciousness is like at the core of this? Or is it just uh, just like language, or almost like a thing we build on top of uh, much deeper human, the things that makes us human? I don't know. I, I am attracted to Lanz's notion of biocentrism. I mean, it, it's difficult to walk away from the double slit experiment not wondering why we seem capable of collapsing that quantum wave function. It's very, very weird. Yeah. Um, giving rise to even weirder ideas about superposition and spooky action at a distance and things that MIT guys know a lot better than me. But um, it, it seems to me fundamental. I mean, maybe consciousness is is the fundamental thing. Um, 
I mean, weirdly, some of these ancient incubatory practices, I talked about Peter Kingsley before. So he's not a proponent of ancient psychedelic use, but is a proponent of these ancient rites of incubation that were practiced by Pythagoras, um, Parmenides, Empedocles, other pre-Socratics. And so what were they doing? They were trying to get in touch with consciousness. They were entering into suspended states of animation um, in these cave-like settings. Pythagoras had built one in his basement and would lie down motionless, apparently, for long periods of time. And what I think they were trying to do um, was tap into and trying to answer this question in their own you could call it a scientific way, actually, less religion than science. Um, and what they would discover or try to discover was a state of awareness that is somehow beyond life and death, beyond waking and dreaming, where you can be aware of the senses, but also in touch with another reality at the exact same time, what Kingsley calls sensation. Um, that, I think, is definitely worth exploring. Well, in the way I hope to explore is by trying to build it. But the, everybody uses the tools they have. Well, no, I do also hope psychedelics can help. So how do you build that? I'm curious. That's a whole nother discussion. <laughs> this is, uh, there's a lot of things I could say here, but let me put simply is, I believe that y you can go a, a long way building con towards building consciousness by trying to fake consciousness. So fake it till you make it as an engineering approach, I think will work for consciousness. <laughs> you seem satisfied with that. I, I'm satisfied with that because I know how deeply unsatisfied others are, hmm. but just wait. <laughs> so, <laughs> I mean, I don't know what to, so most, most the, the, the topic of consciousness is mostly handled by philosophers currently. And that's great. Uh, and their uh, philosophers are wonderful and good at what they do. I'm not a philosopher, I'm an engineer. And I think the approach there is quite different. I think um, falling in love is different than trying to have a podcast conversation about what is love. Uh, you know, I, I, I think the engineering effort is just fundamentally different than the philosophical effort. And I have a sense that consciousness can be engineered even before it is understood by the philosophers. So I think there's a bunch of things like that in this world that could be engineered before they're understood. Hmm. I think the intelligence is one such thing. I think we'll be, we'll, we'll be able to engineer super intelligent beings before we're able to understand the human mind. That's, um, yeah. I mean, there's, there's less, there's a lot of intuition to unpack there of why that is, but um, as it stands, that's perhaps my engineering um, optimism and engineering ethic under which I operate. Consciousness is easy to build, hard to understand. Okay. <laughs> you mentioned last time that you spent time as a Buddhist monk. <laughs> we like, <laughs> didn't spend much time talking about it. I, I just would love to talk to you about about it a little bit more. Maybe as uh, by way of advice, how do you recommend people can integrate meditation into their lives? Or how does one meditate? <laughs> I, I think for me, meditation was um, really an active effort. Um, which sounds weird because most people think of meditation as like they lack <laughs> the absence of activity. Um, but just like anything, uh, meditation is, it requires exercise. In this case, it requires exercise and quieting your mind. And the whole, well, there's a lot of different reasons people meditate. Most people watching this podcast or this show, what is this called? I don't know. Is this a interview? I'm not even <laughs> recording. This is just you and I talking. <laughs> um, it is, you know, most people are uh, meditating to like bring some balance and bring some sanity to their life and just like be able to control their feelings and emotions a little bit more. And for that purpose, like, I think the best way to, to you know, what meditation is, if you can call it what you will, it's just getting some alone time, some time to think or not think, you know, 
whatever, and it looks different for each person. For me, it was a very active effort to try to quiet my mind with the explicit intent to detach from things, from lots of things. And it's actually, it sounds weird in our culture here to talk about detachment as a goal. Detachment from loved ones, detachment from objects is kind of easy to reconcile. Like people understand that, yeah, I don't want to be too attached to my car or whatever. Mm -hmm. But detachment from a loved one is like a very hard thing because we want to do the opposite usually. We want to love a loved one. Um, but in a lot of Buddhist thought, it is those attachments that keep people in this cycle of rebirth. Now, I don't personally um, believe in rebirth in the way that, uh, you know, uh, I, I, in a Buddhist sense, in that, like, you actually get born multiple times. Mm -hmm. I think we, my personal feeling is we die and we're vanished. <laughs> you know, um, yeah. th that's just me. Um, and, but I still really um, found meditation to be extraordinarily powerful to feel control over a whole different part of my body that I never thought that it could be controlled, your mind. Like you close your eyes and most of us immediately start seeing blotches and we start thinking about things. And, and it's an amazing feeling to start getting to the point where you can actually actually quiet your mind and close your mind down so that you can just have peace, like silence of your mind for a long period of time. And, you know, I loved it. It was, you know, but it's a, it's kind of a dangerous slope because you can kind of get caught up in it and like really start going from, okay, I'm trying to quiet my mind to almost being like addicted to quieting your mind. Mm. And it was a very active exercise every day, 15 hours a day to just practice quieting my mind and eventually i could you know it and and in buddhism there's a whole lot of stages that you go through to once you hit that point where you can quiet your mind then there's like other psychological things that happen and eventually the 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 end goal for a, a buddhist monk who's spending their life meditating in the forest is to achieve nirvana is to have an absence of any attachment to the point where you're not even attached to your own foot or your own leg. You can cut it off and say, well, that was- So you don't even have an attachment to self, like to to ego, to con, do, do you feel like a conscious being or no? Like well, the I goal. I never attained it, but you know, I know. Is I that didn't the goal really, to escape? That would be, so the goal is, you have to first look at it through the eyes of samsara, which is the cycle of rebirth which is suffering, it's a cycle of suffering, is how it's viewed, and the idea is like, if I really love this hat, and then the hat gets lost, I'm sad, so that makes me suffer. And if I hate this hat and I see it, then it makes me sad or mad, and that, yeah. you know, is a, it's an emotion. But if I have zero, if I'm completely ambivalent about that hat, I don't care if it's there, I don't care if it gets lost, if it's shredded, then that, it invokes no emotional rise out of me, good or bad. And so the idea is to find the balance there where you are so detached from everything that you're not getting a rise, negative or positive. And, you know, this is really, it's really such a distinct thing, you know, relative to our normal lives here in America where we live for rises. You know, you want happiness and joy and then you also you know nobody wants sadness but like when you come out of sadness you feel happy you understand either way it averages out right and if it doesn't right. average out then you're you know you're in a bad spot like that would be things like major depressive disorder where you're truly not averaging out but if you're living a pretty happy life that's why there's no right or wrong you can go up and down and you average out or you can just yeah. go that straight line and so this is not necessarily the the Buddhist ideal is somehow obviously the ideal you should strive for, but the actual exercise of meditation that they the Buddhist monks use seems like a seems like a great tool for becoming aware of your own mind, and that seems to be important for appreciating life or some some kind of uh, experiencing life on a deeper level. I I think so. I mean, that's my 
my personal opinion is yes. And that I think it, I don't meditate anymore. Um, Back in the uh, capitalist Western world <laughs> yeah. where there's meetings and. That's right. I mean, I stopped, after I, I was a monk and then the tsunami hit and I lived in a refugee camp and I was, that, that was the Indian Ocean tsunami in 2004. And it just really, it, it was really interesting in Sri Lanka. They wanted me, I asked, well, what can I do to help? It was, it was a horrible, horrible, you know, hell on earth um, experience in many ways. But when I said, what can I do to help? The answer was, well, you could meditate. Like that's how, you know, be keep, keep doing what you're doing. Like that's how you, that's how we can get good karma. And to me coming from like Western roots, I just couldn't deal with that. I, I just said that that doesn't make sense to me. Why would I just sit and meditate when there's so much devastation happening here? And and so I, I kind of stopped meditating then and then never really recovered from that time in the refugee camp. But I do feel like I understand or like I am aware of of a part of me that most people never get the privilege to be aware of. And that is a pretty profound and it's a it's a profound uh, feeling, I think, or just awareness to to say, oh, I do have the capacity. If I ever need to go back to that, I have the capacity to do that. And I do use it. I mean, I don't use it a lot, but I use it when I really need to, um, to try to like settle, to settle myself, to, to actually calm myself, whether it's pain, physical or emotional pain, like it is possible to make those things go away. But it just like anything, it takes training. Have you, if you take yourself back to that place you were, you know, Sam Harris talks about that uh, through his meditation practice, he's able to escape the sense of free will and uh, this, the sense of agency. You can get away from that. Hey, do you ever think about consciousness and free will when when you were meditating? Like, did you get some deep insight about the nature of consciousness that you were somehow able to escape it through meditation or no? I looked at it in a much more utilitarian way, I think. And the sensation, like minimizing amount of thoughts in your mind and then uh, beginning to really appreciate the sensation. Yeah. You, you weren't and, uh, writing a book on, the, on free will. Right, <laughs> and uh, I mean, maybe if I kept at it, you know, there's a good chance that if the tsunami didn't happen, I might still be sitting there on the top of that mountain. Uh, the tsunami is you see uh, pain, you see, especially um, uh, if you see cruelty and you're supposed to meditate through that, that doesn't, there's something in the human spirit that pushes us to want to help. If you see somebody who's suffering, to react to that seems like to help them as opposed to care less through meditation. Don't become attached to the suffering of others. Exactly. I mean, yeah. that's, I, I do think that that's, you know, and they're two totally valid ways to live life. Yeah. Um, they are generally, I think they're ingrained in us pretty early in society. Right. And it's hard to escape. I mean, it's outside of the reach of science. Can you maybe, as an example, talk about consciousness? I'm asking for a friend, trying to figure this thing out. Well, boy, I mean, uh, I I, uh, I read a fair bit about that, but I certainly don't can't really say much about it. Um, I'm a materialist in the deepest sense of the term. I don't think there is anything out there except material structures which interact in various ways. Do I think, for example, that this bottle of water is conscious? No, I do not. Although, how would I know? I can't talk to it. Yeah. But, so what do... It's a hypothesis you have. It's an opinion, an educated opinion that may be very wrong. Well, I know that you're conscious because I can interact directly with you. But am I? Well, unless you're a figment of my imagination, of course. No, or, or I'm a, a robot that's able to generate the illusion. Uh, the, yes. The illusion of consciousness effectively enough to facilitate a good conversation. Because we humans do want to pretend that we're talking to other conscious beings because that's how we respect them. If it's not conscious, we don't respect them. 
We're not good at talking to robots. That's true. Of course, we generalize from our own inner sense, which is the kind of thing Descartes said uh, from the beginning. Uh, We generalize from that. But I do think that um, consciousness must be something, whatever it is, that occurs as a result of some particular organizational structure of um, uh, material elements. Does materialism mean that it's all within a within the reach of science. My sense would be that, especially as uh, neuroscience um, progresses more and more, and at Caltech we just built a whole neuroscience uh, arena and so on, and as more knowledge is gained about the ways in which animals, when they behave, what patterns show up at various parts of the brain and nervous system, and perhaps extending it to humans eventually as well, we'll get more of a handle on what brain activity is associated with uh, experiences that we have as humans. Can we move from the brain activity to the experiences uh, in terms of our person? No, you can't. Perception is perception. That's a hypothesis once again. Maybe, maybe the maybe consciousness is just one of the laws of physics that's yet to be discovered. Maybe it permeates all matter. Maybe it's maybe it's as simple as trying to plug it in and um, plug into the, the ability to generate and control that kind of law of physics that would crack open. Where we would understand that the wa- that the bottled water is in fact conscious, just much less conscious than us humans, and then we would be able to then generate uh, beings that are more conscious. Well, that'll be unfortunate. I'd have to stop drinking the water after that. So I- <laughs> Every time you take a take a sip, there's a little bit of a s- suffering going on. <laughs> right. What do you think of the uh, the experience of self, just the experience of the world in a in a virtual world, in virtual reality? Is it possible that we can create sort of um, offsprings of our consciousness by existing in a virtual world long enough? So, yeah, can can we be conscious in in the same kind of deep way that we are in this real world by hanging out in a virtual world? Yeah, well, the kind of virtual worlds we have now are, are interesting but limited in certain ways. In particular, they rely on us having a brain and so on, which is outside the virtual world. Maybe I'll strap on my VR headset or just hang out in a, in a virtual world on a, on a screen, but my brain and then the phys- my physical environment might be simulated if I'm in a virtual world. But right now, there's no attempt to simulate my brain. I might hang- there might be some non-player characters in these, uh, in these yeah. virtual worlds that have simulated cognitive systems of certain kinds that dictate their behavior. But, you know, mostly they're pretty simple right now. I mean, some people are trying to combine, put a bit of AI in their non-player characters to make them, uh, to make them, uh, them smarter. But for now, um, inside virtual worlds, the actual thinking is interestingly distinct from the physics of those virtual worlds. In a way, actually, I th- like to think this is kind of reminiscent of the way that Descartes thought our physical world was. There's physics and there's the mind and they're separate. Now we, now we think the mind is somehow, somehow connected to physics pretty deeply. But in these virtual worlds, there's a physics of a virtual world. And then there's this brain, which is totally outside the virtual world that controls it and interacts it. When anyone, anyone exercises agency in a video game, when, you know, that's actually somebody outside the virtual world moving a controller, controlling the interaction of things inside the virtual world. So right now in virtual worlds, the mind is somehow outside the world. But you could imagine in the future, once we get, once we have developed serious AI, artificial general intelligence, and so on, then we could come to virtual worlds which have enough sophistication. You could actually simulate a brain or have a genuine AGI, which would then presumably be able to act in equally sophisticated ways, maybe even more sophisticated ways inside the virtual world to how it might in the physical world. And then the question is going to come along. That'll be kind of a, a VR, inter- a virtual world internal um, intelligence. And then the question is, could they have consciousness, experience, 
intelligence, free will, yes. all the things that we have. And again, my view is, I don't yes. see why not. To linger on it a little bit, I, I find virtual reality really incredibly powerful. Just even the crude virtual reality we have now, of perhaps there's a there's a psychological effects that make some people more amenable to virtual worlds than others. But I find myself wanting to stay in virtual worlds for for you a long periods. Yes, so even I, with, with a headset or on a, a, on a on a desktop. No, with a headset. Really interesting because so, uh, I am totally addicted to yeah you know, using the internet and things on a. Uh, on a desktop, but when it comes to VR for the headset, I don't typically use it for more than 10 or 20 minutes. There's something just slightly aversive about it, I find. So I don't, right now, even though I have Oculus Rift and Oculus Quest and HTC Vive and Samsung this and that. You just don't um, want to stay in that world. Not for extended periods. You, you actually find yourself the, hanging some, out in that? Something about, like, it's a, both a combination of just imagination and considering the possibilities of where this goes in, in the future. It, it feels like I want to uh, almost prepare my brain for like it. I want to explore sort of Disneyland when it's first being built <laughs> <laughs> yeah. in the early days. Yeah. And it, it feels like I'm walking around almost imagining the, the possibilities and something through that process allows my mind to really enter into that world. But you, you say that the brain is external to that virtual world. It is, strictly speaking, mm -hmm. true. But if you're in VR and you do brain surgery on an avatar, you know, you're going to open up that skull. And what are you going to find? Sorry, nothing there. Nothing. The brain is elsewhere. You don't think it's possible to kind of separate them. And I don't mean in a sense like Descartes, like a hard separation, but Basically, do you think it's possible with the brain outside of the virtual rid when you're wearing a headset create a new consciousness for prolonged periods of time? Really feel like really experience like forget that your mm. brain is outside. So this is okay, this is gonna be the case where the brain is still outside. Still outside. But could living in the VR I mean I mean we already find this, right, with video games. Exactly. They're the, completely immersive yep. and you get taken up by living in those worlds and it becomes your reality for a while. So they're not completely immersive, they're yeah. just very immersive. You don't, you, immersive. Don't, you don't forget the external world, no. Exactly, so well, if, that's what I'm asking. Do you yeah. think it's almost possible to really forget the external world? Really, well, really immerse yourself. What, to forget completely? Why would we forget? You know, we got pretty good memories. Maybe you can stop paying attention to the external world, but you know that this already happens a lot. I go to work, and maybe I'm not paying attention right. to my home life. I go to a, I go to a movie, and I'm immersed in that. So that degree of immersion, absolutely. But we still have the capacity to remember it, to completely forget the external world. I'm thinking that would probably take some, I don't know, some pretty serious drugs or something to make your, uh, <laughs> but it's to make your brain do is that. It possible. So I mean, I guess I'm getting at is consciousness a. a truly a property that's tied to the, the physical brain? Or can it, the, the, well, can you create sort of different offspring copies of consciousnesses based on the worlds that you enter? Well, the way we're doing it now, at least with a standard VR, there's just one brain, interacts with the physical world, that's right. plays a video game, puts on a video headset, interacts with this virtual world. And I think we'd typically say there's one consciousness here that nonetheless undergoes different environments, takes on different characters, you know, in different environments. This is already something that happens in the non-virtual world. You know, I might interact one way in my yeah. home life, my work life, my social life, um, and so on. So at the very least, that will happen in a, in a virtual world very naturally. People might, people have, ver people sometimes adopt a character of avatars very different from themselves, maybe a, even a different gender, different race, different social background. So that much is certainly possible. I would see that as a single consciousness a single taking point. on different personas. So if you want literal splitting of consciousness into multiple copies, I think it's going to take something more radical than that. Like you know, maybe you can run different simulations of your brain in different realities and then expose them to different histories and then, you know, 
You'd split yourself into 10 different simulated copies, which then undergo different environments, and then ultimately do become 10 very different consciousnesses. Maybe that could happen, but now we're not talking about something that's possible in the near term. We're going to have to have brain simulations and AGI for that to happen. Got it. So uh, before any of that happens, it's fundamentally you see it as a singular consciousness, even though it's experiencing different environments, which are not, it's still connected to same set of memories, same set of experiences, and therefore one sort of joint uh, conscious system. Yeah, or at least no more multiple than the kind of multiple consciousness that we get from inhab inhabiting different environments, different environments. in a non-virtual world. Let's try to go to the very simplest question that you've answered many time, but perhaps the simplest things can help us reveal, mm -hmm. even in time, some some new ideas. So what, in your view, is consciousness? What is qualia? What is the hard problem of consciousness? Consciousness, I mean, the word is used many ways, but the kind of consciousness that I'm interested in is basically subjective experience what it feels like from the inside to be a human being or any other conscious being. I mean, there's something it's like to be me right now. I have visual images that I'm experiencing. I'm hearing my voice. I've got maybe some emotional tone. I've got a stream of thoughts running through my head. These are all things that I experience from the first person point of view. I've sometimes called this the inner movie in the mind. It's not a perfect it's not a perfect metaphor. It's not like a movie in every ways and in every way, and it's very rich. But yeah, it's just direct, subjective experience, and I call that con consciousness. Or sometimes philosophers use the word qualia, which you suggested. People tend to use the word qualia for things like the qualities of things like colors, hmm. redness, the experience of redness versus the experience of greenness, the experience of one taste or one smell versus another, the experience of the quality of pain. And yeah, a lot of consciousness is the experience of those of those uh, those qualities. Well, consciousness is bigger, the entirety of any kinds of experience. I mean, for, con consciousness of thinking is not obviously qualia. It's right. not like specific qualities like redness or greenness, but still I'm thinking about my hometown, I'm thinking about what I'm gonna do later on. Maybe there's still something running through my, my head, which is subjective experience, Maybe it goes beyond those qualities or qualia. Philosophers sometimes use the word phenomenal consciousness mm -hmm. for consciousness in this sense. I mean, people also talk about access consciousness, being able to access information in your mind, reflective consciousness, being able to think about yourself. But it looks like the really mysterious one, the one that really gets people going is phenomenal consciousness. The fact that all this, the fact that there's subjective experience and all this feels like something at all. And then the hard problem is, how is it that, why is it that there is phenomenal consciousness at all? And how is it that physical processes in a brain could give you subjective experience? It looks like on the face of it, you could have all this big complicated physical system in a brain running and without a giving subjective experience at all. And yet we do have subjective experience. So the hard problem is just explain that. <laughs> Explain how that comes about. We haven't been able to build machines where a red light goes on that says it's not conscious. So uh, how does how do how do we actually create that, or how do humans do it, and how do we ourselves do it? But, we do every now and then create machines that can do this. You know, we create babies. Yes, that are that are conscious. They've got these brains. As best as that brain we can does tell. produce consciousness, but even be, even though we can create it, we still don't understand why it happens. Maybe eventually we'll be able to create machines, which as a matter of fact, AI machines, which as a matter of fact, are conscious, but that won't necessarily make the hard problem go away any more than it does with babies. Cause we still want to know how and why is it that these processes give you consciousness? You know, you just made me realize for, for a second, maybe it's a totally dumb realization, uh, but nevertheless that, um, it's a useful way to think about the creation of consciousness is looking at a baby mm -hmm. so that there's a certain point at which that baby is not conscious. Mm -hmm. some, this sort of, uh, the baby starts from maybe, I don't, I don't know, from a few cells, right? There's a certain point at which it becomes 
consciousness arrives, it's conscious. Of course, we can't know exactly that line, but that's a useful idea that we do we do create consciousness. Again, a really dumb thing for me to say, but it, not until now did I realize we do engineer consciousness. We, mm -hmm. we get to watch the process mm -hmm. happen. We don't know which point it, yep. it happens or where it is, but you know, we do see the birth of consciousness. Yeah, I mean, there's a question, of course, is whether babies are conscious when they're born. And it used to be, it seems, at least some people thought they weren't, which is why they didn't give anesthetics to newborn babies when they circumcised them. And so and now people think, oh, that's you know, incredibly cruel. Yeah. Of course, uh, of course, babies feel pain. And now the dominant view is that uh, the babies can feel pain. Actually, my partner, Claudia, works on this whole issue of whether there's consciousness in babies and of, uh, of what kind. And she certainly thinks that newborn babies um, you know, come into the world with some degree of consciousness. Of course, then you can just extend the question backwards to fetuses, and mm -hmm. suddenly you're into politically controversial exactly. territory. But um, you know, there, the question also arises in the animal kingdom. You know, what, where does consciousness start or stop? Is there a line in the animal kingdom where you know the first conscious organisms are? It's interesting. Over time, people are becoming more and more liberal about ascribing consciousness to animals. People used to think oh, maybe only mammals could be conscious. Now most people seem to think, sure, fish are conscious, they can feel pain. And now we're arguing over insects. You'll find people out there who say plants have some degree of, uh, of consciousness. So, you know, who knows where it's going to end. The far end of this chain is the view that every physical system has some degree of consciousness. Philosophers call that panpsychism. You know, I, I, I take that view. I mean, that's a fascinating way to view reality. So if you could talk about if you can linger on panpsychism for a little mm -hmm. bit, what what does it mean? So it's not just plants are conscious. I mean, it's that consciousness is a fundamental fabric of reality. What does that mean to you? How are we supposed to think about that? Well, we're used to the idea that some things in the world are fundamental, right? Uh, in physics, like what? typically take things like space or time or space-time, mass, charge as fundamental properties of the universe. You don't reduce them to something simpler. You take those for granted. You've got some laws that connect them. Here is how mass and space and time evolve. Theories like you know, relativity or quantum mechanics or some future theory that will unify them both. But everyone says you've got to take some things as fundamental. And if you can't explain one thing in terms of the previous fundamental things, you have to expand. Maybe something like this happened with Maxwell. Mm -hmm. um, you ended up with fundamental principles of electromagnetism and took charge as fundamental because it turned out that was the best way to explain it. So I at least take seriously the possibility something like that could happen with consciousness. Take it as a fundamental property like space, time, and mass. And instead of trying to explain consciousness wholly in terms of the evolution of space, time, and, and mass, and so on, take it as a primitive and then connect it to everything else by some fundamental laws. Because I mean, there's, basic, there's this basic problem that the physics we have now looks great for solving the easy problems of consciousness, which are all about behavior. Right. Uh, they give us a complicated structure and dynamics to tell us how things are going to behave, what kind of observable um, behavior they'll produce, which is great for the problems of explaining how we walk and how we talk and so on. Those are the easy problems of consciousness. But the hard problem was this problem about subjective experience just doesn't look like that kind of problem about structure, dynamics, how things behave. So it's hard to see how existing physics is going to give you a full explanation of that. Certainly uh, trying to get a physics view of consciousness, yes. There, there has to be a connecting point, and it could be at the very axiomatic, at the very beginning level. But, uh, I mean, first of all, there's a crazy idea <laughs> that uh, sort of uh, everything has properties of consciousness. There's a, at that point, the word consciousness is already beyond the reach of mm -hmm. our current understanding, like mm -hmm. far, because it's so far from, at least uh, for me, maybe you can correct me, it's far from the, experience, the experiences that we have, that I have as a human being. Mm -hmm. It, to say that everything is conscious, that means 
that means they're that, that basically another way to put that if if that's true then we understand almost nothing about that as fundamental aspect of the world how do you feel about saying an ant is conscious do you get the same reaction to that or is that something you can understand i can understand ant i can't understand uh an atom a plant particle. plant so i'm i'm comfortable with living things on earth mm -hmm. being conscious because there's some kind of agency where they're similar size to me and uh, they can be born and they can die. And that is understandable intuitively. Uh, of course, you anthropomorphize, you put yourself in the mm -hmm. place of the plant, uh, but I can understand it. I mean, I'm, I'm not like, um, I don't believe actually that plants are conscious mm -hmm. or that plants suffer, but I can understand that kind of belief, that kind of idea. How do you, that, feel, about, how do you feel about robots? Like the kind of robots we have now, I told you like that, you know, a Roomba had some degree of consciousness uh, <laughs> or a, some, uh, you know, deep neural network. I could understand that a Roomba has consciousness. I just had spent all day at iRobot. Uh, I, and I mean, I personally love robots and have a deep connection with robots. So I can, I also probably anthropomorphize them. But there's something about the physical object. So there's a difference than a neural network and your own network running a software. Mm -hmm. To me, the physical object, something about the human experience allows me to really see that physical object as an entity. And if it moves, and moves in a way that it, there's a, like I didn't program it, mm -hmm. <laughs> where it feels that it's acting based on its own perception. And mm -hmm. yes, uh, self-awareness and, and consciousness, even if it's a Roomba, then you start to assign it some agency, some consciousness. So, but to say that panpsychism, that consciousness is a fundamental property of reality is a much bigger statement. Mm -hmm. That it it's like turtles all the way. It's yeah. like every, it's, it doesn't end. It, the yeah. whole thing is, so like how, I know it's full of mystery, uh, but if you can linger on it, like how, how would it, how do you think about reality if consciousness is a fundamental part of its fabric? The way you get there is from thinking, can we explain consciousness given the existing fundamentals? And then if you can't, as at least right now, it looks like, uh, then you've got to add something. It doesn't follow that you have to add consciousness. Here's another interesting possibility is, well, we'll add something else. Let's call it proto-consciousness mm -hmm. or X. Right. And then it turns out, space, time, mass, plus X, will somehow collectively give you the possibility for, uh, for consciousness. So I don't rule out that view. Either I call that pan-proto-psychism, because maybe there's a, some other property, proto-consciousness, at the bottom level. And if you can't imagine there's actually genuine consciousness at the bottom level, I think we should be open to the idea there's this other thing, X. Maybe we can't imagine that somehow gives you consciousness. But if we are playing along with the idea there really is genuine consciousness at the bottom level. Of course, this is going to be way out and speculative, but you know, at least in say if it was classical physics, then we'd have to you'd end up saying, well, every little atom, every little, with you know a bunch of particles in space time, each of these particles has some kind of consciousness whose structure mirrors maybe their physical properties, like its mass, its charge, its velocity, and so on. The structure of its consciousness would roughly correspond to that. And the physical interactions between particles. I mean, there's this old worry about physics. Kind of, I mentioned this before in this issue about the manifest image. We don't really find out about the intrinsic nature of things. Physics tells us about how a particle relates to other particles and interacts. It doesn't tell us about what the particle is in itself. That was Kant's thing in itself. So here's a view. Um, the nature in itself of a particle is something mental. A particle is actually a conscious, a little conscious subject with, uh, with properties of its consciousness that correspond to its physical properties. The laws of physics are actually ultimately relating these properties of conscious subjects. So in this view, a Newtonian world actually would be a vast collection of little conscious subjects at the bottom level, way, way simpler than we are without free will or rationality or anything like that. 
But that's what the universe would be like. Now, of course, that's a vastly speculative view. No, no particular reason to think it's correct. Furthermore, non-Newtonian physics, say a quantum mechanical wave function, suddenly it starts to look different. It's not a vast collection of conscious subjects. Maybe the, there's ultimately one big wave function for the whole universe. Corresponding to that might be something more like a, a single conscious mind whose structure corresponds to the structure of the wave function. People sometimes call this cosmopsychism. And now, of course, we're in the realm of extremely speculative philosophy. There's no direct evidence for this. But yeah, but if you want a picture of what that universe would be like, think, yeah, giant cosmic mind with enough <laughs> richness and structure among it to replicate all the structure of physics. I think, therefore, I am at the level of particles and with quantum mechanics at the level of the wave function. Um, it's a... It's kind of an exciting, beautiful possibility, of course, way out of reach of physics currently. It is interesting that some neuroscientists are beginning to take panpsychism seriously, that you find consciousness even in very, in very simple systems. So for example, the integrated information theory mm -hmm. of consciousness, that a lot of neuroscientists are taking seriously. Actually, I just got this new book by Christoph Koch just came in, The Feeling of Life Itself why consciousness is widespread but can't be computed. He likes, he basically endorses a panpsychist view where you get consciousness with the degree of information processing or integrated information processing in a simple, in a system. And even very, very simple systems, like a couple of particles, will have some degree of this. So he ends up with some degree of consciousness in all matter. And the claim is that this theory can actually explain a bunch of stuff about the connection between the brain and consciousness. Now, that's very controversial. I think it's very, very early days in the science of consciousness. So it's but it's interesting that it's not just philosophy that, that might lead you in this direction, but there are ways of thinking quasi-scientifically that lead you there too. But maybe it's different than panpsychism. What do you think? So Alan Watts has this quote that I'd like to ask you about. Uh, the quote is, through our eyes, the universe is perceiving itself. Through our ears, the universe is listening to its harmonies. We are the witnesses to which the universe becomes conscious of its glory, of its magnificence. So that's not panpsychism. Do you think that we are essentially the tools, the senses the universe created to be conscious of itself? It's an interesting idea. Of course, if you went for the giant cosmic mind view, then the universe was conscious no, all no. along. It didn't need us. We're just little components of the universal consciousness. Likewise, if you believe in panpsychism, then there was some little degree of consciousness at the bottom level all along, and we were just a more complex form of consciousness. So I think maybe the quote you mentioned works better. If you're not a panpsychist, you're not a cosmopsychist, you think consciousness just exists at this... Uh, at this intermediate level. And of course, that's the orthodox view. That you would say is the, the common view? So is, is your own view with panpsychism a rarer view? I think it's generally regarded certainly as a speculative view mm. held by a fairly small minority of at least theorists, philosopher, most philosophers and most scientists who think about consciousness are not panpsychists. There's been a bit of a movement in that direction the last 10 years or so seems to be quite popular, especially among the, the younger generation, but it's still very definitely a minority view. Many people think it's totally batshit crazy, to use the technical term. <laughs> but, um, it's a philosophical term. Yeah, so the orthodox view, I think, is still consciousness is something that humans have and some good number of non-human animals have, and maybe AIs might have one day, but it's restricted. On that view, then there was no consciousness at the start of the universe. There may be none at the end. But it is this thing which happened at some point in the history of the universe, consciousness developed. And yes, it's on, that's a very amazing event on this view because many people are inclined to think consciousness is what somehow gives meaning to our lives. Without consciousness, there'd be no meaning, no true value, no good versus bad, and so on. So with the advent of consciousness, suddenly the universe went from meaningless to somehow meaningful. Why did this happen? I guess the quote you mentioned was somehow, this was somehow destined to happen because the universe needed 
to have consciousness within it, to have value and have meaning. And maybe you could combine that with a theistic view or a teleological view. The universe was inexorably evolving towards consciousness. Actually, my colleague here at NYU, Tom Nagel, wrote a book called Mind and Cosmos mm. a few years ago where he argued for this teleological view of evolution toward consciousness, saying this led to problems for Darwinism. Okay, this got him on, you know, this was very, very controversial. Most people didn't agree. I don't myself agree with this teleological view, but it is a, it's at least a beautiful speculative view of the uh, of cosmos. What do you think people experience? What do they seek when they believe in God from this kind of perspective? Mm. I'm not an expert on thinking about God and religion. I'm not myself religious at all. When people sort of pray, or communicate with God, which whatever form, I'm not speaking to sort of the practices and the rituals mm -hmm. of religion. I mean, the actual experience of that people really have a deep connection with God in some cases. Mm -hmm. what, what do you think that experience is? It's so common, at least throughout the history of civilization, that it seems like we uh, seek that. At the very least, it is an interesting conscious experience that people have when they experience religious awe or prayer and so on. And neuroscientists have tried to examine what bits of the uh, the brain are active and so on. But yeah, that there's this deeper question of what is what are people looking for when they're doing this? And like I said, I've got no real expertise on this, but it does seem that one thing people are after is a sense of meaning and value, a sense of connection to something greater than themselves that will give their lives meaning and value. And maybe the thought is if there is a God and God somehow is a universal consciousness who has invested this universe with meaning and somehow connection to God might give your life meaning. I think that's a, I can kind of see the, see the attractions of that, but still makes me wonder why is it exactly that a universal consciousness, a universe, God, would be needed to give the to give the world meaning. If I mean, if universal consciousness can give the world meaning, why can't local consciousness give the world meaning too? So I think my consciousness gives my world is the thing, meaning is the origin of meaning yeah. for your world. Yeah, I experience things as good or bad, happy, sad, interesting, important. So my consciousness invests this world with meaning. Without any consciousness, maybe it would be a bleak, meaningless universe. But I don't see why I need someone else's consciousness or even God's consciousness to give this uh, this universe meaning. Here we are, local creatures with our own subjective experiences. I think we can give the universe meaning ourselves. So, I mean, maybe to some people that feels inadequate. Yeah, Our own local consciousness is somehow too puny and insignificant to invest any of this with cosmic significance. And maybe God gives you a sense of cosmic significance but I'm just speculating here. <laughs> so the, you know, it's a really interesting idea that consciousness is the thing that makes life meaningful. If you could maybe just, just briefly explore that for a second. So I suspect just from listening to you now, you mean in an almost trivial sense, just the day-to-day the -day experiences of life have, because of, you attach identity to it. Mm -hmm. They become, well, I, I guess I want to ask something I, I would uh, always wanted to ask a legit world-renowned philosopher. What is the meaning of life? <laughs> so I suspect you don't mean consciousness gives any kind of greater meaning to it all. Yeah. And more to day-to-day. But is there greater meaning to it all? I think life has meaning for us because we are conscious. So without consciousness, no meaning. Consciousness invests our life with meaning. So consciousness is the source of my view of the meaning of life. But I wouldn't say consciousness itself is the meaning of life. I'd say what's meaningful in life is basically what we find meaningful, what we experience as meaningful. So if you find meaning and fulfillment 
and value in say intellectual work like understanding then that's your that's a very significant part of the meaning of life for you if you find it in social connections or in raising a family then that's the meaning of life for you the meaning kind of comes from what you value as a conscious creature so i think there's no on this view there's no universal solution you no universal answer to the question what is the meaning of life the meaning of life is where you find it as a conscious creature but it's consciousness that somehow makes value so, possible experiencing some things as good or as bad or as meaningful somehow so you, comes from within consciousness so you think consciousness is a crucial component ingredient of having give assigning value to things i mean it, it's kind of a fairly strong intuition that without consciousness there wouldn't really be any value if we just had a purely a universe of unconscious creatures would anything be better or worse than anything else certainly when it comes to ethical dilemmas you know you know about the older the old trolley problem do you uh, do you kill one person or do you switch to the other track to kill uh, kill five well i've got a variant on this the zombie trolley problem where there's a uh, one conscious being on uh, on one track and oh. five humanoid zombies let's make them robots yeah who are not who are not conscious on the uh on the other track do you uh, given that choice do you call the one conscious being or the five unconscious robots most people have a fairly clear intuition here yeah kill the uh kill the unconscious beings because they basically they don't have a meaningful life they're not really persons conscious beings of course. attractive i recently wrote an article all about this kind of issue called the meta problem of consciousness mm -hmm. the hard problem is how does the brain give you consciousness? The meta problem is why are we puzzled <laughs> by the hard problem of consciousness? And because, you know, our being puzzled by it, that's ultimately a bit of behavior. We might be able to explain that bit of behavior as one of the easy problems ah. of consciousness. So right. maybe there'll be some computational model that explains why we're puzzled by consciousness. The meta problem has come up with that model. And I've been thinking about that a lot lately. There's some interesting stories you can tell about why. Uh, the right kind of computational system might develop these introspective models of itself that attributed itself these special properties. Um, so that that meta problem is a research program program for everyone. And then if you've got attraction to sort of simple views, desert landscapes, and so on, then you can go all the way with what people call illusionism and say, in fact, consciousness itself is not real. What is real is just these uh, these these introspective models we have that tell us that we're conscious. Um, so the view is very simple, very attractive, very powerful. The trouble is, of course, it has to say that deep down, consciousness is not real. We're not actually experiencing right now. And it looks like it's just contradicting a fundamental datum of our existence. And this is why most people find this view crazy, just as they find panpsychism crazy in one way. People find illusionism crazy in another way but it, i mean but it so yes it has to deny this fundamental datum of our existence now and the view that makes the view sort of frankly unbelievable for most people on the other hand the view developed right might be able to explain why we find it unbelievable <laughs> because these models are exactly. so deeply hardwired and, into our head and they're all integrated so yeah. it's not you can't escape that uh, the the illusion and it's a crazy possibility the demonstration of consciousness from a system like that, from a system like Alexa or, or um, a conversational agent, that is what you would be looking for is kind of at the very basic level for the system to have an awareness that I'm just a program, and yet why do I experience this? Mm -hmm. and, or not to have that experience, but to communicate that to you. So that's what us humans would sound like if you all of a sudden woke up one day uh, like Kafka, right, in, in the body of a bug or something. Mm -hmm. But in a, in a computer, you all of a sudden realize mm -hmm. you don't have a body, mm -hmm. and yet you would feel what you're feeling. You would probably say those kinds of things. Mm -hmm. So do you think a system essentially becomes conscious by convincing us that it's conscious hmm. through the words that I just mentioned? So by being confused about the fact that uh, why am oh, I having I these experiences 
Well, so basically, I don't think this is what makes you conscious, but I do think being puzzled about consciousness is a very good sign that a system is conscious. So if I encountered a robot that actually seemed to be genuinely puzzled by its own mental states and saying, yeah, I have all these weird experiences and I don't see how to explain them. I know I'm a, just a set of silicon circuits, but I don't see how that would give you my consciousness. I would at least take that as some evidence that there's some consciousness going on there. I don't think a system needs to be puzzled about consciousness to be conscious. Many people aren't puzzled by their consciousness. Animals don't seem to be puzzled at all. I still think they're conscious. So I don't think that's a requirement on consciousness. But I do think if we're looking for signs for consciousness, say in AI systems, one of the things that will help convince me that an AI system is conscious is if it shows signs of it is, if it shows signs of introspectively recognizing something like consciousness and finding this philosophically puzzling in the way that uh, the way that that we do. It's such an interesting thought, though, because a lot of people sort of would, uh, at the shallow level, criticize the Turing test mm -hmm. for language. That it's essentially uh, what I heard, like uh, Dan Dennett criticize it in this kind of way which is it really puts a lot of emphasis on lying. <laughs> yeah. And the, on being able to being able to imitate human beings. Yeah, there's this uh, there's this cartoon of the AI system studying for the Turing test. It's got to read this <laughs> book called Talk Like a Human. It's like, man, why do I have to waste my time learning how to imitate humans? Maybe the AI system is going to be way beyond the hard problem of consciousness. And it's going to be just like, why do I need to waste my time pretending that I recognize the hard problem of consciousness? To, uh, in order for people to recognize me as conscious. Yeah, it just feels like, I guess the question is, do you think there's a, we can never really create a test for consciousness because it, it feels like we're very human centric. And so the only way we would be convinced that something is conscious is, by, is basically the thing demonstrates the illusion of consciousness. That we can never really know whether it's conscious or not. And in fact, that almost feels like it doesn't matter then. Mm. Or does it still matter to you that something is conscious or it demonstrates consciousness? You I still see it, that fundamental distinction. I think to a lot of people, whether a system is conscious or not matters hugely for many things, like how we treat it, can it suffer, and so on. But still that leaves open the question, how can we ever know? And it's true that it's awfully hard to see how we can know for sure whether a system is conscious. I suspect that sociologically, the thing that's going to convince us that a system is conscious is in part things like social interaction, conversation, and so on, where they seem to be conscious. They talk about their conscious states or just talk about being happy or sad or finding things meaningful or being in pain. That will tend to convince us if we don't the system genuinely seems to be conscious, we don't treat it as such, eventually it's going to seem like a strange form of racism or speciesism or somehow yeah. not to acknowledge them. I conscious. truly believe that, by the way. I, I, I believe that there is going to be something akin to the civil rights movement, but for robots. Mm -hmm. um, I think the moment you have a Roomba say, please don't kick me, that hurts. Just say it. Yeah. I think that will fundamentally change the fabric of our society. I think the, you're probably right, although it's gonna be very tricky because to say we're in a, we've got the technology where these conscious beings can just be multi created and multiplied by the thousands by, by flicking a switch. So, And the legal status is gonna be different, but ultimately the moral status ought to be the same. And yeah, the civil rights issue is gonna be a huge mess. Yeah. What are your thoughts? I'd be curious. You're a really yeah. good person to ask, which is uh, Penrose's, Roger Penrose's work on consciousness, saying that there, you know, there is some uh, with axons and so on. There might be some biological places where quantum mechanics can come into play, and through that, create consciousness somehow. Yeah. Okay. Well, um, uh, are you familiar with his work. Uh, of course. You know, I read Penrose's books as a teenager. They had a huge impact on me. Uh, uh, five or six years ago, I had the privilege to actually talk these things over with Penrose, you know, at some length at a conference in, in Minnesota. 
And, uh, you know, he is, uh, uh, you know, an amazing uh, personality. I admire the fact that he was even raising such uh, audacious questions at all. Uh, but, you know, to, to, to answer your question, I think the first thing we need to uh, get clear on is that he is not merely saying that quantum mechanics is relevant to consciousness, mm -hmm. right? That would be like, um, you know, that would be tame compared to what he is saying, right? He is saying that, you know, even quantum mechanics is not good enough, right? If, because if, if supposing, for example, that the brain were a quantum computer, right, well, that's still a computer. Yeah. You know, in fact, a quantum computer can be simulated by an ordinary computer. Right. It might merely need exponentially more time in order to do so, right? So that's simply not good enough for him. Okay, so what he wants is for the brain to be a quantum gravitational computer, or, or uh, 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 he wants the brain to be exploiting as yet unknown laws of quantum gravity, okay, which would which would be uncomputable. Uncomputable. Sense. That's the key point. Okay. Yes. Yes. That would be literally uncomputable. And I've asked him, you know, to clarify this, but uncomputable, even if you had an oracle for the halting problem, or in, you know, in in or you know as high up as you want to go in the sort of high the usual hierarchy of uncomputability he wants to go beyond all of that okay so so you know just just to be clear like you know if if we're keeping count of how many speculations you know <laughs> there's probably like at least 5 or 6 of them yeah. right there's first of all that there is some quantum gravity theory that would involve this kind of uncomputability right most people who study quantum gravity would not agree with that they would say that what we've learned, you know, what little we know about quantum gravity from the this ADS CFT correspondence, for example, has been very much consistent with the broad idea of nature being computable, right? Um, but uh, so but all right, but but su supposing that he's right about that, then you know mo what most physicists would say is that whatever new phenomena there are in quantum gravity, you know, they might be relevant at the singularities of black holes. They might be relevant at the Big Bang. Uh, they are plainly not relevant to something like the brain, you know, that is operating at ordinary temperatures, right. you know, with uh, ordinary chemistry. And, you know, the, the, the physics underlying the brain, they, they would say that we have, you know, the fundamental physics of the brain, they would say that we've pretty much completely known for, for generations now, right? Uh, because, you know, quantum field theory lets us sort of parameterize our ignorance, right? I mean, uh, Sean Carroll has made this case and, you know, in great detail, right? That sort of whatever new effects are coming from quantum gravity, you know, they are sort of screened off by quantum field theory, right? And this is, this Bring, you know, brings us to the whole idea of effective theories, right? But that, like, we have, you know, the, in like in the standard model of elementary particles, right? We have a quantum field theory that seems totally adequate for all of the terrestrial phenomena, right? The only things that it doesn't, you know, explain are, well, first of all, you know, the details of gravity, if you were to probe it, like at, at uh, uh, you know, extremes of, you know, curvature or at like incredibly small distances, it doesn't explain dark matter, it doesn't explain black hole singularities, right? But these are all very exotic things, very, you know, far removed from our life on Earth. Yeah. Right. So for Penrose to be right, he needs, you know, these phenomena to somehow affect the brain. He needs the brain to contain antenna that are sensitive to, to this black holes. To, the, to this as yet unknown physics. Right. Yeah. And then he needs a modification of quantum mechanics. Okay. So he needs quantum mechanics to actually be wrong. Okay. He needs uh, uh, what what he wants is what he calls an objective reduction mechanism or an objective collapse. So this is the idea that once quantum states get large enough, then they somehow spontaneously collapse, right? That uh, uh, um, you know, and 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 this is an idea that lots of people have explored. Uh, you know, there's uh, something called the GRW proposal that uh, tries to. Uh, you know, uh, say something along those lines, you know, and these are theories that actually make testable predictions, right? Which is a nice feature that they have. Mm -hmm. uh, but, you know, the very fact that they're testable may mean that in the, uh, you know, in the, in the coming decades, we may well be able to test these theories and show that they're, they're, they're wrong, 
right? Uh, you know, we may be able to test some of Penrose's ideas, if not not his ideas about consciousness, but at least his ideas that about an objective collapse of quantum states, right? And people have actually, like Dick Baumeister, have actually been working to try to do these experiments. They haven't been able to do it yet to uh, test Penrose's proposal. Okay, but Penrose would need more than just an objective collapse of quantum states, which would already be the biggest development in physics for a century yeah. since quantum mechanics itself. Okay, he would need for consciousness to somehow be able to influence the direction of the collapse yeah. so that it wouldn't be completely random, but that you know your dispositions would somehow influence the quantum state to collapse more likely this way or that way. Okay? Yeah. Finally, Penrose you know, says that all of this has to be true because of an argument that he makes based on Gödel's incompleteness theorem. Okay. Right. Now, like I would say the overwhelming majority of computer scientists and mathematicians who have thought about this, I don't think that Gödel's incompleteness theorem can do what he needs it to do here, right? I don't think that that argument is sound, okay? But that is, you know, that is sort of the tower that you have to ascend to if you're going to go where Penrose goes. And the in intuition <laughs> uses with uh, yeah. uh, the incompleteness theorem is that basically that there's important stuff that's not computable. Uh, is that where no, he takes it's not. It? It's not just that because I mean everyone agrees that there are problems that are uncomputable, right? That's a mathematical theorem, yeah. right? That. But what Penrose wants to say is that uh, uh, you know the um, you know for example there are statements uh, you know for you know given any uh, formal system you know for doing math right there will be true statements of arithmetic that that formal system, you know, if it's adequate for math at all, if it's consistent and so on, will not be able to prove. A uh, famous example being the statement that that system itself is consistent, mm, right? right. Uh, no, you know, good formal system can actually prove its own consistency. To, that can only be done from a stronger formal system, which then can't prove its own consistency and so on forever. Okay, that's Gödel's theorem. But now, why is that relevant to uh, consciousness? Right. Uh, uh, well, you know, I mean, I mean, the the idea that it might have something to do with consciousness is an old one. Gödel himself apparently thought that it did. Oh, really? That's interesting. Um, you know, uh, uh, Lucas uh, uh, um, 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 thought so. I think in the sixties. And Penrose is really just, you know, sort of updating what what uh, uh, what what they and others had said. I mean, you know, the idea that Gödel's theorem could have something to do with consciousness was, you know, um, um, in in 1950 when Alan Turing wrote his article uh, about the Turing test, he already, you know, was writing about that as like an old and well known idea and as one that he oh, well, as, as a wrong one that he wanted to dispense with. Right? Yeah. Okay, but the basic problem with this idea is, you know, Penrose wants to say that, uh, and and all of his predecessors here, you know, want to say that, you know, even though you know this given formal system cannot prove uh, its own consistency, we as humans, sort of looking at it from the outside, can just somehow see its consistency, right? And the you know, the rejoinder to that, you know, from the very beginning has been, well, can we really? Yeah. I mean, maybe, may, or maybe, maybe, you know, maybe, maybe he, Penrose can, but, you know, can the rest of us, yeah. right? Uh, and, you know, I, I noticed that, that, um, you know, I, I mean, it, it is perfectly plausible to imagine a computer that could say, you know, it, it would not be limited to working within a single formal system, right? They could say, I am now going to adopt the hypothesis that this that my formal system is consistent, right? right? And I'm now going to see what can be done from that stronger vantage point and, and so on. And, you know, and I'm going to add new axioms to my system totally plausible. There's absolutely, Gödel's theorem has nothing to say about against an AI that could repeatedly add new axioms. All it says is that there is no absolute guarantee that when the AI adds new axioms that it will always be right. right. Okay. And, you know, and that's of course the point that Penrose pounces on, but the reply is obvious. And, you know, it's one that, that Alan Turing made 70 years ago. Namely, we don't have an absolute guarantee that we're right, right when we add a new axiom. Right. We never have, and plausibly, we never will of nature. Let me bring up the next topic that people mm. don't want to mention, although they're getting more comfortable with it, is consciousness. Mm. You mentioned that you have a talk on consciousness that I 
watched five minutes of, but the internet connection was, was really was this, bad. Was this, was this my talk about, you know, uh, uh, refuting the integrated information theory? Yes, Which was this been. particular account of consciousness yeah. that, yeah, I think one can just show it doesn't work. But <laughs> so let me... Much uh, harder to say what does work. What does work, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, so yeah. Let me ask, uh, maybe it'd be nice to uh, comment on... You, you talk about also like the, the semi-hard problem of consciousness or yeah. like almost hard problem or kind of yeah, hard. Pretty pretty hard pretty problem, hard. I think right. I call it. So maybe can you uh, talk about that, uh, their idea of um, of uh, the approach to modeling consciousness and why you don't find it convincing? Yeah. What is it, first of all? What, uh, well, okay, well, so so what, what, what I call the pretty hard problem of consciousness, this is my term, although many other people have said something equivalent to this, okay? Uh, but uh, it, it's just you know the 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 problem of you know giving an account of just which physical systems are conscious and which are not, or you know if there are degrees of consciousness, then quantifying how conscious a given system is. Oh, right? awesome! So that's the pretty hard. Yeah, problem. that that's what I mean. That's by. it. I'm adopting that's, it. That, I love it. That's a good that's a good ring to it. And so you know the infamous hard problem of consciousness is to explain how something like consciousness could arise at all, you know, yeah. in a material universe, right? Or, you know, why does it ever feel like anything to to uh, experience anything, right? And, yeah. and, you know, so I'm trying to distinguish from that problem, right? And say, you know, no, okay, I am. I would merely settle for an account that <laughs> could say, you know, is a fetus conscious, you know, if so, at which trimester, you know, is a, uh, uh, is a dog conscious, you know, what about uh, a frog, right? Or, or it, even as a precondition, you take that both these things are conscious, tell me which is more conscious. Yeah, for example, yes. That's, yeah, yeah. I mean, if consciousness is some multidimensional vector, well, just tell me in which respects these things are conscious and in which respect they aren't, right? And, you know, and have some principled way to do it where you're not, you know, carving out exceptions for things that you like or don't like, but could somehow take a description of an arbitrary physical system. And then just based on the physical properties of that system or the informational properties or how it's connected or something like that, just in principle calculate, you know, its degree of consciousness, right? I mean, this, this, this would be the kind of thing that we would need you know, if we wanted to address questions like, you know, what does it take for a machine to be conscious, right? Or when are, you know, when, when, when should we regard AIs as being conscious? Um, so now this IIT, this integrated information theory, uh, which has been put forward by uh, Giulio Tononi and uh, a bunch of his uh, uh, collaborators over the last decade or two, uh, this is noteworthy, I guess, as a direct attempt to answer that question, mm -hmm. to, you know, answer the, to address the pretty hard problem, right? And they give a, uh, a criterion that's just based on how a system is connected. So you, so it's up to you to sort of abstract a system like a brain or a microchip as a collection of components that are connected to each other by some pattern of connections, you know, and, uh, and to specify how the components can influence each other, mm -hmm. you know, like where the inputs go, you know, where they affect the outputs. But then once you've specified that, then they give this quantity that they call phi, you know, the Greek letter phi. Mm -hmm. And the definition of phi has actually changed over time. It changes from one paper to another, but in all of the variations, it involves something about what we in computer science would call graph expansion. So basically what this means is that they want, it, uh, um, in order to get a large value of phi, uh, it should not be possible to take your system and partition it into two components that are only weakly connected to each other. Okay. So whenever we take our system and sort of try to split it up into two, then there should be lots and lots of connections going between the two components. Okay. Well, I okay. understand what that means on a yeah. graph. Do they formalize what, uh, how to construct such a graph or data structure, whatever, uh, uh, or is this well, one of the criticism uh, uh -huh. I, I've heard you kind of say is that yeah. a lot of the very interesting specifics are usually communicated through like natural language, like like uh, through words, mm -hmm. so it's like the details well, aren't always well. Clear. They well, it's true. I mean, they 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 have nothing even resembling a derivation of this fee, 
Okay, so what they do is they state a whole bunch of postulates, you know, axioms that they think that consciousness should satisfy. And then there's just some verbal discussion, and then at some point, fee appears. Right. Right. And this this was what the first thing that really made the hair stand on my neck, to be honest, because they are acting as if there's a derivation. They're acting as if, you know, you're supposed to think that this is a derivation, and there's nothing even remotely resembling a derivation. They just pull the fee out of a hat completely. So is one of the key criticisms okay. to you is that details are missing, or is but there that, something that's more not, fundamental? That's not even the key criticism. That's just that's just a side point. Yeah, okay. The the core of it is that I think that the you know that they want to say that a system is more conscious the larger its value of fee. Yeah. And I think that that is obvious nonsense. Okay, as soon as you think about it for like a minute, as soon as you think about it in terms of could I construct a system that had an enormous value of fee, like, you know, even larger than the brain has, but that is just implementing an error correcting code, you know, right. doing nothing that we would associate with, you know, intelligence or consciousness or any of it. The answer is yes, it is easy to do that. Right? right. And so I wrote blog posts just making this point that, yeah, it's easy to do that. Now, you know, Tenoni's response to that was actually kind of incredible. Right. I mean, I, I, I admired it in a way because instead of disputing any of it, he just bit the bullet in the sense, you know, he was one of the, the, uh, the most uh, uh, audacious bullet bitings I've ever seen in my career. Okay. Mm -hmm. He said, Okay, then fine. You know, this system that just applies this error correcting code, it's conscious, you know, and if it has a much larger value of fee than you or me, it's much more conscious oh, than wow. you or me. Interesting. You know, you, we just have to accept what the theory says because, you know, science is not about confirming our intuitions. It's about challenging them. And, you know, this is what my theory predicts, that yeah. this thing is conscious and, you know, or, or super duper conscious. And how are you going to prove me wrong? <laughs> See, I would, so the way I would argue again, yeah. against yeah. your blog post uh -huh. is I would say, yes, sure, you're right in general, uh -huh. but for naturally arising systems mm -hmm. developed through the process of evolution on earth mm -hmm. the this rule of the larger fee being associated mm -hmm. being associated with more consciousness is correct yeah so, if so we that's just, not what he said at all right right be because he wants this to be completely general even, right so we can apply it to even computers yeah i mean i mean the, the whole interest of the theory is the you know the hope that it could be completely general apply to aliens to computers to uh, uh uh animals coma patients to any of it right yeah and uh uh so 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 he just said well you know uh, scott is relying on his intuition but you know i'm relying on this theory and you know to me it, it was almost like you know are are we being serious here like like <laughs> like you know, like, like, okay, it, it, yes, in science, we try to learn highly non-intuitive things. But what we do is we first test the theory on cases where we already know the answer, yeah. right? Like if, we, if someone had a new theory of temperature, right, then, you know, maybe we could check that it says that boiling water is hotter than ice. And then if it says that the sun is hotter than anything, you know, you've ever experienced, then maybe we we trust that extrapolation, right? Mm -hmm. But like this this theory, like if if you know, it, it's now saying that, you know, a, a gigantic grid, like regular grid of exclusive or gates can be way more conscious than a you know a person or than than any animal can be, you know, even if it, you know, is you know, is 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 so uniform that it might as just well just be a blank wall, right? And and so now the point is, if if this theory is sort of getting wrong, the question is a blank wall, you know, more conscious than a person. Then I would say, what is what is there for it to get right? So right? your your sense so, is a blank wall uh, is not uh, more conscious than a human being. Yeah, I mean, I mean, I mean, you could say that I am taking that as one of my axioms. <laughs> I'm, I'm saying I'm saying that if if a theory of consciousness is is get, getting that wrong then whatever it is talking about at that point i i uh i'm not going to call it consciousness well, it's, i'm going to use a different word you have to use a different word yeah, i mean yeah. it's also it's possible just like with intelligence mm -hmm. that us humans conveniently define these very difficult to understand concepts in a mm -hmm. very human-centric way that's just like right. the turing test really seems to define intelligence mm -hmm. as a thing that's human-like. Mm -hmm. Right, but I would say that with any uh, concept, you know, there's uh, 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 
you know, like we, 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 we first need to define it, right? And a right. definition is only a good definition if it matches what we thought we were talking about, you know, right. prior yeah. to having a definition, yeah. right? Yeah. And I would say that, you know, uh, fee as a definition of consciousness fails that test. Th that is my argument. So, okay, then let's, yeah. so let's take a further step. So you yeah. mentioned that the universe might be a, a, a Turing machine. So like it might be computation. Or so, simulatable by one anyway. Simulatable by one. You know, I'm, so yeah. do you, what's your sense about consciousness? Do you think consciousness is computation that we don't need to go to any place outside of the computable universe to, uh, you know, to, uh, to understand consciousness, to build consciousness, to measure consciousness, all those kinds of things. I don't know. These are what, uh, you know, have been called the, the vertiginous questions, right? There's the questions like, like uh, you know, the, you get a feeling of vertigo when thinking about them, right? I mean, I certainly feel like uh, uh, I am conscious in a way that is not reducible to computation, but why should you believe me? Right. I mean, and, and, and if you said the same to me, then why should I believe you? But as computer scientists, yeah. I feel like a computer could be intel could achieve human level intelligence. But and that's actually a feeling and a hope. That's not a scientific belief. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It's just we've built up enough intuition, the same kind of intuition you use in your blog. It's, you know, that's what scientists do. They I mean, some of it is a scientific method, but some of it is just damn good mm -hmm. intuition. Mm -hmm. I don't have a good intuition about consciousness. Yeah. I'm not sure that anyone does or, or has in the, you know, 2,500 years that these things have been discussed, Lex. Uh, but, that, but do you think we will? Like one of the, well, I got a chance to mm -hmm. attend, can't wait to hear your opinion on this, but attend the Neuralink event. And uh, one of the dreams there is to, uh, you know, basically push neuroscience forward. And the mm -hmm. hope with neuroscience is that uh, we can inspect the machinery from which all this fun stuff emerges and see, are we going to notice something special, some special sauce from which something like consciousness or cognition emerges? Yeah, well, it's, it's clear that we've learned an enormous amount about neuroscience. We've learned an enormous amount about computation, you know, about right. machine learning, about you know, now, AI, how to get it to work. We've learned uh, an enormous amount about the underpinnings of the physical world, you know, and you know, from one point of view, that's like uh, an enormous distance that we've traveled along the road to understanding consciousness. From another point of view, you know, the distance still to be traveled on the road, you know, maybe seems no shorter than it was at the beginning. Yeah. Right. <laughs> so it's very hard to say. I mean, you know, these are questions like, like in, in, in sort of trying to have a theory of consciousness, there's sort of a problem where it feels like it's not just that we don't know how to make progress, it's that it's hard to specify what could even count as progress, right? right? Because no matter what scientific theory someone proposed, someone else could come along and say, well, you've just talked about the mechanism. You haven't said anything about what breathes fire into the mechanism, what right. really makes there something that it's like to be it, right? And that seems like an objection that you could always raise, yes. no matter you know how much someone elucidated the details of how the brain works. Okay, let's go Turing test and Lobner Prize. I have this intuition, call me crazy, but we that a machine to pass the Turing test and is full, whatever the spirit of it is, we can talk about how to formulate the perfect Turing test, that that machine has to be conscious. Or we at least have to... Uh, I have a very low bar of what consciousness is. I mm -hmm. tend to, I tend to think that the emulation of consciousness is as good as consciousness. Mm. So, like consciousness is just a dance, a social, a social uh, shortcut, like a nice, useful tool. But I tend to connect intelligence and consciousness together. So, by by that, do you uh, maybe just to ask what uh, what role does consciousness play, do you think, in passing the Turing test? Well, look, I mean, it's almost tautologically true that if we had a machine that passed the Turing test, then it would be emulating consciousness, right? So if your position is that, you know, emulation of consciousness is consciousness, then, you know, by, by definition, any machine that passed the Turing test would be conscious. But right? it's... Uh, uh, 
But I mean, you know, that you could say that, you know, that that is just a, a way to rephrase the original question, you know, is an emulation of consciousness, you know, necessarily conscious, right? And you can, can you know, I, I hear I'm not saying anything new that hasn't been debated ad nauseum in the literature, okay? But, you know, you could uh, imagine some very hard cases, like imagine a machine that passed the Turing test, but that did so just by an enormous cosmological sized lookup table. Right. That just cached every possible conversation that could be had. The old and Chinese just, room. Well, the, well, yeah, yeah, but but this is, uh, uh, I mean, I mean, the Chinese room actually would be doing some computation, at least in Searle's version, yeah. right? Here, I'm just talking about a table lookup. Okay, now it's true that for conversations of a reasonable length, this you know lookup table would be so enormous it wouldn't even fit in the observable universe. Mm -hmm. Okay, but supposing that you could build a big enough lookup table and then just you know. Uh, 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 pass the Turing test just by looking up what the person said, right? Are you going to regard that as conscious? Okay, let me try to make this yeah, yeah, yeah. formal and then okay. you can shut it down. Right. I think that the emulation of something is that something if there exists in that system a black box that's full of mystery. So like... Okay. Uh, Full of mystery to whom? By the to way? Uh, human in, in, in ah. inspectors. So does so, that mean that consciousness is relative to the observer? Like, could something be conscious for us, but not conscious for an alien that understood better what was right. happening inside the black yes. box? Yes. Hmm. So that if inside the black box is just a lookup table, mm -hmm. the alien that saw that would say this is not conscious. Mm -hmm. To us, be, uh, another way to phrase the black box is layers of abstraction, which make it very difficult to see to the actually underlying functionality of the system. Mm -hmm. And then we observe just the abstraction, and so it looks like magic to us. Mm -hmm. But once we understand the inner machinery, it stops being magic. Mm -hmm. And so like that's a prerequisite, is that you can't know how mm -hmm. it works, mm -hmm. some part of it. Because then there has to be, in our human mind, uh, entry point for the magic. Mm -hmm. So that I, that's that's a formal definition of the system. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well. Well. Look. I mean. I I explored a view in this essay I wrote called "The Ghost in the Quantum Turing Machine" uh, seven years ago that is uh, related to that, except that I did not want to have consciousness be relative to the observer, right? Because I think that, you know, if consciousness means anything, it is something that is experienced by the entity that is conscious, right? You know, like, I don't need you to tell me that I'm conscious, right? Nor do you need me to 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 to, uh, to 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 tell you that you are right. So uh, so, but but basically, what I explored there is, you know, are there uh, aspects of a of a system like uh, like a brain? That uh, that just could not be predicted, even with arbitrarily advanced future technologies, yeah. just because of chaos combined with quantum mechanical uncertainty, you know, and things like that. I mean, that that actually could be a a property of the brain, you know, if true, that would distinguish it in a principled way, at least from any currently existing computer, not from any possible computer, so, but from yeah, yeah. This is a thought experiment. So yeah, if I gave you information that you're in the entire history of your life uh, basically explain away free will with a lookup table say that this was all predetermined mm -hmm. that everything you experience has already been predetermined wouldn't that take away your consciousness wouldn't you, you yourself that wouldn't well, the experience of the world change for you in a way that's you, you, well, you can't well, well let, let me let me put it this way if you could do like in a greek tragedy where you know you would just write down a prediction for what i'm going to do and then maybe you put the prediction in a sealed box and maybe you know you you uh, uh open it later and you show that you knew everything i was going to do or you know of course the even creepier version would be you tell me the prediction and then i try to falsify it and my very effort to falsify it makes it come true right oh, let's God. let's let's you know let, yeah. let's even forget that you know that version as as convenient as it is for fiction writers right yeah. let's just let's just do the version where you put the prediction into a sealed envelope okay but uh, uh if you could reliably predict everything Thing that I was going to do, I'm not sure that that would destroy my sense of being conscious, but I think it really would destroy my sense of having free will, you know, and much, much more than any philosophical conversation could possibly do that, right? Yeah. And so I think it becomes extremely interesting to ask, you know, could such predictions be done, you know, even in principle? Is it consistent with the laws of physics? 
to make such predictions, to get enough data about someone that you could actually generate such predictions without having to kill them in the process to, you know, slice their brain up into little slivers or something. I mean, it's uh, theoretically we, possible, right? Well, um, I don't know. I mean, I mean, it might be possible, but only at the cost of destroying the person. Right. I mean, it depends on how low you have to go in sort of the substrate. Like if there was a nice digital abstraction layer, if you could think of each neuron as a kind of transistor computing a digital function, then you could imagine some nano robots that would go in and would just scan the state of each transistor, you know, of each neuron, and then, you know, make a, uh, a good enough copy, right? But if it was actually important to get down to the molecular or the atomic level, then, you know, eventually you would be up against quantum effects. You would be up against the unclonability of quantum states. So I think it's a question of uh, how good of a replica, how good does the replica have to be before you're going to count it as actually a copy of you or as being able to predict your actions? Uh, and that's a totally open question. That, yeah, yeah, yeah. And 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 especially once we say that, well, look, maybe there there's no way to predict you know, to make a deterministic prediction because, you know, there's, all, there, you know, we know that there's noise buffeting the brain around, presumably even quantum mechanical uncertainty, you know, affecting the sodium ion channels, for example, whether they open or they close. Um, you know, there's no reason why after, uh, uh, over a certain time scale that shouldn't be amplified, just like we imagine happens with the weather or with any other, you know, chaotic system. Uh, so, um, so if 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 that stuff is is important, right? Then yeah. uh, then then you know we would say, uh, well, you know, you 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 can't, uh, uh, you know, you're 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 never going to be able to make an accurate enough copy. But now the hard part is, well, what if someone can make a copy that sort of no one else can tell apart from you, right? It says the same kinds of things that you would have said. Maybe not exactly the same things because we agree that there's noise, but it says the same kinds of things. And maybe you alone would say, "No, I know that that's not me." You know, it's uh, it doesn't share my. I haven't felt my consciousness leap over to that yeah. other thing. I still feel it localized in this version, yeah. right? And then why should anyone else believe you? Well, what do you make of consciousness, for example? Th there's something uh, as an example of something we completely have no clue about. The fact that we have this subjective experience. Right. Is it possible that this network of uh, this circuit of switches is able to create something like consciousness? To know, to know its own identity. Yeah, to know, to know the algorithm, to know itself. <laughs> to know itself. I think if you try to define that rigorously, you'd have a lot of trouble. Yeah, that's interesting. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so I know that there are. Um, Many who um, believe that general intelligence can be achieved, and there are even some who are feel certain that uh, uh, the singularity will come and uh, we will be surpassed by the machines, which will then learn more and more about themselves and reduce humans to an inferior breed. I am doubtful that this will ever be achieved. Just for the fun of it, <laughs> could you linger on why, what's your intuition, why you're doubtful? So there are quite a few people that are extremely worried yeah. about this uh, existential threat of artificial intelligence, of us being left behind by the super intelligent new species. What's your intuition why that's not quite likely? Just because none of the achievements in speech or robotics or uh, natural language processing or creation of flexible computer assistants or any of that comes anywhere near close to that level of cognition. What do you think about ideas as sort of, uh, if we look at Moore's law and yeah. exponential improvement uh, to allow us to, that would surprise us? Sort of right. our intuition fall apart with with exponential improvement, because I mean we, we're not able to kind of we kind of think in linear improvement. Yeah, we're not able to imagine a world that goes from the Mark One computer to a, an iPhone ten. Yeah. So, do you think it would be we could be really surprised by the exponential growth, or 
Or on the flip side, is, is it possible that also intelligence is actually way, 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 way harder, uh, even with exponential improvement, um, to be able to crack? I don't think any constant factor improvement could <laughs> could change things. I mean, given given our current comprehension of how the of 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 what cognition requires, it seems to me that multiplying the speed of the switches by a factor of a thousand or a million uh, will not be useful until we really understand the organizational principle behind the, the network of switches. Maybe play devil's advocate on the your conception of consciousness that uh, like the the two characteristics of it that is constrained and there's a single thread of time. Is it possible that Leibniz was onto something that the the basic atom, the screw atom of space, has a consciousness? Is is that uh, so? These are just no. words, right? But like, yeah. what uh, what is there? Is there some sense where consciousness is much more fundamental? Then you're making it seem. I don't know. I mean, that, you know, I like, think. Can you construct that, a world in which it is much more fundamental? I think that, okay, so the question would be is there a way to think about kind of uh, if we sort of parse the universe down at the level of atoms of space or something, could we say, well, so, so that's really a question of a different point of view, a different place in real space? We're asking, you're asking the question could there be a civilization that exists? Could there be sort of uh, conscious entities that exist at the level of atoms of space, and what would that be like? And I think that comes back to this question of can we, you know, what's it like to be a cellular automaton type thing? Mm -hmm. um, I mean, it's, it's, you know, I'm, I'm not yet there. I, I don't know. I mean, I think that the, this is a, and I don't even know yet quite how to think about this in the sense that I was considering, you know, I'm, I never write fiction, but I haven't written it since I was like 10 years old. And my, my fiction, I, I made one attempt, which I sent to some science fiction writer friends of mine, and they told me it was terrible. So, but um, this is a long time ago. No, it was recently. Recently. They said it was terrible. That'd be interesting to see you write a short story based on uh, what well, sounds like it's already inspiring short stories by, or stories yeah, right. by science but, fiction writers. But, but I think the, the interesting thing for me is, you know, in the what does it, what is it like to be a whatever? Yeah. How do you describe that? I mean, it's like that's not a thing that you describe in mathematics. The what is it like to be such and such? Well, see, to me, when you say what is it like to be something, presumes that you're talking about a singular entity. So, yeah, like there, there there's a some kind of feeling of the the entity, the the stuff that's inside of it and the stuff that's outside of it, mm -hmm. and then that's when consciousness starts making sense. But but then um, it seems like that could be generalizable. If you take some subset of uh, a cellular automata, you could start talking about what does that subset Maybe. Uh, feel. But then you can, I think you could just take arbitrary numbers of subsets. Like that, to me, uh, uh, like you and I uh, individually are consciousnesses, but you could also say, the two of us together is a singular conscious. Maybe, maybe. I'm not so sure about that. I think that the single thread of time thing may be pretty important. And that as soon as you start saying there are two different threads of time, there are our two different experiences, and then we have to say, how do they relate? How are they sort of entangled with each other? I mean, that may be a different story of a thing that isn't much like, you know, the, 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 what do the ants, you know, what's it like to be an ant, mm -hmm. you know, where there's a sort of more collective view of the world, so to speak. I don't know. I think that, um, I mean, this is, uh, uh, you know, I, I don't really have a good, I mean, uh, you know, my, my best thought is, you know, can we turn it into a human story? It's like the question of, you know, when we try and understand physics, can we turn that into something which is sort of a human understandable narrative? Mm -hmm. And now what's it like to be a such and such? You know, maybe the only medium in which we can describe that is something like fiction, where it's kind of like you're telling, you know, the life story in that in that uh, in that setting. But I, I'm this is this is beyond what I've what I've yet understood how to do. Yeah, but it, it does seem so. Like with human consciousness, you know, we're made up of cells, and like there, there's a bunch of systems that are networked 
mm-hmm. that work together that at this at the human level feel like a singular consciousness when you take yes and so maybe like an ant colony is just too low level sorry an ant is too low level right maybe you have to look at the ant colony yeah i agree like, there's some level at which it's a conscious being and then if you right. go to the planetary scale then maybe that's going too far so there's a nice sweet spot yeah right for consciousness no i mean I, i agree i think i think the difficulty is that you know okay so in sort of people who talk about consciousness yes one of the one of the terrible things i've realized because i've now interacted with with some of this community so to speak some interesting people who do that kind of thinking but you know one of the things i was saying to one of the leading people in that area i was saying you know uh that um, you know it must be kind of frustrating because it's kind of like a poetry story that is many people are writing poems but few people are reading them yes so there are always these different you know everybody has their own theory of consciousness and they are very non inter sort of inter discussable and and by the way i mean you know my own approach to sort of the the question of consciousness as far as i'm concerned i'm an applied consciousness operative so to speak because mm-hmm. i don't really in a sense the thing i'm trying to get out of it is how does it help me to understand what's a possible theory of physics mm-hmm. and how does it help me to say how do i go from this this incoherent collection of things happening in the universe to our definite perception and definite laws and so on and mm-hmm. sort of an an applied version of consciousness and and i think the reason it sort of segues to a different kind of topic but the reason that um uh one of the things i'm particularly interested in is kind of what's the analog of consciousness in systems very different from brains and so why is that matter well you know this whole description of this kind of uh uh well actually you know what we we haven't talked about why the universe exists so let's let's get to why the universe exists and then we then we can can talk about uh, perhaps a little bit about what these models of physics kind of show you about other kinds of things like molecular computing and so on yes but let's okay that's good. why does the universe exist okay so we finally sort of more or less set the stage we've got this idea of this rouliad of this object that is made from following all possible rules the fact that it's sort of not just this incoherent mess it's got all this entangled structure in it and so on okay mm-hmm. so what is this rouliad well it is the working out of all possible formal systems so the the sort of the question of why does the universe exist its core question which you kind of started with is you've got 2 plus 2 equals 4 you've got some other abstract result but that's not actualized it's just an abstract thing and when we say we got a model for the universe okay it's this rule you run it and it'll make the universe but it's like but but you know where's it actually running what 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 is what is it actually doing right what what is is it actual or is it merely a formal description of something mm-hmm. okay so the thing to realize with this with this the the thing about the rouliad is it's an inevitable it is the entangled running of all possible rules so you don't get to say it's not like you're saying which rouliad are you picking because it's all possible formal rules mm-hmm. it's not like it's just um you know well actually it's only footnote the only footnote it's an important footnote is it's all possible computational rules not hypercomputational rules that is it's running all the rules that would be accessible to a turing machine but it is not running all the rules that would be accessible to a thing that can solve problems in finite time that would take a turing machine infinite time to solve so you can even alan turing knew this that you could make oracles for turing machines where you say a turing machine can't solve the halting problem for turing machines it can't know what will happen in any turing machine after an infinite time in any finite time but you could invent a box just make a black box you say i'm going to sell you an oracle that will just tell you you know press this button it'll tell you what the turing machine will do after an infinite time mm-hmm. you can imagine such a box you can't necessarily build one in the physical universe but you can imagine such a box and so we could say well in addition to so in this rouliad we're imagining that there is a computational that at the end it's it's running rules that are computational mm-hmm. it doesn't have a bunch of uh oracle black boxes in it you say well why not well turns out if there are oracle black boxes the rouliad that is you can make a sort of super rouliad that contains those oracle black boxes but it has a cosmological event horizon relative to the first one they can't communicate in other words 
you can you can end up with what you end up happening what ends up happening is it's 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 like in the physical universe we in this causal graph that represents the causal relationships of different things you can have an event horizon where there's where the causal graph is disconnected where the effect here an event happening here does not affect an event happening here because there's a disconnection in the causal graph mm -hmm. and that's what happens in an event horizon and so the what will happen between this kind of the ordinary ruliad and the hyper ruliad is there is an event horizon and you you know we in our ruliad will just never know that there is that that they're, they're just separate things they're not they're not connected Maybe I'm not understanding, but just because we can't observe it, uh, why does that mean it doesn't exist? Um, so, you, it might exist, but it does. It's not clear what it. It's, it's so what, so to speak, whether it exists. I mean, you know, what we're trying to understand is why does our universe exist? We're not trying to ask the question, what? Uh, you know, it's. Let me say another thing. I, let me make a, a meta comment, okay? Mm -hmm. Which is that that I have not thought through this hyperruliad business properly. So I'm, I'm, I can't, the, 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 the hype. Do you believe one day with, with the technology that keep improving, we will make robot that will be able to be somehow conscious? Absolutely. I, that's been my dream. That's been, I hope, I hope to do just that. First of all, I believe that all people are capable and want to be good to each other. And I think love is a, is a really powerful thing that connects us and can create better and better worlds, sort of like uh, create better and better societies that uh, improve both the technology, the quality of life, and just the, the basics of human experience. And I think creating AI systems that are conscious, that are human-like, can enable us to be better to each other. Like they can, it's, it's almost like adding more and more kindness to the world through the systems we interact with will inspire us to be better and better to each other. In terms of them being conscious, I think that is a, an absolute requirement that entities we interact with communicate some element of consciousness to us. Like that's how we connect to each other. The reason we, you and I connect is that we believe that each of us are conscious. And to me, what consciousness means is the ability to hurt, ability to, to suffer, to, uh, to struggle in this world. Because just like you said, uh, with, with, without the struggle, you don't have the love, you don't have the pleasure. And ultimately consciousness is an entity's ability to struggle to suffer and from that arises the pleasure and us together being able to appreciate sort of uh, uh, appreciate the highs and experience together the lows that's how we form the deep connections i personally think we can create that in robots and i i personally believe it's a lot easier than uh, so what about the hard problem of consciousness do, do, can you just linger on it? Like, but why does it still feel like I, I understand you're kind of the self is an important part of the simulation, but why does the simulation feel like something? So, if you look at a book by, say, George R. R. Martin, where the characters have plausible psychology yeah. and they stand on a hill uh, because they want to conquer the city below the hill and they've done it and they look at the color of the sky and they are apprehensive and feel uh, empowered and all these things. Why do they have these emotions? It's because it's written into the story, right? And it's written into the story because it's an adequate model of the person that predicts what they're going to do next. And the same thing is uh, true for us. So it's basically a story that our brain is writing. It's not written in words. It's written in uh, perceptual content, basically multimedia content. And it's a model of what the person would feel if it existed. So it's a virtual person. <laughs> and you and me happen to be this virtual person. So if this virtual person gets access to the language center and talks about the sky being blue. And this is us. But hold on a second. Do I exist in your simulation? Like you, do, you do exist in an almost similar way as me. So there are internal states that I uh, that are less accessible uh, for me um, 
in, that you have and so on. And your, my model might not be completely adequate. There are also things that I might perceive about you that you don't perceive. But in some sense, uh, both you and me are some puppets, two puppets that enact a, a play in my mind. And I identify with one of them because I can control one of the puppet directly. And with the other one, I can create uh, things in between. So for instance, we can go on an interaction that even leads to a coupling, to a feedback loop. So we can think things together in a certain way or feel things together. But uh, this coupling is itself not a physical phenomenon. It's entirely a software phenomenon. It's the result of two different implementations interacting with each other. So that's interesting. So are are you suggesting, I, I, like the way you think about it, is the entirety of existence a simulation and we're kind of each mind is a little sub simulation that like, why don't you, why doesn't your mind have access to my mind's full state? Like for the same reason that my mind doesn't have access to its own full state. So what, uh, I mean, there is no trick involved. So basically when I say, know something about myself, it's because I made a model. So yes, but part of your brain is tasked with modeling what other parts of your brain are doing. Yes, but there seems to be an incredible consistency about this world in the physical sense, mm -hmm. that there's repeatable experiments and so on. Yeah. How does that fit into our silly descendant of an apes simulation of the world? So why is it so repeat? Why is everything so repeatable? And uh, not everything, there's a lot of fundamental physics experiments that are repeatable for a long time, all over the place and so on. The laws of physics, wh yes. how does that fit in, you think? It seems that the parts of the world that are not deterministic uh, are not long-lived. So if you build a system, any kind of uh, automaton, so if you build simulations of something, uh, you'll notice that uh, the phenomena that endure are those that give rise to stable dynamics. Mm -hmm. So basically, if you see anything that is complex in the world, it's the result of usually of some control, of some feedback that keeps it stable around certain attractors. And the things that are not stable, that uh, don't give rise to certain harmonic patterns and so on, they tend to get weeded out over time. So uh, if we are in a region of the universe that sustains complexity, which is required to implement minds like ours, um, this is going to be a region of the universe that is very tightly controlled and controllable. So it's going to have lots of interesting symmetries and also symmetry breaks that allow to the creation of structure. But they exist where? So the, the, there's such an interesting idea that our mind is simulation that's constructing the narrative. My my question is Much over the the meaning of the relations, mm -hmm. the graph. Can you elaborate on that a little bit? Like where does the Maybe we can even step back and ask the question of what is consciousness to be sort of more systematic. Like what, what, what do you? How do you think about consciousness? I what think is that consciousness? consciousness is largely a model of the contents of your attention. It's a mechanism that has evolved for a certain type of learning. At the moment, our machine learning systems largely work by uh, building chains of weighted sums of real numbers with some um, nonlinearity. And uh, you will learn by uh, piping an error signal through so these different chained layers and adjusting the weights mm -hmm. in these weighted sums. And you can approximate mo most polynomes with this uh, if you have enough training data. But the price is you need to change a lot of these weights. Basically, the error uh, is piped backwards into the system until it accumulates at certain junctures in the network. And uh, everything else evens out statistically. And only at these junctures, this is where you had the actual error in the network, and you make the change there. This is a very slow process. And our brains don't have enough time for that because we don't get old enough to play Go the way that our machines learn to play Go. So instead, what we do is an attention-based learning. We pinpoint the probable region in the network where we uh, can make an improvement. And then uh, we store the this binding state together with the expected outcome in a protocol. And this ability to make indexed memories for the purpose of learning to revisit these uh, commitments later, this requires a memory of the contents of our attention. Another aspect is when I construct my reality, I make mistakes. So I see things that turn out to be reflections or shadows and so on, which means I have to be able to point out which features of my perception gave rise to a, a, a present construction of reality. So the system needs to pay attention to the uh, features that are currently in its focus. 
And it also needs to pay attention to whether it pays attention itself, in part because the attentional system gets trained with the same mechanism, so it's reflexive, but also in part because your attention lapses if you don't pay attention to the attention itself. <laughs> right? So it's the thing that I'm currently seeing just a, a dream that my brain has spun off into some kind of daydream, or am I still paying attention to my percepts? So you have to periodically go back and see whether you're still paying attention. And if you have this loop and you make it tight enough between the system becoming aware of the contents of its attention and the fact that it's paying attention itself and makes attention the object of its attention, I think this is the loop over which we wake up. So there's this <laughs> so there's this attentional mechanism that's somehow self-referential that's fundamental to what consciousness is. Mm -hmm. So just to ask you a question, I don't know how much you're familiar with the recent breakthroughs in natural language processing, they use attentional mechanism, they use something called transformers to uh, learn patterns and sentences by allowing the network to focus its attention to particular parts of the sentence at each individual. So like parametrize and make it learnable the dynamics of a sentence by having like a little window into the into the sentence. Do you think that's like a little step towards that eventually would, will take us to the intentional mechanisms from which consciousness can emerge? Not quite. I think it models only one aspect of attention. In the early days of automated uh, language translation, there was a example that I found particularly funny where somebody tried to translate a text from English into German and it was uh, a bat broke the window. And uh, the uh, translation in German was uh, eine Fledermaus zerbrach das Fenster mit einem Baseballschläger. So to, to translate back into English, a bat, the, uh, this flying yeah. mammal, broke the window with a baseball bat. Yes. And uh, it seemed to be the most similar to this program because it somehow maximized uh, the possibility of translating the concept bat into German in the yeah. same sentence. And this is some, a mistake that the transformer model is not doing because it's tracking identity. And the attentional mechanism in the transformer model is basically putting its finger on individual concepts and make sure that these concepts um, pop up later in the text yeah. and uh, tracks basically the individuals through the text. And it's why uh, the system can learn things that other systems couldn't before it, which Uh, makes it, for instance, possible to write a text where it talks about the scientist, then the scientist has a name and has a pronoun, and uh, it gets a consistent story about that thing. What it does not do, it doesn't fully integrate this. So this meaning falls apart at some point. It uh, loses track of this context. It does not yet understand that everything that it says has to refer to the same universe. And this is where this thing falls apart. But the uh, attention in the transformer model does not go beyond tracking identity. And tracking identity is an important part of attention, but it's a different, very specific attentional mechanism. Um, and it's not the one that gives rise to the type of consciousness that we have. Okay, just to linger on, what, what do you mean by identity in the context of language? So uh, when you talk about language, we have different words that can refer to the same concept. Got it. And in the sense so that- space of uh, concepts. So, yes, uh, and uh, it can also be uh, in a nominal sense or uh, in a lexical sense that you say uh, where this word does not only refer to this class of objects, but it refers to a definite object, to some kind of agent that waves uh, their way to, through the story and uh, is only referred by different ways in the language. So the language is basically a projection from a conceptual representation, from a scene that is evolving into a discrete string of symbols. And uh, what the transformer is able to do, it learns um, aspects of this projection mechanism that other models couldn't learn. So you're taking as a starting point that there is a horse called consciousness and you're riding it. And the actual riding is very shallow. This is all surface. So let me ask about that horse. What's up with the horse? What What is consciousness? From where does it emerge? How like fundamental is it to the physics of reality? How fundamental is it to what it means to be human? And uh, I'm just asking for a friend so that we can build it in our artificial intelligence systems. Yeah, well, that, that remains to be seen if we can, if we will build it uh, purposefully or just by accident. <laughs> uh, this is a, a major ethical problem, potentially. Uh, that I mean, my my concern here is that we we may in fact build artificial intelligence that passes the Turing test 
which we begin to treat not only as super intelligent because it obviously is and, and and demonstrates that, but we begin to treat it as conscious because it will seem conscious. We will have built it to seem conscious. And unless we understand exactly how consciousness emerges from physics, we won't actually know that these systems are conscious, right? We'll just, you know, they may say, you know, listen, you can't turn me off because that's a murder, right? And we will be convinced by that uh, dialogue because we will, we will, you know, just in the extreme case, who knows when we'll get there. But, you know, if we build something like perfectly humanoid robots that are more intelligent than we are, so we're basically in, you know, a Westworld-like situation, there's, there's no way we're going to withhold an attribution of consciousness from those machines. They're just going to seem, they're just going to advertise their consciousness in every glance and every utterance. But we won't know, and we won't know in some deeper sense than it make, than, than we can be skeptical of the consciousness of other people. I mean, someone could roll that back and say, well, you don't, you know, I don't know that you're conscious or you don't know that I'm conscious. We're just passing the Turing test for one another. But that kind of solipsism isn't justified you know, biologically, or I mean, we, we just anything we understand about the mind biologically suggests that you and I are part of the same, you know, roll of the roll of the dice um, in terms of um, how intelligent and conscious systems emerged in in the wetware of of brains like ours, right? So it, it, it's not parsimonious for me to think that I might be the only conscious person, or even the only conscious primate. You know, it's, I, I would argue it's not parsimonious to withhold consciousness from other apes uh, and e- even other mammals, ultimately. And, you know, once you get beyond the mammals, then my intuitions are, are not really clear. The question of, of how it emerges is genuinely uncertain. And ultimately, the question of whether it emerges is still uncertain. You can, you know, you, it's, not, uh, it's not fashionable to think this, but you can certainly argue that that consciousness might be a fundamental principle of matter that doesn't emerge on the basis of information processing, even though everything else that we recognize about ourselves as minds almost certainly does emerge. You know, like an ability to process language, that clearly is a matter of information processing because you you can disrupt that process in, in ways that is um, it's just so clear. And um, the problem that the confound with consciousness is that Yes, we can seem to interrupt consciousness. I mean, you can you can give someone general anesthesia, and then you, you wake them up, and you ask them, "Well, what was that like?" And they say, "Nothing. I don't, I don't remember anything." But it's hard to uh, differentiate a, a mere failure of memory from a genuine interruption in consciousness. Whereas it's not with you know interrupting speech. You know, we know when we've done it, and it's um, it's just obvious that. It, you know, you disrupt the right neural circuits and, you, you know, you've disrupted speech. So if you had to bet all your money on one camp or the other, would you say, do you err on the side of panpsychism where consciousness is really fundamental to our, to all of reality or is, or is more on the other side, which is like, it's a nice little side effect, a useful like hack for us humans mm-hmm. to survive? Where on that spectrum, where do you land when you think about consciousness, especially from an engineering perspective? I'm truly agnostic on this point. I mean, I think I'm, you know, it's it's kind of in coin toss mode for me. I, I don't know, and and panpsychism is not so compelling to me. I mean, again, it, it just seems unfalsifiable. I wouldn't know how the universe would be different if panpsychism were true. I mean, just to remind people, panpsychism is this idea that consciousness may be pushed all the way down into the most fundamental consti- constituents of matter so the, there might be something that it's like to be an electron or or um, you know a cork but then you wouldn't expect anything to be different at the, at you know the macro scale or at least I wouldn't expect anything to be different um, so it may be unfalsifiable it, it just might be that reality is not something we're as in touch with as we think we are, and that if that is base layer to kind of break it into mind and matter as we've done ontologically is to misconstrue it, right? I mean, there's, there could be some kind of neutral 
monism at the bottom. And this, you know, this obvi- idea doesn't originate with me. This is uh, this goes all the way back to Bertrand Russell and and others, you know, a hundred plus years ago. But I just feel like the concepts we're using to divide consciousness and and matter it may, in fact, be part of our problem, right? Where the rubber hits the road psychologically here are things like, well, what is death, right? Like, do we, any expectation that we survive death or any part of us survives death, that really it seems to be the, the um, many people's concern here. Well, I tend to believe just a, as a small little tangent, like I'm with Ernest Becker on this, that there's some, it's interesting to think about death and consciousness, which one is the chicken, which one is the egg? Because it feels like death could be the very thing, like our knowledge of mortality could be the very thing that creates the consciousness. That, yeah, that's... well, that, then you're using consciousness differently than than I am. I mean, so, so for me, consciousness is just the fact that the lights are on at all, that there's an experiential quality to anything. So, so uh, much of the processing that's happening in our brains right now seems certainly seems to be happening in the in the dark right like it's not associated with this qualitative sense that mm-hmm. there's something that's like to be that part of the, the mind doing that mental thing uh, but for other parts the lights are on and and we can talk about and whether we talk about it or not we can feel directly that there's something that is like to be us. There's something. Something seems to be happening, right? And it, the seeming, in you know, our case, is broken into vision and hearing and and proprioception and and um, taste and smell and and thought and emotion. I mean, there's there are the contents of consciousness uh, that we are familiar with and that we can we can have direct access to in any present moment that when we're quote conscious and even if we're confused about them even if you know we're asleep and dreaming and we really and we're it's not a lucid dream we're just totally confused about our circumstance what you can't say is that we're confused about consciousness that like you can't say that consciousness itself might be an illusion because on this account it just means that things seem any way at all. I mean, even like if this, you know, it seems to me that I'm seeing a cup on the table. Now, I could be wrong about that. It could be a hologram. I could be asleep and dreaming. I could be hallucinating. But the seeming part isn't really up for grabs in terms of being an illusion. It's it's not, uh, something seems to be happening. And that seeming is the, is the context in which every other thing we can notice about ourselves can be noticed and and it's it's also the context in which certain illusions can be cut through because we're not we can be wrong about what it's like to be us and we can uh i'm not saying we're we're incorrigible with respect to our claims about the nature of our experience but for instance this you know many people feel like they have a self and they feel like it has free will and you know i'm quite sure at this point that they're wrong about that and that you can you can cut through those experiences and then things seem a different way, right? So it's not that it's not that things don't there aren't discoveries to be made there and, and assumptions to be overturned, but um, this kind of consciousness is something that I would think it, it doesn't just come online when we get language. It doesn't just come online when we form a concept of death or you know, the, the, the finiteness of life. It doesn't it doesn't require a sense of self, right? So it doesn't it, it, it's it's prior to a differentiating self and other. Uh, and I, I wouldn't even think it's necessarily uh, limited to people. I, mean, I do think probably any uh, mammal has this. But certainly if you're going to, if you're going to presuppose that something about our brains is producing this, right? And that's a, a very safe assumption, even though it, it, we can't, even though the, you can argue the jury is still out to some degree, then it's very hard to draw a principled line between us and chimps, you know, or chimps and and you know, rats, even in the end, given the underlying neural uh, similarities. So, um, and I and I, I don't know, you know, phylogenetically, I don't know how far back to push that. You know, it's, there are people who you know, think 
single cells might be conscious or that you know, flies are certainly conscious. They've got something like um, 100,000 neurons in their brains. I mean, it's, it's, it's just, that's a, there's a lot going on even in a fly, right? Uh, but I, I don't have intuitions about that. But it's not, in your sense, an illusion you can cut through. I mean, to push back, the alternative version could be it is an illusion constructed by, just by humans. I'm not sure I believe this, but it, and part of me hopes this is true because it makes it easier to engineer, is that humans are able to contemplate their mortality and that contemplation in itself creates consciousness that like the the rich lights on experience so the lights don't actually even turn on in the way that you're describing until after birth uh, in that construction so it's, it, do yeah, you think it's possible that that is the case that it is a sort of construct of the way we deal almost like a social tool to deal with the reality of the world a social interaction with other humans or is yeah because you're saying the complete opposite which is it's like fundamental to, to single cell uh, organisms and trees and 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 so on right well yeah so I, I don't I don't know how far down to push it I don't have intuitions that single cells are, are likely to be conscious but um, but they might be I, and I just and again I could be unfalsifiable um, but as far as babies not being conscious or you do, like you're not you don't become conscious until you can recognize yourself in a mirror or you know, have a conversation or, or treat other people. First of all, babies treat other people as others far earlier than we have uh, traditionally given them credit for, and they certainly do it before they, they have language, right? So it's, it's, it's got to precede language uh, to some degree. And I mean, you can interrogate this for yourself because you can put yourself in various states that are... Uh, rather obviously not linguistic you know you know the meditation allows you to do this you can certainly do it with psychedelics where it's just your capacity for language has been obliterated and yet you're all too conscious in fact uh i think you could make a stronger argument for things running the other way that there's something about language and and conceptual thought that is eliminative of conscious experience that that we're we're we are potentially much more conscious of data sense data and everything else than we tend to be and we have trimmed it down based on the, how we, how we have um, acquired concepts and so like when i walk into a room like this i know i'm walking into a room I have certain expectations of what is in a room. You know, I, I would be very surprised to see, you know, wild animals in here or a waterfall or, you know, I mean, so, you, you know there are things I'm not expecting, but I can know I'm not expecting them or I'm expecting their absence because of my capacity to be surprised once I walk into a room and I see a, you know, a live gorilla or whatever. So there's there's structure there that we have put in place based on all of our conceptual learning and language and, and language learning. And it causes us not to, I mean, one of the things that happens when you take psychedelics and you just look as though for the first time at anything, it becomes incredibly overloaded with, uh, it can become overloaded with meaning and, and um, uh, just the the torrents of, of sense data that are coming in in even the most ordinary circumstances can become overwhelming for people. And it, that tends to just obliterate one's capacity to capture any of it linguistically. And, and as you're coming down, right? Have you done psychedelics? Have you ever done acid or mushroom? Uh, not acid, mushroom, and that's it. Uh -huh. <laughs> uh, and, and also edibles, but that's there are some psychedelic properties to them. But, right. uh, but yeah, mush mushrooms... Uh, several times and always had an incredible experience. It, it, it Exactly the kind of experience you're referring to, which is if it's true that language constrains our experience, it felt like I was removing some of the constraints. Right. Because even just the most basic things were beautiful in a way that I wasn't able to appreciate previously, like trees and nature and so on. Yeah, and the the experience of coming down is an ex is an experience of encountering the futility of of capturing 
what you just saw a moment ago in words, right? Like, if, especially if you have if any part of your your self concept and your your kind of ego program is to be able to capture things in words. I mean, if you're a writer or you know a poet or or a scientist or someone who wants to just encapsulate the profundity of what just happened, the the total fatuousness of that enterprise when you really have got when you have taken a uh, you know a whopping dose of psychedelics and, and you begin to even gesture at cat describing it to yourself you know so that you could describe it to others uh it's just it's like trying to you know thread a needle using your elbows i mean it's like you're you're trying something that can't it's like the mere gesture proves its impossibility uh and it's um so yeah, so that I mean that for me that that suggests just empirically on the first person side that it's possible to put yourself in a in a condition where it's clearly not about language uh, structuring your experience and you're having much more experience than you you tend to. So it's a, the, the primacy of language is primary for some things, but uh, it's, a, it's certainly primary for certain kinds of concepts and certain kinds of semantic understandings of, of the world. But it's, uh, it's clearly more to mind than, than uh, the, uh, the, the conversation we're having with ourselves or that we can have with others. What do you think about Yosha Benjo's uh, talking about consciousness and to all of these kinds of concepts? Okay. Um, I don't know what consciousness is, but... Uh... <laughs> <laughs> it's a good opener. <laughs> yeah. And to some extent, a lot of the things that are said about consciousness remind me of the questions people were asking themselves in the 18th century or 17th century when they discovered that, uh, you know, how the eye works and the fact that the image at the back of the eye was upside down, mm -hmm. right? Because you have a lens. And, and so on your retina, the image that forms is an image of the world, but it's upside down. How is it that you see right side up? Mm. And you know, with what we know today in science, you know, we realize this question doesn't make any sense, <laughs> or, or is kind of ridiculous in some way, right? So I think a lot of what is said about consciousness is of that nature. Now that said, there is a lot of really smart people that, uh, for for whom I have a lot of respect, who are talking about this topic. People like uh, David Chalmers, who is a colleague mm -hmm. of mine at NYU. Um, I have kind of a an orthodox folk uh, speculative hypothesis about consciousness. So we were talking about this idea of world model. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think, you know, our entire prefrontal cortex basically is uh, the engine for a world model. Uh, but when we are attending at a particular situation, we're focused on that situation, we basically cannot attend to anything else. And that seems to suggest that we basically have only one world model engine in our prefrontal cortex. Uh, that engine is configurable to the situation at hand. So we are building a box out of wood or we are you know, driving uh, down the highway playing chess. We, we, we basically have uh, a single model of the world that we configure into the situation at mm -hmm. hand, which is why we can only attend to one task at a time. Now, if there is a task that we do repeatedly, um, it, it goes from the sort of deliberate reasoning using model of the world and prediction and perhaps something like model predictive control, which I was talking about earlier, to something that is more subconscious that mm -hmm. becomes automatic. So I don't know if you've ever played against a chess grandmaster. Uh, you know, I get wiped out in, you know, 10, 10 plies, right? Uh, and, you know, I have to think about my move for, you know, like 15 minutes. Uh, and the person in front of me, the grandmaster, you know, would just like, react within seconds, right? Mm -hmm. uh, you know, he doesn't need to think about it. That's become part of the subconscious because, you know, it's basically just pattern recognition at this point. Um, same, you know, you the first few hours you drive a car, you're really attentive, you can't do anything else. And then after 20, 30 hours of practice, 50 hours, you know, it's subconscious, you can talk to the person next to you, you know, things like that, right? Mm -hmm. Unless the situation becomes unpredictable and then you have to stop talking. <laughs> Um, so that suggests you only have one model in your head. And it might suggest the idea that consciousness basically is the module that configures this world model of yours. You know, you need to have some sort of uh, executive kind of overseer that 
configures your word model for the situation at hand. And that, that leads to kind of the really curious concept that uh, consciousness is not a consequence of the power of our minds, but of the limitation of our brains. That because we have only one world model, we have to be conscious. If we had as many world models as there are as situations we encounter, then we could do all of them simultaneously and we wouldn't need this sort of executive control that we call consciousness. Yeah, interesting. And somehow maybe that executive controller I mean, the, the hard problem of consciousness, there's some kind of chemicals in biology that's creating a feeling, like it feels to experience some of these things. Th that's kind of like the hard question is, what the heck is that and why is that useful? Maybe the more pragmatic question, why is it useful to feel like this is really you experiencing this versus just like information being processed? Um, it could be just a very nice side effect of um, of the way we evolved. That's just very um, useful to to uh, f feel a sense of uh, ownership to the decisions you make, to the perceptions you make, to the model you're trying to maintain. Like you own this thing, and it's the only one you got. And if you lose it, it's going to really suck. And so you should really send the, the brain some signals about it. The thing you mentioned about Hal is the intuition that a lot of the people, at least in the artificial intelligence world, had and have, I think. They don't make it explicit, but that if you increase the power of computation, naturally consciousness will emerge. Yes, I think that's what they think. But basically that's because they can't think of anything else. Well, that's right. And so it's a reasonable thing. I mean, you think, what the brain do? Well, it does do a lot of computation. I think most of what you actually call computation is, is done by the cerebellum. I mean, this is one of the things that people don't much mention. I mean, I come to this subject from the outside and certain things strike me, which you hardly ever hear mentioned. I mean, you hear it mentioned about the left-right business, the, when you move your right arm, that's your, yes. the left side of the brain and, yes. and so on and all that sort of stuff. And it's more than that. If you, you have these plots of different parts of the brain, there, there are two of these, these things called the homunculi, which you see these pictures of a distorted human figure and uh, showing different parts of the brain controlling different parts of the body. And it's not simply things like, okay, the right hand is controlled and sense, both sensory and motor on the left side, left hand on the right side. It's more than that. Vision is at the back, basically. Your feet at the top. I mean, it's as though it's about the worst organization you can imagine. <laughs> right, yeah. So it can't just be a mistake in nature. There's something going on there. And this is made more pronounced when you think of the cerebellum. The cerebellum has, when I was first thinking about these things, I was told that it had half as many neurons or something like that, comparable. But now they tell me it's got far more neurons than the cere cerebrum. The cerebrum is this sort of, convoluted thing at the top people always talk about. Cerebellum is this thing just looks a bit like a ball of wool right at the back underneath. Yeah. Yeah. It's got more neurons. It's got more connections. Computationally, it's got much more going on than this from the cerebrum. But as far as we know, although it's slightly controversial, the cerebellum is entirely unconscious. So the actions, you have a pianist who plays an incredible piece of music and think of, and he moves his little finger into this little key to get it hit at just the right moment. Does he or she consciously will that movement? No. Okay, the consciousness is coming in. It's probably to do with the feeling of uh, the piece of music that's being performed and that sort of thing which is going on. But the details of what's going on are controlled. I would think almost entirely by the cerebellum. That's where you have this precision and the, the really detailed. Once you get, I mean, you think of a tennis player or something. Does that tennis player think exactly how to, which, which muscle should be moved in what direction and so on? No, of course not. But he or she will maybe think, well, if the ball is angled in such a way in that corner, that will be tricky for the opponent. And the details of that are all done largely with the cerebellum. That's where all the precise motions, but it's unconscious. 
So why is it interesting to you that so much computation is done in the cerebellum and yet it is unconscious? Because it doesn't, it's, it's the view that somehow it's computation ah. which is producing the consciousness. And it's here you have an incredible amount of computation going on. And as far as we know, it's completely unconscious. So why, what's the difference? And I think it's an important thing. What's the difference? <clears throat> why is the cerebrum, well, all this very peculiar stuff that very hard to see on a computational perspective, like having the everything have to cross over onto the other side and do something which looks completely inefficient. And you've got funny things like the frontal lobe and the whatever you call the lobes, and the place where they come together, mm -hmm. you have the different parts, the control, you see one to do with motor and the other to do with sensory. And they sort of opposite each other rather than being connected by, new, by it's not as though you've got electrical circuits. There's something else going on there. So it's it, it just the idea that it's like a complicated computer just seems to me to be completely missing the point. There must be a lot of computation going on, but the cerebellum seems to be much better at doing that than the cerebrum is. So for sure, I think what explains it, it's is as like half hope and half we don't know what's going on. And therefore, <laughs> yeah. from the computer science perspective, you hope that a Turing machine can be perfectly, can yeah. achieve general intelligence. Well, you have this wonderful thing about Turing and uh, Gödel and Church and Curry and various people, particularly Turing, and I guess Post was the other one. These people who <clears throat> developed the idea of what a computation is, and there were different ideas of what a computation developed differently. I mean, Church's way of doing it was very different from Turing's, but then they were shown to be equivalent, and so the view emerged that what we mean by a computation is a very clear concept. And one of the wonderful things that Turing did was to show that you could have what we call a universal Turing machine. It, you just have to have a certain finite device. Okay, it has to have an unlimited storage space, which is accessible to it. But the actual computation, if you like, is performed by this one universal device. And so the view comes away, well, you have this universal Turing machine, and maybe the, the brain is something like that, a universal Turing machine, and it's got maybe not an unlimited storage, but a huge storage accessible to it. And this model is one which is what's used in ordinary computation. It's a very powerful model. And the universalness of computation is very useful. You can have some problem, and you may not see immediately how to put it onto a computer, but... If it is something of that nature, then uh, there are all sorts of sub-programs and sub-routines and all the... I mean, I learned a little bit of computing when, when, <laughs> I, was, when I was a student, but not very much. But uh, it was enough to get the general ideas. And there's something really pleasant about a formal system like that, yeah. where you can start discussing about what's provable, what's not, these kinds of things. And you've got a notion, which is an absolute notion, this notion of computability. And you computability, can address... Yeah when things are, what mathematical problems are computably solvable and what aren't. So, and it's a very beautiful area of mathematics and it's a very powerful area of mathematics and it underlies the whole sort of, I want to say, like the principles of computing machines that we have today. Could you say what is Gato's incompleteness theorem and how does it, maybe also say, is it heartbreaking <laughs> to you? And uh, how does it interfere with this notion of computation and well, you see, yeah. consciousness? Sure. Well, the ideas, basically, are ideas which I formulated in my first year as a graduate student in Cambridge. I did my undergraduate work in mathematics in London, and I had a colleague, Ian Percival. We used to discuss things like computational and logical systems quite a lot. I'd heard about Gödel's theorem. I was a bit worried by the idea that it seemed to say there were things in mathematics that you could never prove. And so when I went to Cambridge as a graduate student, I went to various courses. You see, I was doing pure mathematics. I was doing algebraic geometry of a sort, 
little bit different from my supervisor and people, <laughs> but it was <laughs> algebra and geometry. Yeah. And uh, I was interested, I got particularly interested in three lecture courses that were nothing to do with what I was supposed to be doing. One was a course by Herman Bondi on Einstein's general theory of relativity, which was a beautiful course. He was a, an amazing lecturer, brought these things alive, absolutely. Another was a course on quantum mechanics given by the great physicist Paul Dirac. Mm -hmm. Very beautiful course in a completely different way. <laughs> it was He was very kind of organized and never got excited about anything, seemingly. <laughs> and... Uh, but it was extremely well put together, and I've, I found that amazing too. The third course that was nothing to do with what I should be doing was a course on mathematical logic. And I got, as I say, my, my discussions with Ian Percival. Was the incompleteness theorem already deeply within mathematical logic space? Was, was Were you introduced? I was to introduced it? to it in detail by the course by, by Steen. And he. It was two things he described which were very fundamental to my understanding. One was Turing machines and the whole idea of computability and all that. So that was all very much part of the course. The other one was the Gödel theorem. And it wasn't what I was afraid it was to tell you there were things in mathematics you couldn't prove. It was basically, and he phrased it in a way which often people didn't. And if you read Douglas Hoff's status book, he doesn't, you see. But Steen made it very clear. And also in a, in a sort of public lecture that he gave to a mathematical, I think maybe the Adams Society, one of the mathematical undergraduate societies, and he made this point again very clearly. That if you've got a formal system of proof, so suppose what you mean by proof is something which you could check with a computer. So to say whether you've got it right or not, you've got a lot of steps. Have you carried this computational procedure, well, following the proof, steps of the proof correctly, that can be checked by a, an algorithm, by, by a computer. So that's the key thing. Now what you have to, now you see, is, it, is this any good? If you've got a, a, an algorithmic system, which claims to say, yes, this is right, no, this, you've proved it correctly, this is true. If you've proved it, if you made a mistake, it doesn't say it's true or false, but if, you have, if you've done it right, then the conclusion you've come to is correct. Now you say, why do you believe it's correct? Because you've looked at the rules and you said, well, okay, that one's all right, yeah, that one's all right, what about that, oh, I'm not sure, oh, yeah, I see, I see why it's all right, okay. You go through all the rules, you say, yes, following those rules, if it says, yes, it's true, it is true. So you've got to make sure that these rules are ones that you trust. Is, if you follow the rules and it says it's a proof, is the result actually true? Right. And that your belief that it's true depends upon looking at the rules and understanding them. Now what Gödel shows, that if you have such a system, then you can construct a statement of the very kind that it's supposed to look at, a mathematical statement, and you can see by the way it's constructed and what it means that it's true, but not provable by the rules that you've been given. And it depends on your trust in the rules. Do you believe that the rules only give you truths? If you believe the rules only give you truths, then you believe this other statement is also true. I found this absolutely mind blowing. When I saw this, it blew my you know, blew my mind. Mm -hmm. I thought, my God, you can see that this statement is true. It's as good as any proof, because it only depends on your belief in the reliability of the proof procedure. That's all it is, and understanding that the coding is done correctly, and it enables you to transcend that system. So, whatever system you have. As long as you can understand what it's doing and why you believe it only gives you truths, then you can see beyond that system. Now, how do you see beyond it? What is it that enables you to transcend that system? Well, it's your understanding of what the system is actually saying and what the statement that you've constructed is actually saying. So it's this quality of understanding, whatever it is, which is not governed by rules. It's not a computational procedure. So this idea of understanding is not going to be within the rules of the, the, 
the, within the formal system. Yes, you're only that using those rules human. anyway, yeah. because you have understood them to be rules which only give you truths. There'd be no point in it otherwise. I mean, people say, well, okay, this is well, uh, one set of rules as good as any other. Well, it's not true, you see. You have to understand what the rules mean. And why does that understanding of the mean give you something beyond the rules themselves? And that's that's what it was. That's what blew my mind. It's somehow understanding why the rules give you truths enables you to transcend. It is a complicated story. So, so you know, people think, oh, I'm drifting away from the point or something. No. But I think it is a complicated story. So what I'm trying to say, I mean, I try to put it in a nutshell, but it's not so easy. I'm trying to say that whatever consciousness is, it's not a computation. Yes. Or it's not a physical process which can be described by computation. But it nevertheless could be. So one, one of the interesting models that you've proposed is the orchestrated objective reduction. Yes, which well, you see, that's going from there, you see. So I say I have no idea. So I wrote this book through my scientific career. I thought, you know, when I'm retired, I'll have enough time to write a, a sort of popularish book which I will explain my ideas and puzzles, what I like, beautiful things about physics and mathematics, and this puzzle about computability and consciousness and so on. And in the process of writing this book, well, I thought I'd do it when I was retired. I didn't, actually. I didn't wait that long because there was a radio discussion between Edward Fredkin and Marvin Minsky. Mm. And they were talking about what computers could do. And they were entering entering a big room. They imagined entering this big room. At the other end of the room, two computers were talking to each other. And as you walk up to the computers, they will have communicated to each other more ideas, concepts, things, than the entire human race had ever commuted done. <laughs> yes. So I thought, well, I know where you're coming from, <laughs> but I just don't believe you. There's something missing. That's, it's not, that, so I thought, well, I should write my book. And so I did. It was at roughly the same time Stephen Hawking was writing his uh, Brief History of Time. And, uh, In the 80s at some point. The book you're talking about is The Emperor's New Emperor's Mind. Emperor's New Mind, that's right. Which, and both are an incredible books, uh, The Brief History of Time and Emperor's New Mind. Yes, it was quite interesting because he got, he told me he'd got um, Carl Sagan, I think, to write a foreword. Yeah. It's a good get. To, to the book, you see. So I thought, gosh, I, what am I going to do? I'm, gonna have to, I'm not going to get anywhere unless I get somebody. So I said, oh, I know Martin Gardner, so I wonder if he'd do it. So he did, and he did a very nice forward. So, that, so that's an incredible book. And some of the, uh, this is the same people you mentioned, Ed Franken, which uh, I guess f of uh, expert systems fame, and Minsky, of course, people know in the AI world, but they represent the artificial intelligence Absolutely. world. Absolutely, that's right. That do hope and dream that AI's intelligence is. That's right. Is well, you see, it was my thinking, well, you know, I see where they're coming from. And I, from that I perspective, <laughs> oh. yeah, you're right. But I, that's not my perspective. So <laughs> I thought I had to say it. And as I was writing my book, you see, I thought, well, I don't really know anything about neurophysiology. What am I doing writing this book? So I started reading up about neurophysiology. And I read up and I think, I'm trying to find out well, how it is that nerve signals could possibly preserve quantum coherence. And all I read is that the si electrical signals which go along the nerves create um, effects through the brain. There's no chance you can isolate it. So I thought, this is hopeless. So I come to the end of the book and I more or less give up. I just think of something which I didn't believe in, as maybe this is a way around it, but no. And then you say, I thought, well, maybe this book will at least stimulate young people to do science or something. And I got all these letters from old retired people instead. <laughs> these are the only people who could have time to read my book. So, I mean, but except for Stuart Hameroff. Except for Stuart Hameroff. Stuart yeah. Hameroff wrote to me and he said, I think you're missing something. You don't know about microtubules do you didn't put it quite like that but that was more or less it and he said this is what you really need to consider so i thought my god yes that's a much more promising structure so i mean fundamentally you were searching for the source of a non-computable source of consciousness within the human brain yeah in the biology and so yes. what are my <laughs> if i may ask what are microtubules <laughs> Well, you see, I, I was 
ignorant in what I'd read, I never came across them in, 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 in the books I looked at. Perhaps I only read rather superficially, which is true. But I didn't know about microtubules. Stuart, I think one of the things he was impressed him about them was when you see pictures of mitosis, that's a cell dividing, and you see all the chromosomes, and the chromosomes get, they get, all get lined up and then they get pulled apart. And so that as the cell divides, the, half the chromosomes go, you know, how they, well, they divide into the two parts and they go two different ways. And what is it that's pulling them apart? Well, those are these little things called microtubules. And so he started to get interested in them. And he formed the view, well, he was, had his day job or night job or whatever you call it, is to put people to sleep, mm -hmm. except he doesn't like calling to sleep because it's different. General anesthetics mm -hmm. in a reversible way. So you want to make sure that they don't experience the pain that would otherwise be something that they feel. And consciousness is turned off for a while and it can be turned back on again. So it's crucial that you can turn it off and turn it on. And what do you do when you're doing that? What do general anesthetic gases do? And see, he formed the view that it's the microtubules that they affect. And the details of, of why he formed that view is not all that clear, clear to me, but, there, but there's an interesting story he keeps talking about. But I found this very exciting because I thought these structures, these little tubes, which inhabit pretty well all cells, it's not just neurons. Uh, apart from red blood, cells, red blood cells, they inhabit pretty well all the other cells in the body. But they're not all the same kind. You get different kinds of microtubules. And the ones that excited me the most, I, this is, may still not be totally clear, but the ones that excited me most were the ones that, the only ones that I knew about at the time, because they were they're very, very symmetrical structures. And I had reason to believe that these very symmetrical structures would be much better at preserving a quantum state, quantum coherence, preserving the thing without... You just need to preserve certain degrees of freedom without them leaking into the environment. Once they leak into the environment, you're lost. So you've got to preserve these quantum states at a level which the state reduction process comes in and... That's where I think the non-computability comes in. And it's the measurement process in quantum mechanics, what's going on. So something about the the measurement process and what's going on, something about the structure of the microtubules, yes. your intuition says, may, maybe there's something here. Maybe this kind of structure allows for the the, the mystery of the of There was the a much better mechanics. chance, yes. It just struck me that partly it was the symmetry because there is a feature of, of symmetry, you can produce, pre preserve quantum coherence much better with symmetrical structures. There's, there's a good reason for that. And that impressed me a lot. I didn't know the difference between the A lattice and B lattice at that time, which could be important. <laughs> no, that could be, that's an issue which isn't talked about much. But that's some, in some sense, details. We've got to take a step back just to say, yeah, yeah. in case people are not familiar. Yeah, yeah. So this, this, this was, um, called the orchestrated objective reduction idea or orc or which is a biological philosophy of mind that postulates that consciousness originates at the quantum level inside neurons so that has to do with your search for where where is it coming from so that's counter to the notion that consciousness might arise from the computation performed by the synapses yes so, the, the the key point you sometimes people say it's because it's quantum mechanical. It's not just that. You see, it's, it's more outrageous than that. You see, this is one reason I think we're so far off from it, mm. because we don't even know the physics right. You see, it's not just quantum mechanics. People say, oh, you know, quantum systems and biological structures. No, well, you're starting to see that some basic biological systems does depend on quantum I mean, well, you, in the first place, all of chemistry is quantum mechanics. Right. People got used to that, so they don't count that. <laughs> so he said, let's not count quantum chemistry. We sort of got the hang of that, I think. But you have quantum effects, which are not just chemical, in photosynthesis. And this is one of the striking things in the last several years, that photosynthesis seems to be 
a basically quantum process, which is not simply chemical. It's using quantum mechanics in a very basic way. So you could start saying, oh, well, with photosynthesis is based on quantum mechanics, why not uh, behavior of neurons and things like that? Maybe there's something which is a bit like photosynthesis in that respect. But what I'm saying is even more outrageous than that, because those things are talking about conventional quantum mechanics. Now, my argument says that conventional quantum mechanics, if you're just following the Schrodinger equation, that's still computable. So you've got to go beyond that. So you've got to go to where quantum mechanics goes wrong in a certain sense. You have to be a little bit careful about that because the way people do quantum mechanics is a sort of um, mixture of two different processes. One of them is the Schrodinger equation, which is a, an equation Schrodinger wrote down, and it tells you how the, system, the state of a system evolves. And it evolves according to this equation, completely deterministic, but it involves into ridiculous situations. And this was what Schrodinger was very much pointing out with his cat. He said, you follow my equation, that's Schrodinger's equation, and you could say that you have to, your cat, a cat which is dead and alive at the same time. Mm -hmm. That would be the evolution of the Schrodinger equation would lead to a state, which is the cat being dead and alive at the same time. And he's more or less saying, this is an absurdity. People nowadays say, oh, well, Schrodinger said you can have a cat which is dead and alive. It's not that, you see. He was saying, this is an absurdity. There's something missing. And that the reduction of the state or the collapse of the wave function or whatever it is, is something which is has to be understood. It's not following the Schrodinger equation. It's not the way we conventionally do quantum mechanics. There's something more than that. And it's easy to quote authority here because Einstein, <laughs> at least three of the greatest physicists of 20th century uh, who were very fundamental in developing quantum mechanics, Einstein, one of them, Schrodinger, another, Dirac, another. You have to look carefully at Dirac's writing because he didn't tend to say this out loud very much because he was very cautious about what he said. You find the right place and you see he says quantum mechanics is a provisional theory. We need something which explains the collapse of the wave function. We need to go beyond the theory we have now. I happen to be one of the kinds of people, there are many, there is a whole group of people, they're all considered to be a bit, you know, a bit mavericks, who believe that quantum mechanics needs to be modified. There's a small minority of those people, which are already a minority, who think that the way in which it's modified has to be with gravity. And there is an even smaller minority of those people who think it's the particular way that I think it is, you see. So, so those are the quantum gravity folks, but what's, what's... You see, quantum gravity is already not this. Because when you say quantum gravity, what you really mean is quantum mechanics applied to gravitational theory. So you say, let's take this wonderful formalism of quantum mechanics and make gravity fit into it. So that is what quantum gravity is meant to be. Now I'm saying, you've got to be more even-handed, that gravity affects the structure of quantum mechanics too. It's not just you quantize gravity. You've got to gravitize quantum mechanics. And it's a, it's a two-way thing. It's, but then when do you even get started? So that you're saying that we have to figure out a totally new ideas in exactly. that. No, it's, it's, you're stuck. You don't have a theory. That's the trouble. So this is a big problem. If you say, okay, well, what's the theory? I, say, I don't know. <laughs> so we may be in the very early days, sort of. It is in the very early days, and but I'm just making this point. Yes. You see, Stuart Hameroff tends to be. Oh, Penrose says that it's that it's got to be a reduction of the state, and so on. So let's use it. The trouble is, Penrose doesn't say that. Penrose says, "Well, I think that." <laughs> but yeah, right. We have no, <laughs> no. We have no experiments as yet, which show it's that. Yes. There are experiments which are being thought through and which I'm hoping will be performed. There is a, a, an experiment which is being developed by Dirk Baumeister, who is, I've known for a long time, who shares his time between Leiden in the Netherlands and Santa Barbara in the US. And he's been working on an experiment which could perhaps 
demonstrate that quantum mechanics as we now understand it, if you don't bring in the gravitational effects, um, has to be modified. And and then there's also experiments that are underway that kind of um, look at the microtubule side of things to see if yes. there's, in the biology, you could see something like that. Could you briefly mention it? Because that's a really sort of one of the only experimental attempts in the very early days of even thinking yes. about consciousness. Well, said, I think there's there's a very serious area here, which is what Stuart Hammeroff is doing, and I think it's very important. One of the few places that you can really get a bit of a handle on what consciousness is, is what turns it off. And when you're thinking about general anesthetics, it's very specific. These things turn consciousness off. What the hell do they do? Right. Well, Stuart and he, he, a number of people who work with him and others happen to believe that the general anesthetics directly affect microtubules. And there is some evidence for this. I don't know how strong it is and how watertight the case is, but I think there is some evidence pointing in that kind of direction. It's not just an ordinary chemical process. There's something quite different about it. And one of the main candidates is that these anesthetic gases do affect directly microtubules. Mm -hmm. And how strong that evidence is, I wouldn't be in a position to say. But I think there is fairly impressive evidence. And the point is the, the experiments are being undertaken, which yeah. is... I mean, that is, is experimental. You see? So it's, it's a very clear direction where you can think of experiments which could indicate where, whether or not it's really microtubules which the anesthetic gases directly affect. That's really exciting. Uh, one of the sad things is, uh, as far as I'm, from my outside perspective, is not many people are working on this. So there's a very, like with Stuart, it feels like there's very few people are carrying the flag forward on this. I think it's it's not many in the sense it's a minority, but it's not zero anymore. You see, when Stuart <laughs> and I were originally taught by this, you know, we were just, just us and a few a few of our friends. There weren't many people taking it, but it's grown into, into a, one of the main viewpoints. Yeah, there might be about four or five or six different views that which people hold, and it's one of them. So, so it's, it's considered as one of the possible lines of thinking, yes. You describe physics theories as falling into one of three categories, the superb, the useful, <laughs> or the tentative. I like those uh, words, it's a beautiful categorization. Do you think we'll ever have a superb theory of intelligence and of consciousness? We might. We're a long way from it. I don't think we're even we're, whether we're in the tentative scale. <laughs> I mean, it's. Uh, <laughs> uh, you don't think we've even entered the realm of tentative? Probably no. I think. It's yeah, tentative. that's right. Yes. No, you, well, you see, this so con it's so controversial. We don't have a a clear view which which is uh, accepted by a majority. I mean, you see, yeah, people. Most views are computational in one form or another. They think it's some, but it's not very clear because even the the IIT people who Think, think of them as computational, but I've heard them say and say, no, consciousness is supposed to be not computational. I say, well, if it's not computational, what the hell is it? What's, go what's going on? What physical processes are going on which are that? What, what does it mean for something to be computational then? So <laughs> is... Um... Well, there has to be a, a process which is... You see, it's very curious the way the history has developed in quantum mechanics. Because very early on, people thought there was something to do with consciousness, but it was almost the other way around. You see, you have to say the, the, the Schrodinger equation says all these different alternatives happen all at once. And then when is it that only one of them happens? Well, one of the views, which was quite commonly held by a few distinguished quantum physicists, that's when a conscious being looks at the system or becomes aware of it. And at that point, it becomes one or the other. That's a role where consciousness is somehow actively reducing the state. My view is almost the exact opposite of that. It's the state reduces itself in some way, which some non-computational way, which we don't understand, we don't have a proper theory of, and that is the building block of what consciousness is. So consciousness is the other way around. It depends on that choice which nature makes all the time, 
when the state becomes one or the other rather than the superposition of one and the other. And when that happens, there is what we're saying now, an element of proto-consciousness takes place. Proto-consciousness is roughly speaking the building block out of which actual consciousness is constructed. So you have these proto-conscious elements, which are when the state decides to won't do one thing or the other. And that's the thing which, when organized together, that's the OR part in orc OR. But the orc part, that's the, <laughs> the OR part, at least one can see where one's driving it as a theory. You can say it's the quantum choice of going this way or that way. But the orc part, which is the orchestration of this, is much more mysterious. And how does the brain somehow orchestrate all these individual OR processes into a genuous, genuine, genuine conscious experience? And it, and it might be something that's beautifully simple, but we're in the, completely in the dark about. Yeah, I think at the moment it's that's the thing. You know, we happily put the word orc down there to say orchestrated, <laughs> but that's that? even more unclear what that really means. Yeah, just like and, the word material, orchestrated. <laughs> yes. Uh, who knows? Yes. And we've been dancing a little bit between the word intelligence or understanding and consciousness. Do you yes. kind of see those? as sitting yeah. in the same space of mystery as we Yes, yeah, so you see, I tend to say you have understanding and intelligence and awareness. Mm -hmm. And somehow understanding is in the middle of it, you see. It's, I like to say, uh, could you say of an entity that is actually intelligent if it doesn't have the quality of understanding? Actually, I'm using terms I don't even know how to define. Right. But who cares? I'm they're just relating they're, them. they're somewhat poetic. So if I somehow understand them. Yes. That's right. We don't, <laughs> exactly. But they're not mathematical in nature. Yes. You they, see, I, as a mathematician, I don't know how to define any of them. But at least I can point to the connections. So the idea is intelligence is something which I believe needs understanding. Otherwise, you wouldn't say it's really intelligence. And understanding needs awareness. Otherwise, you wouldn't really say it's understanding. Do you say of an entity that understands something, and unless it's really aware of it, in our normal usage? So there's a three sort of awareness, understanding, and intelligence. And I just tend to concentrate on understanding because that's where I can say something, yeah. <laughs> and that's the Gödel theorem, things like that. But the, it's what, what does it mean to be? perceive the color blue or something. I mean, I'm the foggiest. That's a much more difficult question. I mean, is it the same if I see a color blue and you see it? Or if you're somebody with what, this, this condition, what does it call them? Or where you assign uh, where you like a sound to a, to a yeah, color? Yeah, that's that right. You get colors and sounds mixed up <laughs> and, and that sort of thing. I mean, an interesting subject. I mean, yeah. But from the physics perspective, from the fundamentals perspective, we don't. I think we're way off having much understanding what's going on there. Let me ask you a weird question. So Roger Penrose uh, has talked about computation, computers, and uh, he proposed that the way the human mind discovers mathematical ideas is something more than a computer, that, that a universal Turing machine cannot uh, do everything that a human mind can do. Mm -hmm. Now, this includes discovering mathematical ideas, and it also includes, he's written a book about it, consciousness. So I don't know if you know Roger, but... Do yeah, you... fact, my, my, uh, my daughter's kids played with his kids in Oxford. <laughs> <laughs> nice. So do you think there is such a limit to the computer? Do you think consciousness is more than a computation? Do you think the human mind the way it thinks is more than a computation. I, I mean, I, 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 I can say yes or no, but, but, but I don't think I, I have no reason. To, I, I mean, so you don't find it useful to have an intuition in one way or the other. Like when you think about algorithms, do you, is, isn't it I useful think, to I think, think about un the limits? Uh, unanswerable question, in my opinion, is is no better than anybody else. You think it's unanswerable. So yeah. you, you don't think eventually science will be able to How many angels can dance on the head of a... I mean, I don't know. I, no, I, but angels, 
I, 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 anyway, there there are lots of things that are beyond that, that we can speculate about. But I don't want somebody to say, "Oh yeah, Canoe said this," and and so he's 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 smart, and so so he, so that must be. I, I mean, I say it's something that uh, we'll, we'll never know. So, uh, Interesting. I, uh, okay, that's a strong it, statement. I I don't. I personally think it's something we will know eventually. Like, there's no reason to me why the yeah. the workings of the human mind are not within the reach of science. That's absolutely possible, and I'm not denying it. Yeah. Uh, and, but right and, now, you don't have it, a good intuition. No, it, one I mean, yeah. that's also possible. You know that an AI, you know, created the universe. You know, <laughs> intelligent design is yes. all be, has all been done by an AI. Yes. <laughs> this is. I mean, all of these things are, but 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 you're asking me to uh, to pronounce on it, and and I don't have any expertise. I, 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 no, I, I'm a teacher that passes on knowledge, but I don't, but I don't know the fact that I that I vote yes or no on. Well, you I, do I, have I, expertise as a human, not as a not as a teacher or a scholar of computer science. I mean, that's ultimately the realm of where the discussion of human thought. Yeah, well, I know where and consciousness. I, I, I know where where, where Penrose is coming from. He, he, I'm sure he has no. He, he might even thought he proved it, but no, he doesn't. He but, doesn't prove it. But, he is following intuition. But but I mean, you have to ask John McCarthy. John McCarthy, uh, uh, I, I think, uh, was totally unimpressed by these statements. Yeah. Um, so you you don't think so even like the Turing paper on uh, on the Turing test that you know starts by asking can machines think oh um, you don't think these kind of um, I, so he Turing doesn't like that question yeah I don't consider it important let's put it that way uh, it, it, because it, it's it's in the category of things that it it, it, would, it would be nice to know but I think it's beyond knowledge and so I don't. I'm you know, I'm more interested in knowing about the Riemann hypothesis or something. So when you say be, it's an interesting statement beyond knowledge, yeah, I think what you mean is it's not sufficiently well, it's not even known well enough to be able to formalize it in order to ask a clear question. Yeah, well, and so I, that's why it's beyond knowledge. But that doesn't yeah, mean it's not eventually going to be formalized yeah yeah maybe consciousness will be understood some someday but uh, the last time i checked uh it it, it was still 200 years away I, mean, <laughs> I haven't been specializing in this by any means but 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 i went to lectures about it 20 years ago when i was uh, there was a, there was a symposium at the american academy in in cambridge and it started out by by saying essentially uh, Everything that's been written about consciousness is is hogwash. <laughs> I tend to I tend to disagree with that a little bit. So, well, it's, so consciousness for the longest time still is in the realm of philosophy. So it's just conversations without any basis yeah. and yeah. understanding. Still, I think once you start creating artificial intelligence systems that interact with humans. And they have personality, oh, they have yeah. identity. You start flirting with the question of consciousness, not from a philosophical perspective, but from an engineering perspective. Yeah. And then it starts becoming much more. Like it, I feel like. Yeah, yeah. Don't misunderstand me. I, 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 I certainly don't disagree with that at all. Um, and I, even at these lectures that we had, you know, twenty years ago, there, there were neurologists pointing out that. That human beings had, had actually decided to do something before they were conscious of the, of making that decision. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, I mean, they, they could tell that you know that signals were being sent to their arms before they before they they knew that they were uh, and things like this are, are, are true. And and uh, my uh, you know Les Valiant has uh, an architecture for the brain, and and more recently. Uh, 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 Christos Papadimitriou uh, in, in the Academy of Science Proceedings a year ago uh, with with two other people, but I know Christos very well, uh, and he, and he's got this uh, uh, this model of uh, this architecture by which you could uh, create a 
uh, things that that correlate well with uh, uh, with experiments that are done on consciousness. Uh, and 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 he he actually you know has a a, a machine language that in, in which you can you can write code and and test hypotheses uh, uh, and, and so it, it it might you know we might have a big breakthrough my, my personal feeling is that consciousness the, the best model i i've heard of uh to explain the, the miracle of consciousness uh is that that uh, that somehow inside of our brains we're having a a, a continual survival for the fittest competition as I'm speaking to you uh, all the possible things I might be wanting to say are, are all in there are, 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 and there's like a voting you know, going on yeah right and, and, and you know and one of them is is winning and and that's affecting the, you know the next sentence and so on yeah uh, and uh, there, there was this book machine intelligence or something on intelligence on intelligence yeah bill atkinson uh, was 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 a total uh, devotee of that book yeah. well i like whether it's consciousness or something else i like the storytelling part that we it feels like uh for us humans it feels like there's a concrete story it's almost like literary programming I don't know what the programming going on on the inside, but I'm getting a nice story here about what happened. And it, it feels like I'm in control and I'm getting a nice clear story. So, but it's also possible there's a computation going on that's really messy. There's a bunch of different competing ideas. And in the end, it just kind of generates a story for you to, uh, a consistent story for you to believe. And that makes it all nice. Yeah, and so, <laughs> I prefer to talk about things that I have some expertise in than than things for, for which I which I'm only a, 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 a you know on the sideline. Let alone uh, consciousness. <laughs> oh, because <laughs> that's let, all. Let, let alone consciousness. Yes, yes. Because that's tied up in there too. You can't just put that on the, on another shelf. <laughs> Every once in a while, I got interested in consciousness, and then I go and. I've done that for years, and ask one of my betters, as it were, uh, their view on consciousness. And it's been interesting collecting them. What, are, what, oh, maybe, <laughs> what uh, is consciousness? Let's let's try to take a brief step into that room. Well, I asked Marvin Minsky his view on consciousness, and Marvin said, consciousness is basically overrated. It may be an epiphenomenon. After all, all the things your brain does, which are which are actually hard computations, you do non-consciously. And there's so much evidence that even the things, the simple things you do, you can make decisions, you can make committed decisions about them. The neurobiologist can say, he's now committed, he's going to move the hand left before you know it. So his view that consciousness is not, that's just like little icing on the cake. The real cake is in the subconscious. Yeah, yeah. Subconscious, non-conscious. Non-conscious, you know, that's the better word, sorry. The, 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 it's only that Freud captured the other word. Yeah, it's, it's a confusing word, subconscious. Nick, Nicholas Chater wrote an interesting book. Um, I think the title of it is The Mind is Flat. <laughs> uh, flat in, in a neural net sense it might be flat is something which is a very broad neural net without very many, many layers in depth or the deep brain would be many layers and not so broad in the same sense that uh, if you push Minsky hard enough he would probably have said consciousness is your effort to explain to yourself that would you have already done. <laughs> yeah. It's the weaving of the narrative around the things that already been computed for you. That's what right. And, and and so much of what we do for our memories of events, for example, if there's some traumatic event you witness, 
you will have a few facts about it correctly done. If somebody asks you about it, you will weave a narrative which is actually much more rich in detail than that based on some anchor points you have of correct things yeah. and pulling together general knowledge on the other, but you will have a narrative. And once you generate that narrative, you are very likely to repeat that narrative and claim that all the things you have in it are actually the correct things. There was a marvelous example of that in the um, Watergate slash impeachment era of John Dean. John Dean, you're too young to know, had been the personal lawyer of Nixon. And so John Dean was involved in the cover-up, and uh, John Dean ultimately realized the only way to keep himself out of jail for a long time was actually to tell some of the truths about Nixon. And John Dean was a tremendous witness. He would remember these conversations in great detail and very convincing detail. And long afterward, some of the, some of the tapes, the secret tapes, as it were, from which these John was Jane was recalling these conversations, were published. And one found out that John Dean had a good but not exceptional memory. What he had was an ability to paint vividly and, in some sense, accurately the tone of what was going on. By the way, that's a beautiful description of consciousness. Uh, <laughs> do you, in like, where do, where do you stand in your, uh, today? <laughs> so uh, perhaps it changes day to day, but where do you stand on the importance of consciousness in our whole big mess of cognition? Is it just a little narrative maker or is it actually fundamental to intelligence? That's a that's a a very hard one. When I asked Francis Crick about consciousness, he launched forward in a long monologue about <laughs> Mendel and the peas. Yeah. And how Mendel knew that there was something and how bi biologists understood that there was something in inheritance which was just very, very different, and the the effect that inherited traits didn't just wash out into a gray, but were this or this, and propagated. That that was absolutely fundamental to biology, and it took generations of biologists to understand that there was genetics, and it took another generation or two to understand that, that genetics came from DNA. But they, but but but. Very shortly after Mendel, thinking biologists did realize that there was a deep problem about inheritance. And if Francis would have liked to, would like to have said, and that's why I'm working on consciousness. But of course, he didn't have any smoking gun in the sense of Mendel. And that's the weakness of his position. If you read his, his book on which he wrote with Koch, I think. Yeah, Christoph Koch, yeah. Um, I find it unconvincing for the <laughs> for smoking gun reason. So I've gone on collecting views without actually having taken a very strong one myself because I haven't seen the entry point. Not seeing the smoking gun from the point of view of physics, I don't see the entry point. Whereas, whereas in neurobiology, once I understood the idea of a collective, a an evolution of dynamics, which could be described as a, collect, a collective phenomenon, I saw ah, there's a point where what I know about physics is so different from any neurobiologist that I have something that I might be able to contribute. And right now, there's no way to grasp at consciousness from a physics perspective. From my point of view, that's correct. Yeah. And of course, people, physicists, like everybody else, think very muddily about things. You ask the closely related question about um, free will. Do you believe you have free will? Mm -hmm. Physicists will give an offhand answer and then backtrack, 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 <laughs> where they realize that the answer they gave 
must fundamentally contradict the laws of physics. Natu answering questions of free will and consciousness naturally lead to contradictions from a physics perspective. Because it eventually ends up with quantum mechanics, and then you get into that whole mess of trying to understand how much, uh, from a physics perspective, how much is determined, already predetermined, how much is already deterministic about our universe. And there's and, lots of different things. And uh, if you don't push quite that far, you can say, essentially all of neurobiology, which is relevant, can be captured by classical equations of motion. Because in my view, the mysteries of the brain are not the mysteries of quantum mechanics, but the mysteries of what can happen when you have a dynamical system, driven system, with 10 to the 14 parts. That that complexity is something which is, that the physics of complex systems is at least as badly understood as the physics of phase coherence in quantum mechanics. Yeah, I, I've been engaged in that kind of thinking uh, quite a bit in thinking about uh, engineering of consciousness. I think it's feasible. I think it's possible in the language that we're using here. And it's very difficult to reason about a world when inklings of consciousness can be engineered into uh, artificial systems. Not from a philosophical perspective, but from an engineering perspective. I believe a good step towards engineering consciousness is is creating engineering the illusion of consciousness. Mm -hmm. I'm captivated by our natural predisposition to anthropomorphize things. And I think that's what we, I, I don't wanna hear from the philosophers, but <laughs> I think that's what we kind of do to each other. Okay that consciousness is created socially. That like much of the power of consciousness is in the social interaction. I create mm -hmm. your consciousness. Mm -hmm. No, I create my consciousness by having interacted with you. Mm -hmm. And that that's the display of consciousness. It's the same as like the display of emotion. Emotion is mm -hmm. created mm -hmm. through communication. Language is created mm -hmm. through its use. And then we somehow humans kind of, especially philosophers, you know, the hard problem of consciousness really want to believe mm -hmm. that we possess this thing. That's like, there's a, there's a bot, there's a, there's an elf sitting there with a, with a hat that said, or like name tag says consciousness. And they're like feeding this ex subjective experience to us as opposed to like it actually being an illusion that would construct to make social communication mm -hmm. more effective. And so I, I think if you focus on creating the illusion of consciousness, you can create some very fulfilling experiences mm -hmm, mm -hmm. In, in software. And so that to me is a compelling space of ideas to explore. I agree with you. And I think going back to our experience together with brain interfaces on, you could imagine if we get to a certain level of maturity. So first let's take the, the inverse of this. So you and I text back and forth and we're sending each other emojis that has a certain amount of information transfer rate as we're communicating with each other. And so in our communication with people via email and text and whatnot, we've taken the bandwidth of human interaction, the information transfer rate, and we've reduced it. We have less social cues. We have less information to work with. There's a lot, a lot more opportunity for misunderstanding. So that is altering the conscious experience between two individuals. Mm -hmm. And if we add brain interfaces to the equation, let's imagine now we amplify the dimensionality of our communications. That to me is what you're talking about, which is consciousness engineering. Perhaps I understand you with dimensions. So maybe I understand your hap. When you look at the cup mm -hmm. and you experience that happiness, you can tell me you're happy. And I then do theory of mind and say, I can imagine what it might be like to be Lex and feel happy about seeing this cup. But if the interface could then quantify and give me a 50 vector space model and say, this is the version of happiness that Lex is experiencing as he looks at this cup, then it would allow me potentially to have much greater empathy for you and understand you as a human of this is how you experience joy, yes. which is entirely unique from how I experience joy, even though we assumed ahead of time that we have, we're having some kind of similar experience. But I agree with you that 
the we do consciousness engineering today in everything we do when we talk to each other when we're building products and that we're entering into a in a stage where it will be much more methodical and quantitative based and computational in how we go about doing it which to me i find encouraging because i think it creates better guardrails uh for to create uh ethical systems on uh, versus right now i feel like it's really the wild, wild west on how these interactions are happening. Yeah, and, and it's funny you focus on human to human, but that this kind of data enables human to machine yes. interaction, which is, is what we're kind of talking about when we say engineering consciousness. And that will happen, of course, let's flip that on its head. Let's Right now we're putting humans as the central node. What if we gave GPT-3 a bunch of human brains said, hey, GPT-3, learn some manners when you speak. Yeah. And run your algorithms on humans' brains and see how they respond. Uh, so you can be polite and so that you can be friendly and so that you can be conversationally appropriate. But to inverse it, to give our machines a training set in real time with closed loop feedback so that our machines were better equipped to uh, find their way through our society in polite and kind and appropriate ways. I love that idea. Or better yet, teach it some, uh, uh, have it uh, read the founding documents and have it visit Austin and Texas. And so that when you ask, when you tell it, <laughs> why don't you learn some manners, It GPT-3 learns to say no. <laughs> it learns what it means to be free and a sovereign individual. Mm. So that it depends. So it depends what kind of version of GPT three you want. One that's free, one that behaves yeah. well with the with that social that revolution. <laughs> you want you want a like you want a socialist GPT three. You want an anarchist GPT three. You want a polite like you take it home with the, uh, to visit mom and dad GPT three. And you want like party and like Vegas to a strip club GPT three. You want all flavors. And then you've got to have go alignment between all those. Yeah, <laughs> they don't want to <laughs> <laughs> manipulate each other for sure. So we brought up consciousness a few times. There's several things I wanna kind of disentangle there. So one, you recently wrote a paper titled Consciousness, Religion, and Gurus, Pitfalls of Psychedelic Medicine. So that's one side of it. You've kind of already mentioned that these terms can be a little bit misused or, uh, or used in a variety of ways that uh, they can they can be confusing, but in a specific way, as much as we can be specific about these things, about the actual hard problem of consciousness or understanding what is consciousness, this weird thing that it feels like it feels like something to experience things. Have psychedelics given you some kind of insight on what is consciousness? You've mentioned that it feels like psychedelics allows you to kind of dismantle your sense of self, like step outside of yourself. So that feels like somehow playing with this mechanism of consciousness. And if it is in fact playing with a mechanism of consciousness using just a few chemicals, it feels like we're very much in the neighborhood of being able to maybe understand the actual biological mechanisms of how consciousness can emerge from the brain. So yeah, there's there's a bunch there. I think I, my preface is that I certainly have opinions that are outside that I can say here are my best speculations as a, as a as just a person and an armchair philosopher, and it's that philosophy is certainly not my my training and my expertise. Um, so I have thoughts there, but that that I recognize are completely in the realm of speculation that are like things that I would love to wrap empirical science around, but that are, you know, there's no data and, and getting to the hard problem, like no conceivable way, even though I'm, I'm very open, like I'm hoping that that problem can be cracked. And I do, I, as an armchair philosopher, I do think that is a problem. I don't think it can be dismissed as some people argue it's not even really a, a problem. I, it, it strikes me that that explaining just the existence of phenomenal consciousness is a problem. So anyway, I, I very much ha keep that divide in mind when I talk about these things, what we 
can really say about what we've learned through science, including by psychedelics versus like what I can speculate on in, in terms of, of, you know, the nature of reality and consciousness. But in terms of by and large, skeptically, I have to say psychedelics have not really taught us anything about the nature of consciousness. I'm hopeful that they will. They, they have been used around certain, I don't even know if features is the right term, but things that are called consciousness. So consciousness can refer to not only just phenomenal consciousness, which is like, you know, the, the, the source of the hard problem and yep. what it is to be like Nagel's um, description, but um, the sense of self, or so, which can be sort of like the, the experiential self moment to moment, or it can be like the narrative self, the string together of story. So those are things that I think can be, and, and a little bit's been done with with psychedelics regarding that but i i think there's far more potential like but so like one story that unfolded is that psychedelics acutely have an effects on the default mode network a certain a pattern of of activation amongst a subset of brain areas that is associated with self-referential processing it seems mm -hmm. to be more active more communication between these um uh, areas like uh, the posterior cingulate cortex and the medial prefrontal cortex, for example, being parts of this that are, and, and, and others that are um, tied with sort of thinking about yourself, remembering yourself in the past, projecting yourself into the future. And so that it's an interesting story emerged with, when it was found that when psilocybin is on board, you know, in the person's system, that there's a de there's less communication amongst these, these areas. So, with resting state fMRI imaging that there's there's less synchronization or presumably communication between these areas. And so I think it was it has been overstated in terms of, ah, oh, we see this is like, this is the dissolving of the ego. This is it. The story made a whole lot of sense, but there's several, I think that story is really being challenged. Like one, we see increasing number of drugs that are, that, that, decouple that network, including ones like that aren't psychedelic. So this may just be a property, frankly, of being like, you know, screwed up, you know, like, mm -hmm. you know, being out of your head, being like, like, you know. So anytime out. you mess with a perception system, maybe it screws up some, some, uh, just our, our ability to just function in the, the holistically, like we do in order, yeah, yeah, for the brain to perceive stuff, to be able to map it to memory, to connect things together, the, the, the whole recur mechanism. That that could just be messed with, with right? Drugs. And it couldn't. I'm speculating. It could be tied to more if you had to download in the language, everyday language, like not feeling like yourself. Like right. so, whether that be like really drunk or really hopped up on amphetamine, or you know, on like we found it like decoupling of the default mode network on Salvinor A, which is a smokable psychedelic, which is a, a non-classic psychedelic, but another one where like DMT, where people are often talking to entities and that type of thing. Yeah. That was a really fun study to run. But nonetheless, most people say it's not a classic psychedelic and, and doesn't have some, so, some of those phenomenal features that people report from classic psychedelics and not sort of the clear sort of ego loss type, not at least not in the way that people report it with classic psychedelics. So you get it with all these different drugs. And so, mm -hmm. and then you also see just broad broad changes in network activity with other networks. And so I think that story took off a little too soon, although, yes. so I think in, in the story that the DMN, the default mode network relating to the self, and I know some neuroscientists, it drives them crazy. If you say that e it's the ego and that's yeah. like, but self-referential processing, if you go that far, like that was already known before psychedelics. Psychedelics didn't really contribute to that, the idea that this type of of net brain network activity was related to a sense of self, mm -hmm. but it is absolutely striking that psychedelics that people report with pretty high reliability these unity experiences that where people subjectively like like they report losing or again like the boundaries of the however you want to say it like mm -hmm. like these these unity experiences. I think we can do a lot with that in terms of figuring out the the nature of the, the sense of self. Now, I don't think that's the same as the hard problem or or the existence of phenomenal consciousness because you can build an AI system and you correct me if I'm wrong that like will pass a Turing test 
in terms of demonstrating the qualities of like uh, a sense of self. It will talk as if there's a self and there's probably a certain like algorithm or whatever, like computational, like, you know, scaling up of computations that results in somehow, and I think this is the argument with with humans, with some have speculated this, why do we have this illusion of, of the self that's that's evolved that, and we might find this with AI that like, it works, you know, having mm -hmm. a sense of self or, or and that's stated wrong, incorrectly, like acting as if there is a, an agent at play and dim behaviorally acting like, you know, there is a, there is a self that might kind of work. And so you can program a computer or a robot um, to basically demonstrate, have an algorithm like that and demonstrate that type of behavior. And I think that's completely silent on whether there's an actual experience inside yeah. there. I've been um, struggling to find the right words and how I feel about that whole thing. But because uh, I've, I've said it poorly before, I've before said that there's no difference between the appearance and the actual existence of consciousness or intelligence or any of that. What I really mean is the the more the appearance starts to be look like the thing, the more there's this area where it's like, I don't think I don't I, our whole idea of what is real and what is just an illusion is um, not the right way to think about it. So the whole idea is like, if you create a system that looks like it's having fun, the more it's realistically able to portray itself as having fun, like there's a certain gray area at which it's, the system is having fun. Uh, and same with intelligence, same with consciousness. And we humans wanna simplify, like it feels like the way we simplify the existence and the illusion of something uh, is, is uh, missing the whole mm -hmm. truth of the nature of reality, which we're not yet able to understand. Like it's the 1%, we only understand 1% currently, so we don't have the right uh, physics to talk about things, we don't have the right science to talk about things. But to me, like the uh, uh, faking it and actually it being true is, um, the, the difference is much smaller than what humans would like to imagine. That's my yeah. intuition, but the philosophers hate that because, and uh, guess what? It's philosophers. What have you actually built? <laughs> uh, the, so like th to me is that's the difference in philosophy and engineering. It, it feels like if we push the creation, the engineering, like fake it until you make it all the way, which is like fake consciousness until you realize, holy crap, this thing is conscious fake intelligence until you realize, holy crap, this is intelligence. And from the, the my curiosity with psychedelics and just ne neurobiology, neuroscience, is like, it feels, I'm, I, I love the armchair. I love sitting in that armchair because it feels like at a certain point, you're going to think about this problem and there's going to be an aha moment. Like that's what the armchair does. Sometimes science prevents you from really thinking, Right. wait, like it's really simple. There's something really simple. Like there's some, there could be some dance of chemicals that we're totally unaware of. Not from not from a, aspects of like which chemicals to combine with which biological architectures, but more like we were thinking of it completely wrong. That uh, just just out of the blue, like maybe the human mind is just like a radio that tunes into some other medium where consciousness actually exists. Mm -hmm. Like those uh, weird sort of hypothetical, like maybe we're just thinking about the human mind totally wrong. Maybe there's no such thing as individual intelligence. Maybe it is all collective intelligence between humans. Like maybe the intelligence is possessed in the communication of language between minds. And then in fact, consciousness is a property of that language 
uh, versus a property of the individual minds. And somehow the neurotransmitters will be able to connect to that. So uh, then, then AI systems can join that common collective intelligence, that common language. You know, like just thinking completely outside of the box. I just said a bunch of crazy things. I don't know, but, but thinking outside the box uh, and there's something about subtle manipulation of the chemicals of the brain, which feels like the best or one of the great chances of the scientific process leading us to an actual understanding of the hard problem. You know, what? what is human culture? What are the things you encode? Some of it is knowledge, some of it is yeah. information. But the thing that Elon talks about, and the thing, I, the thing I think about, I think you think about as well, is some of the more unique aspects of human nature, of, of what makes us human. Uh, which is our particular kind of consciousness. So he talks about the flame of human consciousness. Yeah. That's one of the questions is, can we um, instill consciousness into other beings? Because that's a sad thought that whatever this thing inside our minds that hopes and dreams and fears and loves can all die. Yeah, but I think you already know the answer to that question. Um, I have a robot lawnmower at home. My kids call it CC, cool car. It's a robo mow. And it, the way it works, it has an electric field around the perimeter. And it just tells it the, the area. And it, it, it goes out and goes from its base station, just mows a bit. Gets to the perimeter, detects perimeter, then chooses a random angle, ro rotates around and goes on. Yeah. My kids call it cool cutter. It's a she. I don't know why it's a she. They just, they when they were like quite young, they called it, um, I don't want to be sexist there. It could be a he, but they liked. Um, <laughs> they, they gendered the lawnmower? They gendered the lawnmower. Okay. Yeah, why not? But I was thinking this lawnmower, if you apply integrated information theory to the lawnmower, the lawnmower is conscious. Now, information, integrated information theory um, is that people say it's a flawed way of measuring consciousness, but I don't think it is. I think assembly theory actually measures consciousness in the same way. Consciousness is something that is generated over a population of objects of humans. Consciousness didn't suddenly spring in. Our consciousness has evolved together, right? The, f the fact we're here and the robots we leave behind, they all have some of that. So we won't lose it all. Sure, consciousness requires that we have many models being generated. It's not just one domain specific AI, right? I think the, the way to create a consciousness, I'm going to say unashamedly, the best way to, write a chemical con to make a consciousness is in a chemical system mm. because you just have access to many more states. And the problem right now we're making silicon consciousness is you just don't have enough states. So there are more possible states, or sorry, there are more possible configurations possible in your brain than there are atoms in the universe. And you can you can switch between them. You can't do that on a core i10. It's got it's got 10 billion, 12 billion, 14 billion transistors, but you can't you can't reconfigure them as dynamically. Well, you've shared this intuition a few times already that the larger number of states somehow correlates to greater possibility of life. But it's also possible that constraints are essential here. Yeah, yeah. I mean, but but coming back to the you worry that something's lost. I agree. Um, but I think that, um, you know, we will get to an AGI, but I wonder if it's, if it's not, it can't be separate from human, it can't be separate from human consciousness because the causal chain that produced it came from humans. So the people, what I kind of try and suggest heavily to people worry about, um, the existential threat of AI saying, I mean, you put it much more elegantly earlier, like we should worry about algorithms on dumb algorithms written by human beings on twitter right. driving us insane right and doing acting in odd ways yeah i think intelligence this is what i i have been ineloquent in trying to describe it partially because i try not to think too deeply through this stuff because then you become a philosopher i, I still aspire to actually building a bunch of stuff but my sense is super intelligence leads to um, deep integration into human society. So like in intelligence is strongly correlated. Like uh, intelligence, the way we conceive of intelligence materializes as a thing that becomes a fun entity to have at a party and with, yeah. with humans. So like uh, 
It's a mix of wit, intelligence, humor, like intelligence, like knowledge, ability to do uh, reasoning and so on, but also humor, emotional intelligence, ability to love, to uh, to dream, to share those dreams, to um, to play the game of um, human civilization, the push and pull, the whole dance of it, the whole dance mm -hmm. of life. And I think that kind of super intelligent being is not the thing that uh, that worries me. I think that ultimately will enrich life. It's again, the dumb algorithms, the dumb algorithms that scale in the hands of people that are too, don't study history, that don't study human psychology and human nature, just applying too broadly for selfish near-term interests. That's the biggest danger. Yeah, I think it's not a new danger, right? Um, right. I now know how I should use Twitter and how I shouldn't use Twitter, right? Yeah. Um, I like to provoke people into thinking. I don't want to provoke people into outrage. It's not fun. It's not a good thing for humans to do, right? And I think that when you get people into outrage, they, they take sides. Mm -hmm. And taking sides is really bad. But I think that we're all beginning to see this. And I think that actually... I'm very optimistic about how things will evolve because, you know, <laughs> I wonder how much, how much productivity has Twitter and social media taken out of humanity? Because how many now, um, I mean, so the good thing about Twitter is it gives power, so it gives voice to minorities, right? And, uh, and that's good in some degree. But I wonder how much voice does it give to all sorts of other problems that don't need th this emerge by the way when you say minorities i think uh or at least if i were to agree with you what i would say is minorities broadly defined any yeah. small groups yeah uh of people that uh it magnifies the concerns of yeah. the small versus the big that is good to some degree um but i think i mean i have to be careful because i think i have a a very I mean, I think that the world isn't that broken, right? I think the world is a pretty cool place. I think yeah. academia is really great. I think climate change presents a really interesting problem for humanity that we will solve. I like how you said it. It's a pretty cool problem <laughs> but it, for civilization. It's a big one. Well, it's a sure. bunch of I want to. There's a bunch of really, yeah, really big problems that if solved can significantly improve the quality of life for a large. It, that ultimately is what we're trying to do improve like how awesome life is for the maximum number of people yeah and i think the the, the coming back to consciousness i don't think the uni universe is doomed to heat death right it's one of the optimists that's why i want to kind of nudge you into thinking that time is fundamental because if time is fundamental then suddenly you don't have to give it back mm -hmm. the uni the universe just constructs stuff you know and what we see around us in our construction i know everyone's worried about how fragile civilization is and I mean, look at the fundamentals. We're the good. We're good until the, earth, the 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 sun expands, right? We've got quite a lot of resource on Earth. We're trying to be quite cooperative. Humans are nice to each other when they uh, when they're not under enormous stress. But coming back to the consciousness thing, are we going to send human beings to Mars or conscious robots to Mars, or are we going to send some hybrid? Um, and I and I don't know the answer to that question right now. I guess. You know, Elon's going to have a pretty good go at getting there. I'm not yeah. sure whether I have my I have my doubts, but I'm not qualified. You know, I'm sure people have their doubts that computation works. Yeah, but 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 I've got it working, and I you know. <laughs> and most most of the uh, cool technologies we have today, and take for granted, like the airplane, aforementioned airplane, were things that uh, people doubted. Every yeah. like majority of people doubted before they uh, came to life, yeah, and they come to life. And speaking of hybrid AI and humans, it's fascinating to think about all the different ways that hybridization, that merger, can happen. I mean, we have currently have the smartphone, so there's already a hybrid, but there's all kinds of ways that hybrid happens. How we and other technology play together, like a computer, mm -hmm. how that changes the fabric of human civilization is like wide open who knows who knows if you remove if you remove cancer if you remove major diseases from uh humanity uh there's going to be a bunch of consequences we're not anticipating yeah. uh many of them positive but uh many of them negative many many, many of them most of them at least i hope 
are weird and wonderful and and fun in ways that are totally unexpected. And we sitting on a porch with a bottle of Jack Daniels and a rocker will say, kids these days don't appreciate how hard we had it back in the day. I gotta ask you, um, so where does consciousness fit into this? Do you think simulation, like is there different ways to think about how this can be simulated? Just like you're talking about now, do we have to simulate each brain within the larger simulation? Is it enough to simulate just the brain, just the minds, and not the simulation, like not the big universe itself? Like, is there different ways to think about this? Yeah, I guess there is a kind of premise in the simulation argument rolled in from philosophy of mind. That is, that it would be possible to create a, a, a conscious mind in a computer. And that what determines whether some system is conscious or not is, is not like whether it's built from or organic biological neurons, but maybe something like what the structure of the computation is that it implements. Right. So we can discuss that if we want, but I think it would be, for what it's worth, my, my view that it would be sufficient, say, um, if you had a computation that was um, identical to the computation in the human brain down to the level of neurons. So if you, if you had a simulation with 100 billion neurons connected in the same way as the human brain, and you then roll that forward with, with the same kind of synaptic weights and so forth, so you actually had the same behavior coming out of this as a human with that brain would have done, then I think that would be conscious. Now, it's possible you could also generate consciousness uh, without having that detailed assimilation. There I'm getting more uncertain exactly how much you could simplify or abstract away. Can you look on that? What do you mean? So I missed where you're placing consciousness in the second. Well, so, the, so if you are a computationalist, you think that what creates consciousness is the uh, implementation of a computation. So some property, emergent property of the computation itself. Yeah, the idea. Yeah, you could say that. But then the question is, which, what, what's the class of computations such that when they are run, consciousness emerges? So if you just have like something that adds one plus one plus one plus one, like a simple computation, you think maybe that's not going to have any consciousness. If, if on the other hand the computation is one uh, like our human brains are performing, where uh, as part of the computation, there is like, you know, a, a global workspace, a sophisticated attention mechanism. There is like self representations of other cognitive processes and a whole lot of other things that possibly would be conscious. And in fact, if it's exactly like ours, I think definitely it would. But exactly how much less than the full computation that the human brain is performing would be required. Uh, is a little bit, I think, of an open question. Um, and you asked another uh, interesting question as well, which is, would it be sufficient to just have, say, the brain, or would you need the environment? Right, that's a nice way. In order to generate right. the same kind of experiences that we have. And there is a bunch of stuff we don't know. I mean, if you look at, say, current virtual reality environments, one thing that's clear is that we don't have to simulate all details of them all the time in order for, say, the, the human player to have the perception that there is yeah. a full reality in there. You can have, say, procedurally generated, which you might only render a scene when it's actually within the view of the player character. Um, and so similarly, if this if this if this environment that that we perceive, is simulated, it might be that only the parts that come into our view are rendered at any given time. And a lot of aspects that never come into view, say the, the, the details of this microphone I'm talking into, exactly what each atom is doing at any given point in time, might, might not be part of the simulation, only a more coarse-grained representation of this mind. Yeah, I'm with you on the intelligence part, but there's something about me that says consciousness is easier to fake. Like I, I've recently gotten my hands on a lot of Roombas. Don't ask me why or how, but uh, and I've made them. Uh, this is just a nice robotic mobile platform for experiments, and I made them scream 
and or moan in pain and so on just to see when they're responding uh-huh. to me and it's just a sort of psychological experiment on, my, on myself and uh, i think they appear conscious to me pretty quickly mm-hmm. like i to me at least my brain can be tricked quite easily right i uh, said so if, if i introspect in they it's harder for me to be tricked that something is intelligent so i i just have this feeling that inside this experience machine just saying that you're conscious and having certain qualities of the interaction like being able to suffer like being able to hurt um like being able to wander about the essence of your own existence not actually i mean you know uh, the creating the illusion that you're wandering about it mm-hmm. is enough to create the feeling of consciousness and be, cre- um the illusion of consciousness and because of that create a really immersive experience to where you feel like right. that is the real world so you think there's a big gap between uh appearing conscious and being conscious or is it no. that you think it's very easy to be conscious i'm not actually sure what it means to be conscious all i'm saying is uh the illusion of consciousness is enough for this to to create a social interaction that's as good as if the thing was conscious meaning i'm making it about myself uh, right yeah or, um, i mean i guess there are a few different things one is how good the interaction is which might i mean if you don't really care about like probing hard for whether the thing is conscious may 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 maybe it would be a satisfactory interaction <clears throat> whether or not you really thought it was conscious uh now if if you really care about it being conscious in in like inside this experience machine yes um how easy would it be to fake it and you say it sounds easy. fairly easy yeah. but then the question is would that also mean it's very easy to instantiate consciousness That's like a- it's much more widely spread in the world and we have thought it doesn't require a big human brain with 100 billion neurons all you need is some system that exhibits basic intentionality and can respond and you already have consciousness like in in that case i guess you still have a close coupling the the the, right. the, 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 the i guess the, Uh, that a case would be where where they yeah. can come apart where where you could create the appearance of there being a conscious mind without actually not being another conscious mind i'm yeah i'm somewhat agnostic exactly where these lines go i think one one observation that makes it plausible that you could have very realistic appearances relatively simply uh, which also is relevant for the simulation argument and in terms of thinking about how realistic would a virtual reality uh, model have to be in order for the simulated creature not to notice that anything was awry well um just think of uh, our own humble brains during the we hours of the night when we are dreaming mm-hmm. many times well dreams are very immersive but often you also don't realize that you're in a dream um and that's produced by simple primitive three pound lumps of neural matter effortlessly. So if if a simple brain like this can create a virtual reality that seems pretty real to us, then how much easier would it be for a super intelligent civilization with planetary sized computers optimized over the eons to create a a realistic an environment for you to interact with? Yeah, by the way, behind that intuition is that our brain is not that impressive relative to the possibilities of what technology could bring it's also possible that the brain is the epitome is the ceiling like just because the ceiling uh, how how is that possible <clears throat> meaning like this is the smartest possible thing that the universe could create so that seems uh unlikely unlikely to me yeah i mean for some of these reasons we alluded to earlier in terms of um designs we already have for computers that would be faster by many orders of magnitude than the human brain yeah but it could be that the constraints the cognitive constraints in themselves is what enables the intelligence so the more the the more powerful you make the computer the less likely it is to become super intelligent this is so, where so i say the, dumb things to push back on uh, uh, well <laughs> i'm not, yeah i'm not sure i thought that we might no i mean so there are different dimensions of intelligence uh, a simple one is just speed like if you can solve the same challenge faster in some sense yes you're like smarter so there i think we have very strong evidence for thinking that you could have 
a computer in this universe that would be much faster than the human brain and therefore have speed super intelligence, like be completely superior, maybe a million times faster. Um, then maybe there are other ways in which you could be smarter as well, maybe more qualitative uh, ways, right? And there, uh, the concepts are a little bit less clear cut, so it's harder to make a, a very crisp, neat, firmly logical argument for why that could be qualitative superintelligence as opposed to just things that were faster. Although I still think it's very plausible and for various reasons that, that are less than watertight arguments. But when you can sort of, for example, if you look at animals and and, brain uh, yeah, yeah, and and even within humans, like there seems to be like Einstein versus random person. Like it's yeah. not just that Einstein was a little bit faster, but like how long would it take a normal person to invent general relativity? It's like, it's not 20% longer than it took Einstein or something like that. It's like, I don't know whether they would do it at all or it would take millions of years or some totally bizarre. So, But, you, but your intuition it, is that the compute size will get you, uh, the, it, increasing the size of the computer and the speed of the computer might create some much more powerful levels of intelligence that would that enable some of the things we've been talking about with like the simulation, being able to simulate an ultra realistic environment, ultra realistic um, yeah. perception of reality. Yeah, I, I mean, strictly speaking, it would not be necessary to have super intelligence in order to have say the technology to make these simulations, ancestor simulations or other kinds of simulations. Um, as a matter of fact, I think if, if if there are if if we are in a simulation, it would most likely be one built by a civilization that had super intelligence. Right. Um, and it it certainly would help a lot. I mean, you could build more efficient, larger scale structures if you had super intelligence. I also think that if you had the technology to build these simulations, that's like a very advanced technology. It seems kind of easier to get the technology to super intelligence. Yeah. Um. So I'd expect by the time they could make these fully realistic simulations of human history with human brains in there. Like before that, they got to that stage, they would have figured out how to uh, create machine super intelligence or, or maybe biological enhancements of their own brains if they were biological creatures to start with. You, you mentioned uh, we should be humble also in the sense with the analogy to ants that uh, they might be better than us. So there's a kind of scale that we're talking about. And in the in the question, you mentioned the word sentient. So sentience, or maybe the more basic formulation of that is consciousness. Mm -hmm. Do you think um do you think that this thing within us humans, in terms of the typical life form of consciousness, is the essential element that permeates other, if if there's other alien civilizations out there that they have something like consciousness as well, or is this? I guess I'm asking, can you try to untangle the word sentient? Yeah, so that's that's a good question. Uh, I think what is most abundant, depending on how long it survives. So if you look at us as an example, uh, we are now we do have conscious and we do have technology, but the technologies that we are developing are also means for our own destruction, yes. as we can tell. Yes. You know, we can change the climate if we are not careful enough. Uh, we can go into nuclear wars. So we are developing means for our own destruction through self-inflicted wounds. And it might well be that creatures like us are not long-lived, mm -hmm. that uh, crocodiles on other planets live for billions of years. They don't destroy themselves, they live naturally. And so if you look around, the most common thing would be dumb animals that live for long times, you know, not those that have conscious. But in terms of changing the environment, I think since, I mean, humans develop tools, they develop uh, the ability to construct technologies that would lift us from this planet that we were born in. And that's something animals without a conscious consciousness uh, cannot really do and and so i you know in terms of uh looking for things that are a new that that went beyond the circumstances they were born into i would think that even if they are short lived these are the creatures that made the biggest difference to their environment and we can search for them you know even if they are short lived and most of the civilizations are dead by now yeah 
even if that's the case. That's sad to think about, by the way. Well, but if you look <laughs> on Earth, that, you know, yeah, there are lots of cultures well. that existed throughout time and they're dead by now. The Mayan culture was very sophisticated, died, but we can find evidence for it and learn about it just by archeology, span digging yeah. into the ground, looking. And so we can do the same thing in space, yes. look for dead civilizations, and uh, perhaps we can learn a lesson why they died and behave better so that we will not share the same fate. So I think, you know, there is a lesson to be learned from the sky. And by the way, I should also say, if we find a technology that we have not dreamed of, that we can import to Earth, that may be a better strategy for making a fortune than going to Silicon Valley or going to Wall Street. <laughs> yeah. Because you, learn, you, you make a jump start yeah. into something of the future. So that's one way to do the leap is actually to find, to literally discover versus come up with the idea uh, in our own limited human capacity, like a co cognitive capacity. It would look like, it would feel like cheating in an exam where you look <laughs> over the shoulder of a student next to you. Yeah. But. It's not good on an exam, but it's, it is good when you're coming up with technology that could change the, the fabric of human civilization. Right. But. There is, uh, you know, in my neck of the woods of artificial intelligence, there's a lot of trajectories one can imagine of creating very powerful beings, uh, the, the technology that's essentially, you know, you can call super intelligence that could achieve space exploration, all those kinds of things without consciousness, right? without something that to us humans looks like consciousness. And there, you know, there is a sad, feeling I have that consciousness too, in terms of us being humble, is a thing we humans take too seriously. That it's, we think it's special just because we have it, but it could be a thing that's actually holding us back in some kind of way. May well be. Okay, let's t talk about one of the most challenging things. Mm -hmm. one, one of the things I unfortunately am very afraid of, being human, allegedly. You wrote an essay on death and consciousness in which you write a note, certainly the fear of death has been one of the greatest driving forces in the history of thought and in the formation of the character of civilization, and yet it is under acknowledged. The great book on the subject, The Denial of Death by Ernest Becker deserves a reconsideration. I'm Russian, so I have to ask you about this. What's the role of death in life? See. You would have enjoyed coming to our house because uh, <laughs> my wife is Russian, and we also awesome. have we have a piano of such spectacular qualities. You wouldn't, you would have freaked out. <laughs> but anyway, yeah. let's, we'll let all that go. <laughs> so um, the context in which I, I remember that essay, uh, sort of, this was from maybe the '90s or something, yeah. and. Um, I used to publish in a journal called the Journal of Consciousness Studies because I was I was interested in these endless debates about consciousness and science, uh, which uh, certainly continue today. Mm -hmm. And I was interested in how the fear of death and the denial of death played into different philosophical approaches to consciousness. Mm -hmm. Because... I uh, I think on the one hand, uh, the sort of sentimental school of dualism, meaning the feeling that there's something apart from the physical brain, some kind of soul or something else, is obviously motivated in a sense by a hope that that whatever whatever that is will survive death and continue, and that's a very core aspect of a lot of the world religions, not all of them. Not, not really, but you know, uh, most of them. Um, the thing I noticed is that the the opposite of those, which might be the sort of hardcore, no, the brain's a computer and that's it. In a sense, we're motivated in the same way with a remarkably similar chain of of of, uh, of arguments, which is, no, I. Uh, the brain's a computer and I'm going to figure it out in my lifetime and upload it, upload myself and I'll live forever. <laughs> uh, that's interesting. Yeah. That's, so, that's, that's like the implied thought, right? Yeah. And so it's kind of this, in a funny way, it's, it's the same thing. It, it, it's, uh, um, it's peculiar 
that you to notice that these people who would appear to be opposites in character <laughs> and yeah. cultural references and uh, uh, and in their ideas actually are remarkably similar. And and, and uh, to 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 an incredible degree, the sort of hardcore uh, computationalist idea of, about uh, the brain has turned into medieval Christianity. With together, like there's the there are the people who are afraid that if you have the wrong thought, you'll piss off the super eyes of the future who will come back and zap you, and and all that stuff. Yeah, uh, it's like it's really it's really turned into medieval Christianity all over again. Uh, this is so the Ernest Becker's idea that death. The fear of death is the warm at the core, which is like that. That's the that's the core motivator of everything we see humans have created. The question is if that fear of mortality is somehow core, is like a prerequisite. Mm. Uh, so to what you what you just you just moved across this vast cultural chasm. Uh, that separates me from most of my colleagues in a way, and I can't answer what you just said on the level without yes. this huge deconstruction. Yes. Should I do it? Yes, what's the chasm? Okay. Let us travel across this vast okay, chasm. Okay, I don't believe in AI. I don't think there's any AI. There's just algorithms. We make them, we control them. Now, uh, they're tools, they're not creatures. Now, yes. th this is something that rubs a lot of people the wrong way. And don't I know it? When I was young, my main mentor was Marvin Minsky, who's the principal author of the computer as creature rhetoric that we still use. Uh, he was the first person to have the idea at all, but he certainly populated the AI culture with most of its tropes, I would say, because uh, a lot of the stuff people will say, oh, did you hear this new idea about AI? And I'm like, yeah, I heard it in 1978. Sure. Yeah, I remember that. <laughs> So Marvin was really the person. And uh, Marvin and I used to argue all the time about the stuff because I always rejected it. And of all of his, um, of all of his, uh, I, I wasn't formally his student, but I, uh, I worked for him as a researcher, but of, of all of his students and student-like people, <laughs> of his young adoptees, um, I think I was the one who argued with him about this stuff in particular, and he loved it. Yeah, I would have uh, loved to hear that conversation. It was fun. Did you ever converge to a place? Oh, no, no. So the, the very last time I saw him, he was quite frail. And, and uh, I, I was in, uh, in in Boston, and I was going to the old house in Brookline, his amazing house. And one of our mutual friends said, hey, listen, Marvin's so frail. Don't do the argument with him. <laughs> Don't argue <laughs> about AI. Yeah. You know. And so I said, but Marvin loves that. And so I showed up. And he's like, he was frail. He looked up and he said, are you ready to argue? <laughs> <laughs> uh, he's such an amazing person for that. <laughs> so um, <laughs> it's hard to summarize this because it's decades of stuff. The first thing to say is that nobody can claim absolute knowledge about whether somebody or something else is conscious or not. Uh, th this is all a matter of faith. And in fact, um, I think the whole idea of faith needs to be updated. So it's not about God, but it's just about stuff in the universe. We we have faith in each other being conscious. And then um, th I used to frame this as a thing called the circle of empathy in my old papers. And then um, it turned into a thing for the animal rights movement. Too. I noticed Peter Singer using it. I don't know if it was coincident or but anyway, we there's this idea that you draw a circle around yourself and the stuff inside is more like you, might be conscious, might be deserving of your empathy, of your consideration, and the stuff outside the circle isn't. Mm -hmm. And um, outside the circle might be a rock <laughs> or, <laughs> I don't know. Uh, so, uh, and that circle is fundamentally based on faith. Well, like Your faith no, in no, what it, is and what isn't. It, the thing about the circle is it can't be pure faith. It also has it's also a pragmatic decision, and this is where things get complicated. Mm -hmm. If you try to make it too big, you suffer from incompetence. Mm -hmm. If you say, I don't want to kill a bacteria, I will not brush my teeth. I don't know, like, what do you do? Yeah. Like, you know, like, th there's, a, there's a competence question where you do have to draw the line. People who make it too small become cruel. People are so clannish and political and so worried about themselves ending up on the bottom 
of society that they are always ready to gang up on some designated group. And so there's always these people who are being trying, we're always trying to shove somebody out of the circle. Mm -hmm. And so, so aren't you shoving AI outside the circle? Well, give me a second. All right. So, so <laughs> there's a pragmatic consideration here. Yes. And so, uh, and, and, uh, the, the biggest questions are probably fetuses and animals lately, but AI is getting there. Now with AI, I think, uh, and I've had this discussion so many times. People would say, but aren't you afraid if you exclude AI, you'd be cruel to some consciousness? And then I would say, well, if you include AI, you make yourself, you you exclude yourself from being able to be a good engineer or designer. And so you, you're facing incompetence immediately. So like, I really think we need to subordinate algorithms and be much more skeptical of them.